All right. Thanks, uh, Thomas. And thanks to uh, Dirk and Florian for putting together this great conference. I'm sorry we weren't able to do it together. There are a lot of you that I really would have enjoyed the opportunity to meet and talk with, but hopefully another time. Um, um, there was a bunch of good stuff also in our, the earlier talks that uh, I'd like to incorporate eventually into, into this work and uh, kind of want to apologize for, um, uh, I'm going to be kind of rehashing old ideas when a lot of you have been presenting sort of more exciting new stuff. And I also want to apologize for the crappiness of my PowerPoint. I just don't know how to back work from a paper that I've written to a PowerPoint uh, without just putting in a lot of text. So there's going to be a lot of text, but whatever. It gives you something else to look at. Okay, um, so uh, there's been a lot of resurgent interest in the ideas of powers, dispositions, which are derivative from categorical properties. And this has entered into the realm of so-called metaphysical necessity with two related sorts of claims that have garnered interest. The first is dispositional essentialism, the idea that some are all properties or some are all fundamental properties are essentially dispositional. The second is the claim that laws of nature, or at least the fundamental ones, are metaphysically necessary. Um, in an earlier paper, I argued that laws of nature don't have a mind-independent metaphysical necessity, but recent developments on dispositions have made given these ideas a new vibrancy. Uh, so I'd like to revisit this again, arguing that the new work as interesting and important as it is to our understanding of fundamental properties, powers and dispositions, shouldn't change our minds about metaphysical necessity, or at least don't change my mind. Some of you have already had your minds changed, I suspect. One should still think that necessity in essence is conceptual, conceptually and conventionally grounded. I won't be arguing that the laws of nature aren't necessary, nor that properties don't have dispositional essences. I'll only argue that if they are necessary or essential, this has no metaphysical weight and it's based in our rules or decisions about how to talk and conceptualize the world. So the prima facie case against the necessity of laws of nature, fundamental or otherwise, is familiar and straightforward. There are countless ways to imagine and conceive the laws being other than they are both directly just thinking about the laws themselves, imagining the details of the mathematical relationships or the constants involved to be different, like Kit Fine uh, that uh, Florian mentioned, uh, or the constants involved to be different, um, or indirectly, we can focus on particular events unfolding in different patterns, billiard balls reacting to collision by changing shape, for instance. Um, and there's keeping the historical pattern the same, but imagining quite different laws, which simply overlap, uh, um, would produce the same, um, the same history. After all, the underdetermination of theory by evidence reminds us that there are countless possible mathematical formulae that could generate the same sets of results. Uh, and this also applies directly to dispositional essentialism as well. Of course, since Kripke and Putnam, it's commonplace to point out that what can be imagined needn't be possible. Indeed, it's not uncommon to hear the clear that imagination is no evidence of possibility whatsoever. So the prima facie case against the necessity of laws is often dismissed or completely ignored. Um, in my view, this is a serious mistake. Indeed, it's a number of related mistakes. The first mistake is overlooking what has been pointed out not infrequently and rarely challenged, that Kripke and Putnam's arguments in support of their a posteriori necessities themselves depend fundamentally on imagination and conceivability, or more generally thought experiments and modal and linguistic intuitions, all the familiar a priori apparatus. Putnam's twin earth argument, when twin earth is considered as a possible world rather than another distant planet, amounts to the intuition that X, Y, Z, would not count as water, no matter how otherwise similar it was to water. Similarly for Kripke's argument that gold is essentially an element or has the atomic number 79. Or the argument that humans are essentially humans or that cats are essentially animals. 
Of course, it remains true that the fact that we can take these essentialist proposals seriously shows that we cannot defeat them simply by imagining a robot cat or Socrates being a surprisingly intelligent pig. But in each case, we do make imaginative appeals. Rather than asking, however, however, rather than asking, can you imagine that P is false? The structure is, suppose P is actually true. Suppose it's actually true. Now look for a scenario which most plausibly would be one where P is false. If in such a case, P remains true, this supports the claim that there's no case where P is false and so P is necessary. In these cases, P's actual truth is taken for granted. Um, and so insofar as the thought experiment is taken as probative, they support if P, then necessarily P, as Kripke often points out. Um, in some cases, not that it matters, but I'm happy to talk about it if you want to. What we suppose is actually the case isn't P itself, but some other thing that's in the essentiality of origin, for example. Um, but anyway, there's an actual assumption uh, and you take that on board and then you think about what you can conceive. This is quite independent of the actual truth of P. And so it's a priori, or it can be, we might have to front load other uh, things that we're taking for granted empirically here to find the actual a priori principle. Similarly, if competent judges don't accept this, then we have evidence against the necessity of P. That's why it seems that while Socrates is essentially human, given that he's actually human, he's only accidentally, even though actually, a philosopher or the teacher of Plato. So yes, when we're evaluating a posteriori claims for proposed necessity, we should not simply be asking, can you conceive that not P? We should rather ask, can you conceive that not P while supposing that P is actually true? As these are a priori, we have reason, I think, to think these conditionals or some suitably similar ones are analytic and reflect our conventions, our decisions about how to use terms like water and gold. And so then we have a picture of how necessary a posteriori truths arise but according to which necessity is still a product of these conventions. In short, our rules set up the relevant features, microstructure say, as semantic constraints on the application for the terms in question, though they don't do so directly. Water is H2O is not analytic, but indirectly. Water is apply only to what shares the microstructure of these samples. Since finding what the structure is is empirical, the resulting necessary truth will be a posteriori, but the modal force comes from the convention. No mind independent modal input is required. Uh, Paul Kopic has a useful model for this in his review of Nathan Salmon's reference in essence. Imagine introducing the term Socratune as a rigid designator for whatever is Socrates' favorite color. So it turns out to be maroon. And so you get from that that it's necessarily true that what is Socratune is maroon. Um, it's a posteriori, but the input is uh, a contingent empirical uh, claim that Socrates' favorite color is in fact maroon. Um, so at least in principle, you can say we can generate necessary a posteriori truths um, out of no interesting um, real modal facts just on the basis of deciding to constrain the application of a certain term in a certain way. And that's, um, though the details differ, uh, that's the model uh, um, roughly for the sort of thing that um, Chalmers and I think, although Chalmers, not a conventionalist, at least by his account. Okay, so back to the prima facie case against the necessity of laws. It's noteworthy that for the vast majority of a posteriori claims, it remains the case that if we ask not merely, can you conceive that not P, but can you suppose that P is actually true and then conceive that not P, the answer remains yes. And so what we take, we take what we imag initially imagined as, as indeed possible, like Socrates not being teacher of Plato. More generally to simply say what's imaginable is not always possible is true, but misleading. And to simply dismiss appeals to imagination badly misrepresents any justified epistemological lessons from Putnam and Kripke. 
aside from misrepresenting the role of imaginations and conceivings, it suggests there's some other epistemology of modality, something which provides deeper insight into real modality, something other than the meanings of words and logical and conceptual connections. But we've been given no such thing. No, I should say we've been given no such thing in the traditional literature supporting these essences. We've, of course, seen some stuff from uh, some of the speakers here, Sonia and Barbara in particular, um, that go in another direction. And um, I have things to say about that. But noteworthy that both of them were primarily supporting claims about possibility, not about essences. To return to the laws of nature, it seems perfectly obvious that in all the conceivings we mentioned that I was uh, suggesting uh, count towards the uh, contingency claim, um, our imaginings were not premised on any supposition that the laws in fact are not what they appear to be. We do take for granted that the laws are what they are, whatever they are, but we suppose that nonetheless, they could have been different in these ways. So the prima facie case against the necessity of laws remains. So to sum up where we are, point one, Kripke and Putnam have given us no reason to doubt the epistemic probity of appeals to imagination uh, or conceivability for a posteriori claims when such appeals take for granted the actual truth of the proposition in question and other relevant uh, empirical facts. Point two, the non-obtaining of our actual laws of nature seems perfectly so conceivable. Point three, Putnam and Kripke's arguments have not appealed to nor given any evidence of faculties of modal insight beyond those we might have believed, believed in prior to their work. Point four, nor have they provided any evidence of necessity which is beyond the logical and conceptual. Uh, finally, this is connected to another important point and this is connected to the, again, the point of Kit Fines that Florian referenced. Um, about the error of just dismissing appeals to the imaginability of not P. For while we may, upon the hypothesis of some P's actual truth, deny that our imagined case shows not P to be possible, it is, at least in all the familiar cases, still the case that our imagining reflects some genuine possibility. Hesperus may not possibly be, may not possibly be not phosphorus, but it is possible for it to fail generally to be the last star visible in the morning. Water may not possibly be X, Y, Z, but there can be X, Y, Z that is watery, whereas it is sometimes put water. And in all these cases, there could be language speakers very much like ourselves who introduced the term in identical circumstances, who make contrary judgments about these cases, letting their term water apply to X, Y, Z, and gold to some non-element that otherwise is relevantly like gold. Such speakers, I think, do not make any metaphysical mistake. If these scenarios do not undermine our necessity claims, but do undermine those of these hypothetical other speakers, it's simply because of how they're described while using the terms in question, speaking those languages. So once again, a posteriori necessities do not, I believe, reflect mind-independent necessities and essences, but our concepts, which sometimes have a form less like something is S just in case it's G, F is just in case it's G, but it's F just in case it has the same microstructure as most of the samples we call gold, or something is Socratoon just in case it shares Socrates' actual favorite color. So point five, when there's a necessary a posteriori truth, there is a semantic rule telling us how to apply a term in modal context based upon what the actual world non-modally happens to be like. Metaphysically, no erstwhile possibility is really ruled out. To put it simply, when there's a necessary a posteriori truth or a necessity essence claim, a posteriori essence claim for, for the neo-Aristotelians, the predicate acts as a semantic constraint, not a metaphysical constraint on the subject term, just as in analytic truths. It's just that this trait is picked out in terms of the satisfaction of some empirical condition, as in Socratoon, or somewhat more complexly with water and gold. 
So insofar as the prima facie case against the necessity of laws of nature can be met, and we can be convinced that they are necessary, despite the scenarios that are possible and which look like cases in which the laws fail, we should think the necessity of the laws is not a matter of mind independent necessity, but of our concepts involved in the laws. All of this goes mutatis mutandis for claims about the dispositional essences of properties. Science can reveal that the having of property F bestows on an object disposition D, but not that it does so with metaphysical necessity. As with laws, my claim is disjunctive. Either the properties are not essentially dispositional, or if they are, it's a matter of our conceptual scheme in the way that what is Socrates is essentially maroon. Either way, we don't have mind independent essence. Right? So that's the end of my prima facie case against the metaphysical necessity uh, of laws and uh, dispositional essences. So now let's turn to the recent work and see if there's anything that has, uh, that can bite into this argument. Most, though not all, of the recent championing of the necessity of laws of nature comes from those who support dispositional essentialism. Many or all of the fundamental properties on this view are claims to confer dispositions essentially upon their bearers. For instance, it's proposed that it's essential to having negative charge, that a thing is disposed to attract things with positive charge and to repel other things with negative charge. And perhaps it is essential to salt, or at least a necessary consequence of its essence, that it's disposed to dissolve in water. Further, insofar as dispositions are closely related to producing certain effects in certain conditions, it suggested that the laws governing these properties merely flow from the essences of the properties, expressing precisely the effects of these properties in the relevant conditions. And since these dispositions are essential to the properties, it will be impossible for the properties to be instantiated without these dispositions and consequently, without behaving in accordance with the laws. The laws then are metaphysically necessary. Even without the claim that the laws are necessary, the dispositional essentialism itself is proposed as representing a substantive metaphysical necessity. And so something which conflicts with the position that I've outlined above. So we need to take a look at this position. So to dispositions. Salt dissolves when put in water, Nonstick pans clean with little effort. Paper catches on fire when brought close to a flame and it leaves ashes. We suppose that before the objects were in these circumstances, it was already true that they would so behave if they were. And further that other objects relevantly similar are also so disposed. Traditionally, it's been thought when an object has a disposition, this results from two things, some categorical, non-dispositional property of the object, its chemical composition or internal structure, say, and contingent laws of nature, which assign particular dispositions to particular categorical properties. But recent work on dispositions has challenged a number of the traditional ideas. Dispositions cannot be analyzed, some argue in terms of counterfactuals, Sorry? Uh, reason work on dispositions has challenged this. Dispositions cannot be analyzed, um, some argue, in terms of counterfactuals as to how an object would behave in given circumstances. That's the moral of Fink's masks and mim mimics. We should rather think objects have active powers um, to certain behaviors, manifestations, and circumstances. These aren't contingently given by neutral bases, but bases that are themselves dispositions, dispositional. Laws, claim many, do not govern properties, but are themselves just generalizations reflecting the dispositions conferred by properties. Uh, finally, many have suggested that the fundamental properties of physics are dispositions that do not have any further bases. Mass, spin, and charge, for example. There have, of course, been other developments, uh, but these will suffice for here. Now, a particular concern here is uh, what may be called real essentialism, mind-independent metaphysical necessity, 
not to be understood in terms of logical and conceptual necessity. So here, these would take the form of truths like, necessarily, if something has F, it has D. Um, these express the dispositional essences, D of the given properties, F. Now, is there any reason to think these sorts of necessities reflect a mind-independent necessity not given, at least if my earlier arguments and those of others that Chalmers have been correct, by Kripke, Putnam, a posteriori necessities? It seems to me that generally, dispositional essentialists have simply taken the fact that the necessary truths they are espousing are a posteriori and synthetic, to establish the sort of mind-independent necessity in question. After all, they're doing first-order metaphysics, arguing that certain facts are necessary, rather than arguing for a particular interpretation of that claim. But like Kripke and Putnam themselves, as well as many of those who have been influenced by them, they may adopt a second-order realist way of talking that makes it clear they're taking for granted this interpretation. This is reflected, for instance, in their emphasis on the truths not being analytic and resulting from science and in the way in which intuitions and imagination are dismissively treated. Necessity is not a, metaph it's a metaphysical issue. Imagination is conceptual or psychological. So it's not surprising we haven't been presented with new arguments for such a realist take on these truths. Nonetheless, perhaps something about dispositions or these truths may give us reason to think they're truly metaphysical and mind independent. So let's start with a familiar illustration. Consider the traditional secondary quality view of colors on which being green is a disposition an object has to cause objects to have a certain sort of qualitative visual experience. For our purposes, we don't have to assume this is correct. I'm just drawing your attention to a certain disposition, right? the disposition to produce an experience in certain subjects, in certain sorts of circumstances. Now, forget green for now, just consider the disposition. It's trivially necessary that if something has this disposition, then it has this disposition. It would be extremely misleading to say that it's essential to having this position that something be so disposed. But it's no more metaphysically essential or necessary if we use the word green to refer to this disposition, right? That is the sentence, what is green, necessarily what is green has this disposition, right? is no more substantive metaphysically than the trivial claim I just gave you, or just using the word green as a term to express the disposition. Um, finally, it's no more metaphysically necessary if F, or green in this case, functions like Socratoon to pick out a disposition that needs to be determined empirically, like is disposed to attract bodies with whatever force actual things attract other bodies. So speaking generally, if F in necessarily what has F has disposition D just refers to disposition D or to a broader disposition from which D follows, then that necessary truth has the same sort of logical or conceptual necessity as what is Socratoon is maroon and nothing of more metaphysical import. That being said, we can turn to cases of supposed dispositional essentialism. In the case of fundamental properties, which is the central case, especially in connection with laws of nature, it seems plain that what is being claimed is that the fundamental properties are themselves dispositions with no further distinct base. So the essential dispositionality is just the necessity of having a disposition if something has that disposition. However, one may object. The sentence, what is mass is disposed to attract other objects with mass, or certainly what has n grams of mass is disposed to attract other objects according to F equals G, that gravitational constant, um, n m2 over d2 is certainly, d squared is certainly not trivial. So it may seem to present a more substantial necessity. 
is certainly a substantive scientific discovery. And indeed, the mere fact that we can argue about the necessity seems substantive than what is disposed to attract other objects in this way is disposed to attract other objects in this way. But let us remember the cases of water and Socratoon. It's not trivial that what is Socratoon is maroon, yet metaphysically it amounts to no more than that A, what is in fact Socrates' favorite color is maroon, and B, necessarily, what is maroon is maroon. Water's being necessarily H2O is also not trivial, but on my account at least, it's a product of our intention to constrain the application of the term water by whatever in fact is the explanatorily deepest feature of enough of the samples to which we do apply water. Finding what's explanatory deepest is of course a substantive scientific undertaking, but the necessity is conceptual and logical. And there can be an argument about it because in the absence of full probing, we may not be clear what principles or intention are governing our use of a term. And of course, some may not so use it. For instance, some have been moved by cases like molybdenum to see that they do defer to the deeper structure over superficial features. And they are more committed to using water in the way that they do aluminum than counting X, Y, Z as water. So people by argument can be shown, oh, this is actually how I am using the term. To bring this around to mass and its dispositions, it's clearly trivially necessary that what is disposed to attract objects according to the formula uh, F equals G M1, M2 over D squared is so disposed. For that matter, it's equally necessary that whatever is disposed to attract objects to F equals G star M1, M2 over D squared is so disposed where G star is some different constant. Uh, and that whatever is disposed to attract objects according to F equals M1, M2 over D cubed is so disposed, that alternative one that fine suggests. Right? Whatever has that disposition has that disposition. These are all, it's all trivial that if you have that disposition, you have that disposition. It's simply the case that in fact, nothing has either of these other dispositions. This isn't altered, interestingly, if we introduce a different term, mass, say, to stand for the having of this disposition. Nor, to take it one more step, is it altered if we introduce the term mass to stand for whatever disposition it is that objects have to actually attract each other. The resulting necessity of what has mass is disposed to attract things, blah, blah, is the same as that of what is Socratoon is maroon. Finally, to take it one more step towards historical accuracy, which is not historically accurate, but just to show how it can be more complicated, um, um, basically how the rules governing a term can be more complicated. Um, suppose instead that mass is introduced as a, for a, as a, for a theoretical magnitude, which plays a postulated causal role in the motion of bodies. Here, as far as the introduction of the term goes, it could turn out that there's a categorical property which contingently confers the disposition in question. In that case, scientists would have to decide whether the word mass applied to whatever had that categorical property, in which case what has mass has this disposition would be contingent, or to anything with that disposition. And notice that it's left for science to discover just what the disposition in particular is. But suppose, as we are supposing, that it's determined that there is no distinct base for the disposition. We might then have determined that there's no such thing as mass, but we didn't. Rather, we continued to use mass to talk about the disposition. Does this then mean that mass rigidly designates this disposition? as Socratoon does maroon? Not necessarily. Since we have the term mass and not merely the term is disposed to attract objects according to G times mass one mass two over D squared, we might apply it to objects in other situations 
if they had dispositions that we, or the scientists that most of us defer to, deem to be sufficiently similar. After all, for all the discovery that there's no separate base for this disposition, it remains that there are endlessly many sets of dispositions that are quite similar in one way or another, differing in the value of G or exactly how distance figures or how the masses interact, or by simply having an exception here or there for certain values or in certain locations. Do or can objects with these dispositions have mass or be 250 kilograms? This seems not to be a metaphysical question about the essence of mass, but a decision about how to use the word mass. Though of course it could well be a principled one that makes a scientific difference. But what makes one use or another rather than another scientifically better won't be that it actually captures the real metaphysical essence of mass. Obviously it need not be any such thing. All there is is the actual disposition, the possible dispositions and their consequences, and our use of the term mass, which includes its conceptual connections with other scientific terms, either directly or through more Socratoon-like connections which need to be discovered empirically. Different people, including different scientists, may have different tendencies as how to describe these cases. So there can be a disagreement about what's necessary, given what is actual, just as there can be disagreement about whether it is necessary that water is H2O. But as with the case with water, insofar as it is counted as necessary, this necessity results from the decisions about how to apply the concept, not a mind-independent essence. Um, okay, I've, I had a slide here. Um, um, with uh, a discussion of the good point that Barbara Vetter makes about um, 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 uh, this is a very good point that people tend to run together the idea that dispositions themselves are modal um, and the claim that properties confer their essences, confer their dispositions essentially. And those are completely different claims um, and people slide between them uh, often. I think it's a good diagnosis of of the ease with which people think the essentialism follows. Okay, um, so from the start, there wasn't any obvious reason why the arguments in favor of the conventionalist or conceptualist interpretation of Kripke and Putnam's necessities shouldn't carry over to the proposed dispositional essentialist truth. Why should the mere fact that the properties in question are dispositional make things different from the case of water. Uh, I hope to have made it plausible that this prima facie skepticism is correct. And, and I guess Barbara's point is sort of a diagnosis maybe of why people might have thought it's different, but it's not. Okay, back to the laws. If dispositional essentialism isn't metaphysically necessary, it can't support the metaphysical necessity of the laws of nature. But let's look at the laws more particularly. Um, the way dispositional essentialism is supposed to support the necessity of laws of nature is basically that if we suppose that mass, say, essentially confers some disposition, uh, manifesting M in C, um, and the, suppose the laws basically say that whatever is F is G, um, and to have the disposition to M in C is being such that if X were in C, it would M, then basically given the necessity, the essentiality of the disposition, then anything with the property will act according to the laws, so the laws are necessary. There have been a number of objections to this derivation, but we can put them aside from now. My, my question is, um, how does this conception of why the, fun, sorry, why the fundamental laws of nature um, are necessary address the prima facie case we laid out earlier in the paper? Um, that is, the large range of rays we can conceive of the laws failing to obtain, even if we take granted what the laws actually are. So when you first hear the claim, the laws of nature are necessary, you might suppose the claim is that any possible world has to be basically like ours. Of course, things can be quite different, but there will be the same sorts of things governed by the same laws. 
But this, of course, is not required by the law necessitarian. She can allow that there could be very different laws which explain what's going on in other worlds. But this will require things in those laws to have different properties. So things could be very, very different and scientists could find very different laws. Not only is this compatible with law necessitarianism, but the arguments for the necessity of laws cast no doubt on this possibility. Why is this compatible with law necessitarianism? Because it's still true, vacuously true, that everything with mass attracts everything else with mass with the actual force. Instead, there are simply worlds in which nothing has the relevant properties. So the truths in which the laws in our world, um, which are laws in our world, are at least not false. Right? One might even think that they're laws, but they just have no application. The events in these worlds are explained by other laws, and maybe some worlds lack laws altogether. Now, I've turned attention to this sort of possibility because not only are these possibilities not denied, but we can now appreciate that the sorts of possibilities we first considered as examples in which the laws fail to obtain in a world that looks something like our own are also in a way not ruled out. For all the arguments show, something could be quite watery, yet not be disposed to boil at 100 degrees centigrade, or quite mass-like, but not disposed to attract other items according to the law of gravitation. The claim instead is that in these scenarios, what is watery is not water, and what is mass-like is not mass. Consequently, these two are not worlds in which our laws fail to obtain, but are to be handled like the above more alien worlds. The law statements are at least not false because the objects in the seeming counterexamples don't truly have our properties. This is of, our, of a piece with our earlier findings about property essences. The acknowledgement of these possibilities undermines any real metaphysical force the claim of necessity might be supposed to have, especially when we see that it commits us to thinking that the terms for the properties have the features in the laws or the underlying dispositions as semantic constraints, rendering the necessity fundamentally conceptual. Put another way, Insofar as the property essences are conventional, so is any necessity they generate for the laws. Um, I had a discussion here of um, Alexander Byrd's uh, interestingly different sort of argument, his up and down uh, argument for the um, uh, necessity of the law that salt dissolves in water. Um, I'm just going to... Um, um, skip that for now, happy to come back to it, but just to ship, basically, it depends on certain assumptions um, of the Kripke Putnam type and those uh, background assumptions which are needed for the argument, again, are either false or if they're true, they're true conventionally, assumes that water is necessarily H2O, that water can't exist without ionic bonding, that ionic bonding must be governed by Coulomb's law. Um, and he supports these necessary claims by just the Kripke Putnam sorts of considerations, um, which again, if they work, fine, it's interesting, but they just show something about how we use these terms, how the concepts work. Um, but I want to skip ahead a little bit to use the last remaining moment to talk about um, um, the part that I'm sort of least confident about, and it's a little bit more speculative. So I'm sort of curious to hear what people think about it. Um, um, so there may be this lingering concern. Um, I've been suggesting that if the theoretical terms used in laws have a certain sort of semantics, um, which they have to if the things are going to turn out to be necessary, then the laws ultimately say something like, every pair of objects that are disposed to attract each other according to the law of gravitation, attract each other according to the law of gravitation. In my enthusiasm to make the necessity unsubstantive, I've rendered the laws themselves unsubstantive. But the laws of nature, especially the fundamental ones, represent not merely empirical discoveries, but monumental ones. We can hardly base the actual behavior of all objects on a set of tautologies, 
even if they are disguised with reference fixing descriptions that keep the sentence from being analytic or a priori. And of course, the laws make empirical predictions so they can be tested. So how can my account allow the laws to represent the remarkable empirical achievements they are? as well as to play the substantive role they do in prediction and explanation. There are various ways to approach this. The one that I am confident of, that I'm sure is perfectly fine, is something like Chalmers' two-dimensional semantics. Um, basically, um, you know, as in the case of Socratoon, um, we get the necessary truth that what Socratoon is maroon, um, and metaphysically, that amounts to the metaphysic, with respect to other worlds, the necessity that whatever is maroon is maroon. But in the actual world, it doesn't just express in effect what Socrates is maroon. The actual world is what fixes the reference of it. And that does so by it being the case that Socrates' favorite color um, is maroon. So being Socrates' favorite color is the primary intention there. Similarly, there'll be different primary intentions for terms like mass and so on. So um, what's going on in the actual world will give us what the scientists discover. And it's just where the necessity comes in, the application of um, how we constrain the terms like mass, charge, whatever, with respect to other worlds is then governed by whatever we empirically find in the actual world. But I wanted to sort of finish by just suggesting a slightly different angle for this, and I'll just have to sketch it. Um, um, but basically the thought is um, all the considerations, uh, um, the way that we allow the laws of nature to be necessary, um, despite the possibilities that we're acknowledging, we're just saying, well, okay, well, those wouldn't be worlds that really have mass or really have charge and so on. They don't really have electrons. Um, well, okay, but now let's consider these things in these other worlds um, and other dispositions on all these other laws. Similar considerations would show that those laws hold in our world, right? And the other dispositions which aren't manifested in our world have their own dispositional essences. So basically, if the laws, whatever considerations are supposed to show that our laws are necessary would show that all possible laws are metaphysically necessary. So all laws are necessary in all worlds and they all have this sort of triviality that I've suggested. Um, you might call this universal law necessitarianism. Um, if that's right, what's going on in science isn't discovering what laws obtain because all the laws obtain in all the world. What we're finding is which dispositions things in fact have. And that's a contingent matter. And in finding what laws things in fact have, you're finding which laws in fact have application, which ones are true, not trivially, um, 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 but actually have their antecedents satisfied. Okay, I will end with that. Hopefully the basic idea is uh, clear enough. I uh, just want to say again, I'm not committed to this. It's only insofar as one accepts that the laws are necessary, then one has reason to think that we have these sorts of conventions. And this uh, model, I hope, can uh, you can see how you would apply it to the other sorts of uh, proposed substantive necessities associated with uh, neo-Aristotelian views, or so I think. Okay, so thanks so much. All right, I'll start like uh, most of the people who talked before me by thanking Dirk and Florian for putting together um, such a wonderful, if somewhat exhausting program. Um, and I'm going to apologize to everybody who spoke yesterday, uh, because much as I would like to refer to your talks, I had to teach all day. And so I couldn't hear you. Um, and in some cases, well, in all cases, I'm sorry about that, mostly for my own sake. Okay, so um, I want to present to you what I think are promising beginnings for a modal epistemology that's promising for neo-Aristotelians. Well, at least neo-Aristotelians of the stripe that I am of, namely those of us who like powers, potentials, dispositions, those kinds of things. 
Um, as many of you know, I've done quite a bit of work in metaphysics, trying to explain modality in terms of such powers, potentials, dispositions, whatever you want to call them. And I am now sort of in the early stages. Early stages tend to last very long. I am in the early stages of sort of parallel pro project in the epistemology of modality. I think the projects nicely complement each other. I don't think that either one requires the other, but I do think they sort of appeal to the same set of people. Okay. So what am I uh, trying to do here? I'm trying to give an epistemology for metaphysical modality. Um, and I'm going to try to give it in terms that neo-Aristotelians will like, especially the ones who like me, go in for powers or potentials. But if you say anything about metaphysical modality, I've increasingly come to think uh, you need to say something uh, to get us started on exactly what it is we're talking about. Um, Gideon Rosen has this nice uh, paper, the title of which somehow eludes me now, um, in which he says, when you ask what is metaphysical modality, that question can be taken in two ways. One way is what philosophers tend to ask in metaphysics, asking so for the nature of metaphysical modality. But there's the other question, the one asked by the beginning student who's supposed to think about metaphysical modality and doesn't even know sort of what the topic's supposed to be. And so this second question, what is metaphysical modality? I think it's not trivial how we answer that. Um, and I think that has implications both for metaphysics and epistemology. So I'll say something briefly about that to get us started and to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. I will then switch gears and do some philosophy of action. Um, in the philosophy of action, people have thought a lot about the epistemological requirements on intentional agency. I'm going to point out one such requirement that hasn't received a lot of attention, which is that we need to know, <clears throat> sorry, about our own abilities. Now, and I'll say a little bit more about why and in what sense of ability. Now, abilities are a modal phenomenon. Um, one very dear to the neo-Aristotelian's halt, I think. Um, since it's a modal phenomenon, you might think it's in the general area of modal epistemology. Um, and part three is going to try to convince you that at least some of the most promising modal epistemologies we have can't really account for knowledge of ability. And then in section four, I will very briefly suggest that maybe we need to turn the tables and think about a modal epistemology, which actually starts with knowledge of ability in the context of agency. And that's the kind of modal epistemology which I take to be very promising for neo-Aristotelians. Okay, so let's get started. What do we talk about when we talk about metaphysical modality? As uh, people very often say when they sort of introduce metaphysical modality, it's sort of uncomfortably wedged between two other kinds of modalities. Um, that we have a much easier grip on, I think. There's logical modality, so I've put it in terms of possibilities here, you might do it with necessities as well, of course. There's logical modality, which, well, if you go into the philosophy of logic, isn't as simple as it might seem at first, but still, it's sort of nice and clean, and we've got a relatively good theoretical grip on it, but the possibilities here are wider than the metaphysical ones. On the other hand, um, and that's sort of at the bottom, there's the ordinary possibilities, the kinds of possibilities we talk about in everyday life. Um, they may be practical possibilities, technical possibilities, and so on. And, you know, these are not too, the, while there are too many logical possibilities, there are too few ordinary possibilities. Metaphysical possibility is wedged somewhere in between. And unlike logical and ordinary possibility, it's much harder to see what kind of grip we have on metaphysical possibility. Our grip on logical possibility is theoretical, but it's very stable, I think, theoretically. Our grip on ordinary possibility, well, it's ordinary. We have some grip on that in everyday life. And somehow from these two sides, we're supposed to come to metaphysical possibility. And I think there's a real choice to be made, sort of where we're approaching it from. If we sort of like the clean and clean, the cl cleanness and simpleness of logical possibilities, we might take a top-down approach and think of the metaphysical possibilities as it were as a restriction of the logical ones. Um, that's what you get, for instance, in two-dimensional semantics. But I think even some ways of doing um, an essentialist account of metaphysical modality um, is a little bit like that as well. 
Or instead of a top-down approach, you might take a bottom-up approach, starting with the ordinary possibilities and saying, well, that kind of thing and more of it, uh, that's the metaphysical possibilities. Clearly, you need to say more about the more of it. Um, but basically what you do, you start with ordinary possibilities and you extend um, them to get the metaphysical possibilities. I like to think, although labels are just labels, that we might call the top-down approach, whoops, sorry, that we might call the top-down approach a sort of Platonist one because it starts with the sort of nicely abstract and clean and, and simple and almost mathematical. Um, I'd like to call the bottom-up approach in some ways Aristotelian, just because I think of Aristotle as someone who's very much sort of bottom-up and looks at sort of the, um, the stuff of real life, but nothing too much depends on that. In any case, I'm going to take the bottom-up approach here. So I think that the bottom that we should think of metaphysical possibilities, sort of starting with ordinary possibilities. And I think we should do that, well, at least I tend to do that, both when answering the question I introduced earlier, the question, what is metaphysical possibility when asked by the beginning student and not by the philosopher invested in the theory of it? Um, I think sort of at least that's what I do. Um, I want to start with ordinary possibilities and say something like that, just a lot more general. But I also think we have a similar choice when it comes to knowledge of metaphysical possibilities. And here I'd like to keep things sort of together in line. And I'm going to approach the question of knowledge about metaphysical possibilities also in a bottom up way, starting with sort of ordinary possibilities, the kind of thing we know from everyday life. Um, and I think that's. Um, I'm not the only one to do that, obviously. Um, lots of people have done that, among them Sonia Rockaroyas, whose talk I unfortunately missed yesterday. Um, you can think even of somebody like Tim Williamson, although he's not quite a very stable case here, um, of the sort of more recent so-called anti-exceptionalist modal epistemologies very often do that kind of thing, but not, not all of them. I'm going to take that very seriously. Okay, and just as a footnote, I actually think that the different answers to the what is question, sort of top down and bottom up, may end up with theories that sort of address slightly different phenomena and people talking past each other, but that's not my topic today. Instead, as I announced, I'm going to change gear a little bit and look into the philosophy of action. Um, and there we will sort of locate something that's very much at the bottom, as it were, of the modal realm. And after I've established that, we'll return to modal epistemology proper. So I want to convince you of the following claim. To act intentionally in the ways that we do, we must have knowledge about, of our own abilities. That must, however, is not to be read too strongly. You can just read it as a sort of abductive, well, it's got to be like that. Anything else would be really, really weird or a miracle or whatever. So um, otherwise, this sounds a bit like a transcendental argument, and I don't think I can make that fly. OK, so, so you might rephrase the claim by saying that given that we act intentionally, um, we have every reason to believe that we have plenty of knowledge of our own abilities. I'm going to argue for this claim in three stages uh, because it's a claim about knowledge. Um, and I'm thinking of knowledge as roughly um, non-accidentally true belief. Um, so first I'm going to try and convince you that intentional action is typically guided by beliefs about our own abilities. Then I'm going to try and convince you that those beliefs are going to be largely true and non-accidentally so. And then finally, I'm going to look at the content of those beliefs, i.e. at the abilities that we need to have non-accidentally, sorry, that we do have non-accidentally true beliefs about um, and be more specific about that. OK, starting with belief. On almost every theory that you find in the philosophy of action, it's going to be true that intentional action Sorry, it's underlined here because maybe there's something like sub or non-intentional action and there it's less clear, but certainly people will believe that intentional action is guided by beliefs, for instance, about the means we take to our ends, but also about sort of very simple things like my belief that I'm taking part in a conference right now and that the thing in front of me is a computer. And the beliefs that guide our intentional actions tend to explain um, the actions we do, and they can also be invoked to justify the action. So here's a very simple example. If I have to get somewhere really fast um, and I cycle, then somebody can ask me, why did you take the bike and not the car, which would have been faster? And then I might say, well, because the car is broken. 
um, and thereby citing one of my beliefs that the car is broken. Um, maybe that belief, well, maybe that belief was a little bit more explicit, but I might also have said because I don't have a car. Um, and that's a belief that I very rarely make explicit, but it's still there and I can make it explicit to explain and justify my action. Now, the point is just that beliefs about our own abilities and lacks thereof play exactly the same role. So same situation, I have to get somewhere fast, I cycle, I don't drive. Somebody asks, why did you take the bike and not the car? And I say, well, because I can ride a bike, but I can't drive a car. Um, that's a very good reason uh, to take the bike and not the car. And that belief, or rather these two beliefs, one positive about an ability I have, one negative about an ability I lack, um, are very good explanations and justifications of my intentional action of cycling to wherever it was. More generally speaking, um, we can notice that in acting intentionally, we typically exercise some of our abilities. Um, maybe always, but for my claim, typically will be good enough. But our abilities are limited. I can ride a bike, but I can't drive a car. Um, I can drink from this glass, uh, but I can do so only if I take it to my lips and not if I leave it on the table. I can't sort of telepathically make the water move up into my mouth or whatever. Um, our abilities are limited. We have lots of abilities, but there's also limits to them. And so in acting, we need to have some way of picking those options. In fact, even delimiting options to that, which we have an ability to do and sometimes rank the options um, among which we choose uh, according to how well we're able to do that. And I said some way of picking, and I think that's some way of picking the options. And I think that here is just a job description for beliefs. So I hope it's plausible to think that our intentional actions are typically guided by beliefs about our own abilities. If intentional action is guided by beliefs at all, which I said, which as I said, is a mostly uncontroversial claim in philosophy of action. So it's not a very strong claim I'm making. I'm saying many, probably most of our intentional actions, there may be some exceptions, which feel free to ask me about um, in the discussion. Many, probably most of our intentional actions are guided by some beliefs about our own abilities. I'm not saying all intentional actions. I'm not saying which beliefs about which abilities. I'm not saying whenever I fight, I must have a belief that I'm able to fight. I'm just saying when I do something, then typically I will have some beliefs about what I can do and those will guide my action. Okay, next point, uh, these beliefs will be largely true considering that um, we are largely successful in our intentional actions. Now, clearly we fail at many things in life, unfortunately, um, but you know, if we look at intentional actions at a sort of very mundane level, every time you make a cup of coffee or cycle to work or even get out of bed, you're performing an intentional action. And if you look at intentional actions like that, I think it's clear that I think the majority of our intentional actions are successful. Um, successful actions tend to be guided by true beliefs because if our beliefs were false, um, then we would constantly go wrong. Um, so, and apply, I mean, this is true quite generally, but applying it to ability beliefs, if I had loads of false positive ability beliefs, if I thought of lots of abilities that I didn't have, that I actually had them, then that would make me pick various options that I'm actually unable to take um, and to perform. And so I would be exposed to massive failure in my intentional actions. And well, I don't know about you, but I'm guessing the same is true for you. I don't think I'm exposed to massive failure in my intentional actions. So I have reason to believe that lots of my positive ability beliefs are sort of approximately or at least or probably actually true. It's a bit more complicated for false negative ability beliefs. Maybe we have lots of abilities that we believe we lack. Maybe we're just largely underconfident. But, you know, um, that, that might be true. So we might have lots of false negative ability beliefs, but in a way, if we had too many of those, a typical agent with too many false negative ability beliefs would probably sort of just end up in inertia, not sort of doing anything because they didn't believe they could do it. Um, and again, I think, although we may have a lot of false negative ability beliefs, we probably don't have too many of them, or at least we have enough um, of the true positive ability beliefs. So I think we have reason to believe, again, this is abductive, um, that our ability beliefs are not mostly false, but rather are mostly true. 
Indeed, we have reason to believe that they're not just mostly true, but mostly non-accidentally true. Um, and this is a familiar thought from, from epistemology. If our true beliefs were merely accidentally true, then the actions they guide would be merely accidentally successful. That would be a miracle given how reliably successful our intentional actions are. So if we take our actions to be non-accidentally successful at least much of the time, then we should also think that the beliefs which guide them are non-accidentally true at least most of the time. And that will apply to ability beliefs as well. Perhaps a bit more specifically on abilities, although maybe a similar argument could be done for other beliefs as well. Many of the ability beliefs that we have will be put to the test and the actions that they guide. So not only is the belief sort of there to guide the action, but very often the, the ability beliefs that guide the action are about abilities which get exercised in the action. My belief that I can ride a bike not only guides my action of cycling uh, to the office, say, uh, but it's also put to the test in that very action. So by guiding our belief, but, sorry, by guiding our intentional actions, our ability beliefs are sort of constantly put to the test again and again. And that's an interesting point when you consider the possibility of accidentally true ability beliefs, for instance, Gettiard uh, ability beliefs, which you sort of acquired in some weird way um, that may be justified, but still sort of didn't have the right link. You know, that might not be knowledge, but if you then put that belief to the test again and again and again, you'll have a good epistemic basis for taking yourself to have that belief. So there's the feedback from the guided intentional actions. Um, that also gives us reason to think that our ability beliefs are largely non-accidentally true um, on the basis of sort of good evidence that we get by exercising the abilities in question. So here's the claim I've argued for. Many, probably most of our intentional actions, the sort of well, I'll just read it out. Many, probably most of our intentional actions are guided by some knowledge about our own abilities. Again, many, probably most, I'm not saying all. Um, the argument I've given you for truth and non-accidentality certainly don't bear that out. It's really just a sort of, in general, that's probably going to be the case. And again, I'm not saying which particular bits of knowledge about our own abilities. I'm not saying every time you fire, you will have to have knowledge that you can fire. There are good counterexamples to those kinds of claims. But some knowledge about our own abilities will typically play a role in successful intentional actions. So it's not a very controversial claim, but it's still worth throwing it out. And I think maybe the most controversial, or at least the most interesting bit is when it comes to the abilities that we know about in intentional action. There are some interesting distinctions drawn between different types of abilities. Uh, we can distinguish between simple and robust abilities. Um, sometimes when people talk about abilities, um, you know, you can have cases like David Lewis's famous speaking Finnish example. He says an ape doesn't have the larynx and so on to speak Finnish. But I do, I can speak Finnish, but don't take me to Helsinki as your interpreter because really I can't speak Finnish. Um, so the first uh, statement, I can speak Finnish, claims a simple ability. It's something more like a direct possibility. The second, I can't speak Finnish, um, that denies um, a, a robust ability, an ability that's something you can reliably count on, that you have some control over, can think of robust abilities as a bit like tools that you can draw upon um, and that you can use uh, to achieve your goals. Now, what's interesting about robust abilities for our purposes is partly this kind of element of control. And one way that comes out is that robust abilities are quite unlike possibilities in that they violate axiom T, the axiom which says that whatever is actually true is possibly true. Because it's not the case that whenever you do something, you have the robust ability to do it. Anthony Kenny pointed that out back in the 70s. Um, you know, even a hopeless darts player might hit the bull's eye once in a while, but having hit the bull's eye once doesn't entail that you have the ability in this robust sense to hit the bull's eye. So that's one distinction. Another distinction I want to draw is between so-called general and specific abilities. A general ability is one which you possess probably intrinsically in virtue of your intrinsic constitution and independently of your circumstances, uh, whereas specific abilities depend on sort of whether the circumstances are good. So I have the ability to swim right now in the sense of general ability. I've learned to swim. I'm, you know, there's nothing, I haven't broken any legs, I can swim. Um, 
but you know, I can't swim. There's no water right here. There's no way I could swim now. Um, so I have the general ability, but not the specific ability to swim right now. Okay, how does that apply to my argument? I think we what the argument about intentional action shows is that um, in acting intentionally, we're guided by beliefs, not just about simple abilities, because I do have the simple ability to drive a car. It's just, you know, that's not what should guide me when I decide how to get to the office. The simple ability to drive a car is not good enough. So very often, at least, we need to be guided by knowledge of our robust abilities. That's important. Second, um, you might think that for any particular action, it's good enough to know about the specific ability, you know, for the intentional action of going for a swim. It's really important whether I have the specific ability to swim. I don't, I, maybe I don't need to think too much about my general abilities there. However, our actions aren't sort of just disconnected little atoms, or as um, Michael Bradman nicely puts it, we're not time slice agents. So for one thing, we can learn about our abilities. Um, when I learned how to swim, I also learned in the end that I have the ability to swim and it's that knowledge which I can take from one situation into the next. And so every time I go swimming, I call on the same bit of knowledge. I don't have to sort of form a completely new piece of knowledge about my ability to swim. So I think um, knowledge of general abilities has an important role to play in that it enables us to take knowledge of abilities from one situation into the next. And it's thereby much more explanatory than just knowledge of specific abilities. Moreover, a lot of our actions take place over time. Um, I focus more on intentional actions like going for a swim or making a cup of coffee, but we also perform intentional actions like writing a book or raising a child. Uh, those take a lot of time um, and we, we need to plan them. Um, at least people who focus on these kinds of actions like to talk about planning. In planning, we also need to take into account our abilities, but very often we don't even know what the specific abilities are going to be. Um, so all we can rely on are our general abilities, which tend to be a lot more sort of stable over time. So to conclude, my claim is that as intentional agents, we in all probability do have a lot of knowledge about our own robust and general abilities. Now, abilities are a um, modal phenomenon. Um, you know, they're a very complicated modal phenomenon, um, as we've seen, for instance, by the fact that they don't go with a nice and simple modal logic, uh, like um, with something like axiom T, but they're clearly modal. Um, they're sort of, you can see that simply by thinking about how we ascribe them. We use the paradigm modal auxiliary can, um, and we actually use that in its paradigm uses to ascribe abilities. If you ask people on the street, give me a sentence with can, you're going to get something like, I can ride a bike. At least that's what linguists claim. Okay, so given that abilities are modal, even if they very seem to be very complicated, and if you look at the recent literature on ability ascriptions and modal semantics, they do give you very complicated stuff, um, but it's still modal stuff. So you know, if we think about knowledge of abilities, it's a kind of modal knowledge. And so if you're looking for a place to sort of explain that kind of knowledge, modal epistemology, the epistemology of modality seems like a good place to look. So that's what I'm gonna do, albeit very briefly. Um, I'll start by partitioning modal epistemology into rationalist approaches, which take modal knowledge to be sort of closely linked to something like a priori knowledge, conceivability, and so on, and empiricist approaches, um, which aren't really classically empiricist, um, but I might have called them anti-exceptionalist approaches, but which just think that our modal knowledge is sort of continuous with our empirical knowledge of the world. And I sort of... <laughs> give you that petition just to bracket the one side of it, because I think rationalist approaches don't look like a very good fit for ability knowledge. It doesn't seem to be the kind of thing that comes, that where conceivability or a priori, a priori knowledge plays a very sort of obvious role. I think ability knowledge is sort of prime ground for empiricist approaches, because those are the approaches that have cared very much about our ordinary modal knowledge that I've been more in line with my sort of bottom up um, approach to modal knowledge. So I'm just gonna look at those. And even here, I'm gonna just have to pick and choose. So I'm picking two very prominent and promising approaches 
in empiricist mode epistemology, the counterfactual based one, which is primarily linked with Tim Williamson, although Thomas Krudel has also uh, done some important work on it, and the similarity based approach, which is primarily linked with the name of Sonia Rocco Royas. Um, and Peter Hawke has also done important work on it. Okay, so I'll start with the counterfactual based approach. As most of you probably know, Tim Williamson's idea is that um, there's very, you know, there's good, we have some mechanisms to evaluate counterfactual conditionals, and there's going to be an evolutionary explanation for that. Um, you can learn from counterfactuals, they're just very important for all sorts of things in life. Um, and you can start with counterfactuals, like um, if that bush hadn't been there, the rock would have ended in the lake, sort of going for a walk and seeing the rock roll down. Um, and then Tim Williamson thinks that if you sort of do weird things with these counterfactuals, like putting um, contradictions in there, um, then they will enable you to gain knowledge of metaphysical modality. Um, Mark Jago criticized that um, the day before yesterday. Now, I'm not concerned with Tim Williamson's actual claim, namely the idea that counterfactuals can give us insight into, or sort of the mechanisms we use to evaluate counterfactuals can also be used to gain knowledge of possibility and necessity. I'm interested in ability knowledge. So that's not what Tim Williamson actually does. But you might think lots of people have actually thought that abilities are a lot like counterfactuals, that to have the ability to do something is to be such that if you were to try it or to intend it, then you would do it. So this might actually look quite promising for abilities. However, in order to use counterfactual knowledge to gain ability knowledge, you need to have prior ability knowledge already. And here's why. It's been noted that in general, a counterfactual, unless you do fancy stuff like putting in contradictions as Tim Williamson does, in general, a counterfactual does not entail a possibility. The fact that if P were the case, then Q would be the case normally by itself, without anything else about P, doesn't entail possibly Q. It does so only if you add in possibly P. Okay, that's possibility, but the same is true for abilities. Um, if P were the case, then Q would be the case, does not entail that I can make it the case that Q, whatever you put in for P, it does that only if I can also make it the case that P. So, um, and that's well known in, in as as a sort of counter as actually a problem for conditional accounts of abilities. The fact that if I were to try to touch a spider, I would touch a spider isn't good enough to say that I can touch a spider. I also need the ability to try to touch the spider, which in certain pathological conditions I might actually lack. And the same holds for knowledge. Knowing that if P were if I were to try something, then I would do it doesn't give me knowledge that I'm able to do it unless I also know that I can try. Um, and trying doesn't always work. So in any case, whatever we do with these counterfactuals, they're going to require prior ability knowledge to give us new ability knowledge. In addition, there's been some interesting empirical work um, trying to show that actually um, the ability to evaluate counterfactual conditionals in the way that adults do and that philosophers have modeled, say in the Lewis Stallmaker semantics, develops quite late. Um, so two psychologists, Josef Perner and Eva Raffetzeder, have written a series of papers with various co-authors in which they try to show that actually children sort of below the age of 10 and in some of their studies, even 13, don't quite evaluate counterfactuals in the way that we grown-ups do and that the Lewis Stallmaker semantics would make you expect. Now that's empirical work and I can't really judge it. Um, I've seen some objections to it that didn't convince me, but you know, I'm not a psychologist, but if they're right, then evaluating a counterfactual in the way that philosophers need for their theories is actually quite difficult. Whereas knowing about your own abilities should be really simple because, you know, that's what we do in order to act intentionally. And you don't need to be over 10 to perform intentional actions. So two reasons not to go the counterfactual based way. Um, a glaring omission here is imagination, and I think that faces sort of similar problems to counterfactual-based accounts, but I won't go into it. Instead, I'm going to look at similarity-based approaches. So Sonia, and I hope I'm not uh, misrepresenting Sonia's view. If, if I do, I think she's here. She can correct me um, in the discussion. So on a similarity-based view, 
what happens when you, uh, the similarity based view, I'm sorry, the similarity based view seems like, again, a perfect way to get to ability knowledge because what it's concerned with is the array possibilities typically expressed with the word can. So Sonia's favorite example, I think, is uh, knowing that her desk can break. How does that work? Well, you start with knowledge of actuality. Uh, Sonia saw her previous desk break. Um, you then plug in axiom T, given that it did break, it could break. Actuality entails possibility. And then by the similarity between the two tables or desks, you can reason that the new desk can break too, because the old desk was one that could break. Now you've already noticed that axiom T plays a very important role here. Um, and that's why the account, you know, I'm not objecting to the account um, in itself because it's not supposed to apply to ability knowledge. It's supposed to apply to array possibilities where axiom T is fine. But if we, we wanted to apply it to abilities, then, um, you know, we just don't have axiom T there because as I told you, I'm talking about robust abilities and one of the characteristic features of robust abilities is their failure to satisfy axiom T. So you may have noticed the difference between my two objections. My objection to the counterfactual based approach um, was not that it can't ever give us ability knowledge, but just that it can't sort of be at the beginning of our ability knowledge. It may be ampliative. Once you have some ability knowledge, you may use it to gain some more, but it can't be generative sort of what generates ability knowledge in the first place. The similarity-based approach, on the other hand, because it relies on an axiom that's just invalid for abilities, doesn't seem to be able to give us any ability knowledge at all, however well it may perform with regards to possibility knowledge. However, as we'll, just, as we'll see in a moment, I think the similarity-based approach, well, something quite similar to the similarity-based approach might actually help us with ability knowledge after all, but it has to do without axiom T. Okay, so that was a short and very selective um, look at model epistemology as we have it. Um, and again, I'm not objecting to either of these two accounts as accounts of knowledge of possibility or necessity, which is what they're supposed to be. I'm just saying that we can't get knowledge of ability sort of for free by just using the epistemologies of modality that we have. So maybe we need something else. I said that abilities are modal, um, and I'll stick with that, um, but abilities are modal and they're also agentive. That's sort of what makes them so special. Abilities are sort of at the intersection of the modal stuff to do with possibilities and the agentive stuff to do with action, control, activeness, that kind of stuff. So maybe if we're thinking about the epistemology of abilities, um, maybe what we have in modal epistemology is just not agentive enough. And maybe instead of looking at extent uh, theories in modal epistemology, we should be looking at agency itself. Now, I said earlier that intentional actions, intentional agency are guided by ability beliefs. Now I'm going to suggest, although I'm afraid I can do no more than, than suggesting, um, that a bit knowledge of ability also arises from action, not necessarily intentional action, but action. If you think that's circular, then please recall the, the weakness of my claim earlier. I said many, perhaps most intentional actions are guided by knowledge of abilities. So maybe there are some actions which aren't, but which give rise to ability knowledge. Maybe all intentional actions are guided by ability knowledge, but there are sort of pre or sub-intentional actions which aren't yet guided by that kind of knowledge, but give rise to it. So I don't think there's a circularity problem. Still, um, how is um, agency, intentional or otherwise, supposed to give rise to ability knowledge? There's one option, um, which I sort of like, but I don't think I can argue anybody else into it um, unless they already like it too. Um, so I'm just going to put that out there and then give you another option as well. So the first option is that agency just directly gives rise to knowledge of ability. How would that be? Well, there is a literature on the phenomenology of agency, the experience of agency, the sense of agency, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's a lot of literature on that in sort of between philosophy and psychology, um, though a lot of it is about sort of which regions of the brain are doing what and I didn't find that too useful for my purposes. 
Um, but there's some really interesting work, for instance, by Susanna Siegel, who's being quoted here on sort of the difference between experiencing something as just happening and experiencing something as brought about by you. Um, so she calls that the phenomenology of efficacy. And um, what Susanna Siegel suggests tantalizingly without following up on it at the very end of that paper is the following. Perhaps in the paradigm cases of the feeling of efficacy, sorry, I should have given you examples. So she has the example um, that um, you, you press a button, you have, I don't know, for some reason, you've got this fancy apartment in Paris, which with a view of the Eiffel Tower. Um, and you press a button and sort of at the very moment you, you've pressed the button, the Eiffel Tower gets illuminated. And she says, there are two ways of experiencing that. One is as just sort of you press the button and the Eiffel Tower gets illuminated. The other is as sort of you experience that as if you had turned on the lighting of the Eiffel Tower, even if clearly, unless you're delusional, you don't think that's what you did, but it might still feel that way. Okay. So perhaps in the paradigm cases of the feeling of efficacy, one feels oneself to be exercising a power such that one could exercise it again at will given the right circumstances. That sounds very much like a robust general ability. In contrast, even though the subject in our examples of mere first person causation, so this is, for instance, you stumble, you fall on a vase, you knock over the vase, but it doesn't feel like that's something you did. It's not an exercise of your powers. Even though the subject in our examples of mere first person causation has a power to say knock over a vase, it seems wrong to say that they're exercising those powers or that they feel as if they are. Now, Susanna Siegel doesn't sort of come from the metaphysics of powers and abilities. I might want to phrase these things slightly differently, but the suggestion is there. The suggestion is that if you feel yourself to be affecting something in the world, to be doing something, to be active, agentive, then that's a feeling of exercising your own powers. That feeling doesn't necessarily have to be juridical, as the Eiffel Tower case shows, um, but you know, maybe it is in some cases, and maybe that's a guide to sort of your own abilities in exercising them. I have some sympathy for that, but the problem with phenomenology is always that you can't really argue people into it. So if you don't feel it, you're not going to feel it, and I can't do anything about that. So here's a less direct route. Um, it's still based on agency, and it still starts with a sense of your own agency. You're doing something, you feel it to be your own doing, but maybe that doesn't directly feel as if you've exercised your powers. Sorry, my son just came home. I don't know if you heard him, but he was very happy about something. Um, so even if that individual sort of case of agency doesn't give you a feeling of exercising your powers, it may very well be that if you get that feeling regularly, there's some sort of probably some mechanism we have, um, some cognitive uh, mechanism or some sort of abductive reasoning that makes you then sort of think that you have the ability to do that thing. Um, I think knowledge of dispositions works a lot like that. You see salt dissolving in water again and again, and sort of abductively that makes it plausible to think that salt is water soluble. And very often that works implicitly. I think we have very reliable mechanisms for these kinds of things. And you may notice that this has some similarities with the similarity-based approach to modal epistemology because we are going from the actual exercise to the ability, but it's more of an abductive step, not the kind of conceptual step that would be licensed by an axiom T, and it also needs the agentive element. Now, if that's a promising sort of way to go for knowledge of abilities, here's an, something, um, Here's an, here's an interesting point about it. If somehow it is agency together with some very sort of basic mechan cognitive mechanisms we have, if that's what gives rise to knowledge of our own abilities, we have reason to believe that we have sort of at least the early beginnings of that knowledge really early on in life. Um, there's this very famous experiment, um, which some of you may know about, uh, by Rove Collier, the paper is Rove and Rove 1969, uh, where they tied, um, a mobile that's sort of above a crib to the leg of, I think, two or three months old babies. And the babies soon noticed that they could make the mobile move. And very soon they didn't do anything else. They would just kick with that leg and be really, really excited about how the thing moved up there. And much more excited than they would be if the thing moved like that 
by its own. So it seems like we're sort of attuned to our own agency really early on in life. And if that sort of attunement to our own agency is a gateway into knowledge of our own abilities, it seems we've got what it takes um, to gain, well, at least some predecessors of our knowledge of abilities really early on in life. Now, I focused on our own abilities, um, but clearly similar. If, if that kind of thing works, then it's going to work for other kinds of modal properties as well. Um, in fact, some developmental psychologists have argued that children, infants really early on, learn about their own powers and the powers of the things around them, so-called affordances of things, for instance, that, you know, you can produce a sound with that rattle, that kind of thing, probably also abilities of other people. Um, and so I think agency is a very interesting source of a special type of modal knowledge, um, modal knowledge that isn't of the clean and simple um, modalities that the philosophers tend to focus on, boxes and diamonds with nice axioms like T, but something that's clearly modal and that's clearly very important for survival. Um, if you don't know about your own abilities, it's going to be really hard. Um, and which if we think about sort of the cognitive story, the actual real story of how modal knowledge develops may very well be um, at the beginning of that process. I haven't told you how that process might continue from there. Um, that's a project for a whole book, which I'm, as I said, in the early stages um, of writing. Um, so I don't know, I'm not sure about where I'm gonna go on all the details there, but I hope to have convinced you that there are some promising beginnings for modal epistemology in agency, and that those beginnings look very neo-Aristotelian. Thanks a lot for your patience. And here's a lot of references. Um, various things that I've referred to here. You should be able to see um, a short slideshow, which Sonia will take you through. Um, the, the structure is not very complicated. Uh, I'm aiming to speak for 40 to 45 minutes, but I have a bad habit of going over, so I'm going to have to really control myself here, and that might require me to skip a few passages and at the risk of not making as much sense as I could, saving time by just hopping onto a, a topic that's maybe a bit more important. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Reverse myriological essentialism. So, so myriological essentialism is the thesis that every whole has its parts necessarily. Um, and this is a thesis that has its home in extensional myriology, where effectively what is essential and what is necessary are one and the same. Before a metaphysician of Aristotelian and sort of more scholastic inclinations, this would make myriological essentialism doubly objectionable. So, uh, firstly, whether parts are had necessarily will depend on whether they're had essentially, and then whether they're had essentially would depend on the essence of the object that you're investigating, for example, whether it's uh, a set or a setter. A setter is a kind of dog for those of you. <laughs> uh, secondly, the thesis is, is, is just patently false as a general claim about what there is, and a, a universally false across, across um, huge parts of the furniture of the cosmos, namely macrophysical substances. So I'm not going to be dwelling on myriological essentialism. I'm just assuming it. Uh, to be false uh, and, and certainly to be at a minimum inconsistent with the whole approach that I take, for, which is uh, the more classical Aristotelian approach. However, there might be something to be said in favour of the converse, which Catherine uh, Kuzliki very happily calls reverse myriological essentialism, uh, art, which I'm going to call RME. And that's the thesis that every part, so instead of every, the holes have their part, every hole has its parts essentially, it will be the thesis that every part has its whole essentially which sounds a bit strange, but it's the thesis that if X is a part of Y and Y is a whole, then X is essentially a part of Y, and so X is necessarily a part of Y. So for an Aristotelian scholastic, RME has far more appeal than its evil twin, even though its, you know, its evil twin, myriological essentialism, is far more well known. Um, actually, I think I'm going to take this as a good opportunity to skip a few uh, sides here. Um, so... Whereas myriological essentialism is the idea that uh, a whole can't lose its parts, and for an Aristotelian, this is just crazy, whether you're talking about a rock or a rodent or a lemur or a lump of gold, um, substances, at least many substances, maybe not all, um, but, you know, that's, I don't even need to, to get into that, but certainly loads of substances uh, can lose and gain parts. Um, so RME, by contrast, seeks to preserve the intuition that rocks, lumps of gold, rodents, and lemurs all exist exactly as we, as we think they do, as, as substantial wholes. 
And this does not mean that RME is correct, only that the largely disregarded RME is an intuitively better place to start when understanding wholes and parts than uh, its converse. So uh, what I'm going to do first is to just set out RME, and then I'm, I think all I'm going to have time to do after that is to consider a whole bunch of objections against it. So I want to start off by setting it out, giving it, giving a kind of uh, a master argument. I'm actually just going to put my own uh, clock on here so uh, I can actually see what the time is, which I can't at the moment. Yeah, it's better. Um, uh, and just go through a number of objections because I think this is the case where going through the objections is a process not just of responding to others but of clarifying the thesis or part of the response is to clarify the thesis to, to make it more comprehensible and hopefully more plausible. First thing to point out is that RME is a thesis about substances not about holes in general even though um, Kozlicki for example introduces it as uh, a thesis about holes because she's referring to a discussion in Verity Hart's um, book uh, on play so uh, where it's formulated, thesis of RME is formulated in terms of parts and wholes. Um, and so I, I'm going to put aside the notion of wholes, just generally speak, in a very generic sense, um, because I'm happy to think, to say, for example, that an aggregate of objects such as a pile of stones uh, is such that um, uh, that, that uh, it's not the case um, sorry, that it is the case that um, every stone, you know, uh, has to be a part of the whole, um, uh, but the, the and and the whole, but the whole is not essential to the part. So you might say that uh, the stone can be removed from the aggregate, and the stone continues to exist to, as a stone. It's a very the very same stone in all respects, or whatever, and uh, except maybe for some qualitative differences. I'm happy to accept all of that. Um, and the same thing applies to artifacts. So again, I want to make a sharp distinction between artifacts and substances. So to use her example, we, we um, you know, she, she objects to RME on the grounds that, for example, a carburetor uh, could not literally be installed into a car because according to RME, it would cease to exist and be replaced by something qualitatively simi similar. But you know, when it comes to artifacts, I'm happy to accept that, that point that you can literally take the very same carburetor out of a car put it on the workshop bench, fix, play around with it, put it back in the car. It's nothing has changed its numerical or perhaps even qualitative um, identity. But we're not talking there about substances, right? Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of it. Artifacts are mind dependent entities. Um, again, uh, aggregates, which I'm just meaning in a very loose term, very loose sense, collections of objects are ontologically dependent on their, their particular parts. Um, and so myriological essentialism is a far more plausible doctrine for aggregates than it is for at least most um, substances. Um, and also reverse myriological essentialism is less plausible. But when we're talking about substances, these on the sort of Aristotelian scholastic analysis are ontologically independent entities, or to use the scholastic jargon per se existence. And the contrast that, say, Aquinas makes is between a per se existence and in alio, in another existence. So he says substance is understood to be that which has a quiddity to which it belongs to be not in another, which is just a variation of Aristotle in the categories. So I'm not going to give a formal definition of substance here. That's a whole other thing. There's a, a, a bit of a literature on that, and I don't want to get into that. The central point for present purposes is that um, substances as independent entities don't rely on other entities for their essential operation as the kinds of things that they are. And this is a kind of a deep ontological phenomenon, as E.J. Lowe puts it, not merely a logical or causal matter. Um, so how does this kind of ontological independence of substances bear upon RME? Well, the idea is that is as follows. Since substances don't rely on anything distinct from them for their essential operation as the kinds of things they are, that operation must come from within themselves. But what is within themselves is matter organized by form. So again, it's not strictly necessary to look at it this way, but this I'm going to continue with the basic uh, classical um, classical uh, hylomorphic count. That organization of matter by form is at least partially constituted by the interaction of the parts of the substance. Um, given this constitutive relation of parts to whole, it follows immediately that the essence of the parts is provided by the essence of the substance. 
So the essence of the parts is provided by the essence of the substance. Yet since nothing can have more than one essence, the parts cannot also at the same time have some other essence that is not provided by the essence of the substance. So it's of the essence of the part that it stand in the right kind of relation to the whole, such that the essence of the whole actually provides the essence of the part. But if the part were not part of the whole, then such a relation between the part and the whole could only obtain by magic. Hence, the part must stand precisely in the part of relation to the whole. So more prosaically, the part must be a part of the whole substance. And this means more than mere location. It means that the part must, as it were, be doing its thing as a part of the substance. That and nothing more, because to do its thing is precisely to operate according to its essence. And the essence is, as I've already said, provided wholly by the substance of which the part is a part. And this is a kind of what I call a kind of master argument for RME. So the thesis is that the parts of a substance are essentially parts of that substance. Anything which is not essentially a part of substance S is not a part of S at all. Moreover, if a part of S ceases to be a part of S, then P ceases to exist altogether. Now, this does not entail that anything vanishes or that no trace of the part P is left behind. It doesn't entail either that for P to be a part of S, S must be whole or complete, because something, a substance S, can be a substantial whole without being a whole substance, because it might lack other parts or qualities needed for the normal expression of its essence. Um, so what is the relation between RME and Aristotle's famous principle of homonymy? So homonymy for Aristotle is simply the phenomenon whereby two objects may possess the same name, but different essences, the sameness of name explained by some similarity or analogy between them. The principle of homonymy is taken to be a thesis about homonymy as applied to substances and their parts, although it's often found in the context of a discussion by Aristotle of things like statues and their parts or pictures of substances compared to substances themselves. Just as the statue of a man <clears throat> is a man in name only, so the hand of a statue is a hand in name only, and a picture of a man is a man in name only. The same applies to a severed part of an organism, the dead part of a living organism, or the part of a dead organism. So the principle can then be stated as necessarily P is a literal part of substance S, just in case P is functioning as a part of S. And I take the principle of homonymy so stated to be necessarily extensionally equivalent to RME, but not quite saying the same thing. Um, RME is about the essence of the part of a substance, whereas homonymy is about the necessary relation between being a literal part of a substance and the functioning, its functioning as a part of a substance. Um, I don't think the dis difference in connotation is metaphysically significant, and I, I just doubt whether RME could ever be true while homonymy was not true or vice versa. So that's the basic kind of setup of what RME is. And now I want to um, elaborate and defend by considering a series of objections that have been raised against it. So here's the first objection that I'm going to consider. So every uh, example that Aristotle gives when he talks about homonymy is about living substances. So he obviously thought it applied only to those, so we should only take RME as applying to living substances. Uh, my reply is that actually Aristotle doesn't only speak of organic substances when defending homonymy. In the meteorology, he talks about fire and water and substances where matter predominates most, and he talks about inanimate bodies like copper and silver. It's a difficult discussion to interpret, but it's pretty clear that he speaks indifferently of the animate and the inanimate when discussing homonymy there. He says that intermediate bodies, which are intermediate between prime matter and pure form, each have a final cause and are not just bodies consisting of, say, fire or water or flesh or intestines. I think that's a key point. All such things are determined by their function, and the true being of each consists in its ability to perform its particular function. That's the key kind of RME insight. Now, someone might, you know, a friend of our RME might push the support, push his, you know, fellow friends of RME to say, look, you, you need to concede that um, it, it really RME only applies to organisms because of the special way that they're organized compared to the inorganic world. 
But I don't think we should, I, I think we should gracefully decline the invitation to make the concession. All parts of all substances, organic and inorganic, are wholly defined by their function in relation to the substances to which they belong. Um, and the way that I've, I've put it on a number of previous occasions is that the parts subserve the whole in a way that does not apply, for example, to an artifact or a pile of stones. And by subserve, I mean that the parts of the substance in their essence and function are wholly defined and constrained by what they do to or for the substance to which they belong and thus contribute exhaustively to the essence and function of the substance itself. There's obviously a significant difference between the organic and the inorganic, but this generic subservience of parts to wholes is the same. The exhaustive explanation of the essence and function of a human liver is in terms of what it contributes to the essence and function of the human whose liver it is. The same, <coughs> pardon me, the same is true of a particular chunk of gold belonging to a lump of gold. Now, I don't mean a piece of gold that is, for example, uh, stuck with glue to a lump of gold or something like that. I mean a chunk that is part of the lump, that is to say, which overlaps with indefinitely other uh, many other chunks belonging to the lump and that is chemically fused to the rest of the gold in whatever crystalline structure that lump happens to have, even if the lump contains non-gold impurities, as is so often the case with lumps of mineral. Um, now, it might seem that the difference between a human organ, for example, and a chunk of gold in a lump of gold is, is so stark that the very idea of such chunks subserving the whole is absurd. But I think this difference cuts both ways. On one hand, the organic differentiation occurring in organisms with specialized parts makes manifest the idea of subservience. The liver has one special subservient function, or rather a cluster of functions, the heart another, legs another, and so on. Nothing like that applies to a lump of mineral. But on the other hand, it's the very differentiation that motivates the obvious objection to RME that organs can only exist Whole, that, sorry, that organs can exist wholly separated from the substances to which they belong, as when a heart, for example, is removed and kept alive for a future transplant. A lump of gold that doesn't actually suffer from that particular problem. It might have all sorts of odd-shaped bits and pieces among its chunks, but they do not have specialised functions. So there is hardly a starting intuition that if I removed one of those bits and pieces or carved out a chunk of gold, the resulting object will be just will be doing just what it does when part of the original lump, albeit unsuccessfully, uh, uh, as what it does when the when part of the original lump, when it was part of the original lump, albeit unsuccessfully. Compare to the case when a critic of RME might say that a pre-transplant heart on ice was still doing its thing beating and pumping blood, but without complete success or in a, in a restricted way. On the contrary, the separated chunk, while still of course gold, is in no way functioning as it does when part of the lump, because when fused to the lump, it is part of the crystalline structure peculiar to that lump. If we are myriological essentialists about lump of, lumps of gold, and I'm going to just actually be agnostic about that, we should say that when part of the lump, the unseparated chunk contributes to the lump's very existence. If we're not meriological essentialists about such things, we should say simply that the chunk contributes to the lump's contingent qualities of shape, weight, volume, and so on. When separated, it does none of those things. When separated, it now has its own shape, weight, volume, and other physical characteristics that it very doubtfully has when fused to the lump, given that it is overlapped by so many indefinitely many other chunks. Um, so I'm going to skip a bit here and just say again that, um, you know, just to emphasize that I'm going to hold on to the classical view from Aristotle that RME applies to inorganic and organic substances. So I'm skipping on to the second objection, which is that the separation of a part from a substance, if RME is true, would involve the literal destruction of the part and its replacement, as Kozlicki puts it, by a numerically distinct, qualitatively similar object. And she takes that to be absurd because she says it implies that the creation and destruction of objects is a much less involved affair than we ordinarily suppose. And Robert Coons, who is also skeptical about RME, although again, he's a near Aristotelian, says that RME entails that whenever a new composite substance like an organism is generated, the material components incorporated into it are literally annihilated and replaced by new elements, each of whose existence and identity are dependent on the continued existence of the whole substance. And, and they think that these sorts of implications are just on the face of it objectionable. So I, I need you to split up two actual objections in what they say here. So first, 
the question of qualitatively similar or identical replacements. Well, that's not quite the right interpretation of what happens when a substance gains or loses parts. And I think Kozlicki here is misled by the artifact example that she uses, namely the car and the carburetor. And that's why it's so important to keep artifacts separate from substances here. It leads to confusion. A separated part of an artifact, despite losing some or all function, still exists in the context of a world of minds with intentions and purposes for that part. A carburetor that is not right now mixing air and fuel inside a car for internal combustion is still intended to do so and is in this sense no different ontologically from a bread knife that is not right now cutting bread. Against that background it is correct to say that the mechanic is literally going to put the repaired carburetor back in the car. There are, by contrast and by definition, no minds or intentions on which a substance is ontologically dependent. So there is not on this score any ontological foundation that could ground the continued existence of a separated part of a substance as opposed to the separated part of an artifact. It's wrong to think of the separated part of a substance as an object that has done no more than shift its location, remaining otherwise qualitatively similar or even identical. Along the same lines, it's wrong to conceive of such a separation as a so-called Cambridge change, so as when Fred becomes the tallest man in the room because all the taller people have left. In fact, there's a quite visible change in a separated part of a substance, or more precisely, when a part is separated from a substance. The separated entity, though it may be in many intrinsic respects, possibly all, but probably that's never the case, in many intrinsic respects similar to the unseparated part, but it's no longer integrated with the substance and so cannot possibly be doing any of the things the unseparated part must by definition do that consist in subserving the whole substance. So the putative separated heart, which is not on this view a literal heart, is doing none of what a genuine heart does. But surely you might object a separated heart can, with available technology, continue to beat and even circulate blood. Well, I'm going to talk more about this case later if I have time or I can do in q and I'm just going to claim for now, um, counterintuitively at first, that beating and circulating blood are not essential properties of a heart. The relevant essential properties of a human heart are to beat inside a human body and to circulate blood around a human body. And uh, unless, I, unless I be accused of a kind of question begging stipulation here, my point is that mere beating and pumping no more illuminate what a heart essentially is than contracting or storing electricity. It's how these functions contribute to the function of the organism with a heart that gives the essence. So it's quite arbitrary metaphysically to focus on beating and pumping as essential any more than contracting, storing electricity, or for that matter, making a noise or being pink and shiny. And the relation of a chunk of gold separated from a lump of gold is no different in this respect. The separated chunk is no longer physico-chemically integrated with the lump, and so makes no contribution to the overall crystalline structure or weight, density, volume, or other properties of the lump. It is then in no way rightfully called a chunk in the specific sense I'm using here. It's rather a new lump of gold. The chunk literally went out of existence when the matter constituting it was removed from the lump. The same can be said of, for example, a water molecule removed from a puddle of water. I take it that a puddle of water is a substance and that its water molecules are parts. If a single water molecule could be removed by electrolysis from the puddle, the resulting entity, the separated molecule of H2O, would still chemically be water, but it would not be doing any of what it does essentially as part of the puddle. It contributes nothing to the crystalline structure of the puddle, nothing to its liquidity, viscosity, volume, and so on. But if the separated entity is to be literally a part of the puddle, it must do these things, otherwise to call it a part is vacuous, or a kind of metaphysical voodoo. So there are lots of other examples, but I think the basic idea should be clear enough. So let's move on to the next objection, which is the other, the other objection that is kind of packed into what I mentioned from um, Kozlicki and Kuhn's earlier. So consider the closely related worry that separating a part from a substance involves the annihilation of the part, and conversely, introducing a part into a substance means creating the part. 
and Coons and Kozlicki are perplexed by this apparent consequence of RME. My reply here is that if someone is puzzled by what happens ontologically when a part is separated from a substance, they should be puzzled by all substantial change. Every case of substantial change, be it metabolism, chemical transmutation, the destruction of a rock under a jackhammer, the fertilization of an ovum by a spermatozoan, or the binary fission of an amoeba, involves the literal going out of existence of one substance and the coming into existence of another, or at least one other. How easy or involved, to use Kozlicki's term, it is to produce or destroy a substance is metaphysically irrelevant. And moreover, the use of terms like creation and annihilation is misleading because no literal creation or annihilation takes place in substantial change. You know, Aristotelian scholastics are very careful, following Aristotle, are very careful in, in the language they use here. <coughs> there is, to be sure, what Aristotelian scholastics call generation and corruption, but true creation and annihilation are ex nihilo and in nihilum from literal nothing and into literal nothing. Substantial change does not instantiate creation and annihilation precisely because of the existence of prime matter. And that's another discussion for another occasion. I have actually a paper on prime matter coming out shortly, so I'll, I talk a lot about topics related to that in that paper. Even if one is skeptical about prime matter, the skepticism should not carry over to the separation of a part from a substance or the introduction of a new part, because there is guaranteed to be an existing material substrate for both processes. So even if you don't believe in prime matter, you'll have a material substrate, an existing piece of matter, whether or not qualitatively similar in some appropriate sense to the prior or later part. In other words, Whilst RME in no way commits one to creation and annihilation, it does commit one to the transformation, literally, of matter from one metaphysical state to another. And I think that's far less to swallow than what the critics suppose must be accepted. So on to the fourth objection. Uh, this is Robert Coons speaking. He discusses uh, the what he calls the radical thesis expounded by Anima Maduro following uh, Theodore Scalsus, following Aristotle, that the parts of a substance exist, quote, only potentially. And he takes this to entail that substances literally have no parts, and so there are no composite substances at all, and that is absurd on its face. My reply <clears throat> is that there's a lot actually going on in Kuhn's objection, uh, and in the thesis itself about parts existing potentially. And I'm only gonna be able to unpack the main points here. So first, yes, there are indeed potential parts of a substance in the sense that, for example, a lump of cardiac flesh on ice can be a potential part of Fred. This is the sense Scaltzus intends when, again, unfortunately, he uses the example of an artifact. Um, and, you know, that kind of an example discussed in this context, again, is bound to confuse. Um, Coons, I submit, seems to have taken on via Marmadoro some of the confusion generated by Skeltzus in as much as he mixes together um, the creation annihilation issue, which is a diachronic one, what happens over time, with what I'm calling the synchronic status of the parts issue, the synchronic status of the parts. So I've already talked about creation and annihilation, the diachronic problem. Parts taken on or lost by a substance are not created or annihilated. And actually, here I think that Marmadoro is more measured in her exposition because she says that, quote, being unified into a whole re-identifies the parts in a way that they cannot be when apart from the whole. And re-identification is consistent with non-creation and non-annihilation as long as we understand it in terms of the persistence of a, sub uh, of a material substrate that takes on a new form, constituting a numerically distinct entity from the one that belonged to the substance pre-separation or that was separate from the substance before introduction into it. So that's the creation annihilation. We can put that to one side now. Um, but the other part is the synchronic status of the parts question. Now, um, <clears throat> this is the question concerning how we should think of the parts of a substance when, tautologically, they are joined to the substance and functioning according to their essence. So what is their status when they are part of the substance? I think Coons is quite right that there are nihilistic implications in taking the parts of a substance literally not to exist. 
To think that we are systematically wrong in our belief that people have hearts, dogs have tails, molecules contain atoms, lumps of gold have chunks, and puddles of water contain H2O molecules is beyond consideration in my view. The question is then one of admitting the truth of such beliefs while respecting RME. And to do this, we have to hold that there are literal parts of substances, but the way in which these parts exist is through their existential dependence on the whole, whose form gives and the essence by which they operate to subserve that whole. And this is consistent with the idea that when um, some matter is joined to a substance and becomes a part of that substance, it brings with it qualities that are not defined by relation to the substance the matter joins. So for example, when hydrogen and oxygen are combined to form water in a fuel cell, the hydrogen is largely responsible for the surface tension of the water. When a lump of cardiac flesh is transplanted into a human body, the, the qualities of that particular tissue enable the survival of the patient. Not any old human tissue will do. So it would be crazy to deny that pre-existing qualities do enter into and remain qualities of parts of substances as it would be to deny the existence of the parts themselves. That said, however, the term potential part or part existing potentially is an unfortunate one and best avoided altogether. Um, a potential part as understood by classical Aristotelians is in fact an actual part that exercises its powers or potentialities wholly in subservience to the substance to which it belongs. So it's potential in the sense of it's exercising potentialities, but it's, a, it's an actual part not a potential part in the actuality, potentiality sense of Aristotelian metaphysics. So it's hard to find an alternative term. Uh, you know, I've, I've trawled around the literature and historical kind of discussions of this. Um, so I'm going to use a term which sometimes gets used. I'm going to use the term virtual part, which I know is not exactly a massive improvement, maybe no improvement at all, but I'm going to use virtual part because uh, I'll, I'll put on the gloss that a virtual part of a substance is a real part, so it's not virtual as opposed to real, it's a real part exercising its function by its virtues, which is the slightly archaic term for powers, and that these are essential powers bestowed by the substance. So it's in virtue of its, uh, sorry, it's exercising its role in the substance by its virtues, by its powers. Although I am a bit playing on the virtual real contrast, because if by real we mean something like having independent existence, as sometimes crops up when we're talking about this in the literature, then virtual parts are not real in that sense. And I think there is a little bit of that in, in Marmadora's discussion. Um, yes, the virtual parts are not real in the sense of having independent existence. They're existentially dependent on the holes to which they belong. And one marker of this is the phenomenon of loss of qualities when a material object joins to a substance or combines with other objects to generate a substance. Um, so the boiling point of hydrogen is minus 252.9 degrees Celsius, but you won't be able to boil any hydrogen in a puddle of water at that temperature. Oxygen boils at minus 183 degrees Celsius, but you can't boil it at that temperature when the atoms are part of water. A plant grafted onto another plant will lose its roots before grasping, uh, before grafting, there, therefore disabling it from taking in any water through roots other than those provided by the recipient. And there is, of course, correlative gain of qualities on separation. A detached limb of an animal gains the power of decomposition, which it does not have as a functioning limb, right? A, a limb of an animal cannot decompose when it's part of a functioning limb, i.e. a limb uh, functioning as part of a live animal. So, but, so the um, synchronic status of the parts question, however, does raise, so, so I've tried to kind of disambiguate different meanings of potential part and, and part existing potentially, but you know, uh, it would be uh, churlish to deny that there are very delicate issues here that Aristotelians have to deal with. Um, the synchronic status question raises a very sensitive issue concerning the relation of the form of the whole to the form of the part. Since a part of a substance is not itself a substance, it has no substantial form of its own. And yet, 
As we have seen, the part derives its essence wholly from its role as subservient to the substance to which it belongs. So how, one might naturally ask, how can it not have the substantial form of the whole? Particularly in light of the Aristotelian uh, scholastic doctrine of the unicity of substantial form, that is that no substance has, every substance has one and only one substantial form. So there are no, on this doctrine, there are no competing or complementary substantial forms in a substance. For example, you don't have, in the case of a dog, the canine form and the mammalian form and the animal form. There is but a single form from which the genera to which the dog belongs, such as uh, animal, mammal, and so on, are no more than abstractions. Hence, Fido the dog, <coughs> pardon me, Fido the dog is as much a possessor of the canine substantial form in one of his paws as he is in his whole being. I am, and I've, the way I've, this is the way I've kind of put it in other places, I'm as much a human in my little toe as I am in my whole human being. But then the question is, what could be the relationship between, say, the human substantial form and the parts of a human? Right? We cannot say that my heart is a human being, right? Now, if, if, if any theory that leads to the consequence that my heart or my toe are human beings is um, clearly wrong. All we can say is that my heart is a heart, not that my heart is a human being, it's a human heart. So what we have to say, I think, is something like the following. Um, the human heart only has accidental forms, albeit necessary accidental forms, true, the true properties or propria, bestowed by the substantial form of the human. So those necessary accidents, for example, being a certain kind of tissue, uh, being capable of electrical conduction and of pumping, having four chambers and so on, owe their entire being and organization among themselves to the substantial form of the human being. Just as the heart is existentially dependent on the human, so the properties of the heart are existentially dependent on the substantial form of the human. What we should say then is that the parts of a substance share in the substantial form of the substance by participation only. So I'm going to borrow from Plato here. It's not a term that you see a lot in Aristotle, but it is a term that you do find in scholastic metaphysics. The parts of a substance share in the substantial form by participation. Next, um, Anna Mamadoro says that the parts of a substance have no distinctness in the substance. They exist in it holistically. Well, I think the issue here is more one about how we should speak rather than of actual content. I mean, the parts of a substance do have a distinct existence, just not an independent existence. They exist holistically only in as much as their essence is delivered by the substance itself, but not in any sense implying that substances have no parts or that they are, or that they have parts without a clear and distinct identity leaving aside vagueness questions. So I've still got a bit of time, so I'm going to move on to the fifth objection, which is the claim that the essence of the part is given by the essence of the substance. Uh, and that that's an obscure or at least implausible thesis. You know, what does it mean to say that the, the essence of the part is given by the essence of the substance? Well, my short reply to that short objection is that it amounts to no more than denying the Aristotelian scholastic theory of substance. We can, of course, say more, however. So the idea of essence being given or bestowed, which is a term that we sometimes see, or conferred, we see that term, I think that's in Skeltsis. Um, the idea of essence being given or bestowed or conferred by the substance is the idea of formal causation. Right, this is formal causation. There's a very good uh, collection of uh, essays that has just come out, uh, near Aristotelian perspectives on formal causation reviving this much uh, maligned or discarded notion. The human heart is what it is in virtue of being part of a human, not the other way around. And here the explanation is metaphysical. It's by no means historical because the question of where humans and or their hearts came from over time is a different question entirely. And it's not a matter of epistemic priority either because it's plausible, or at least it's arguable, but perhaps plausible, to say that we understand what humans are by first understanding their parts and how they interact. 
Metaphysically, however, the parts depend on the whole for their very existence and identity. The substantial form on this account unifies matter into the human being, not prior human parts, because there are no human parts, their own essences, ready to be unified. For what would their essences be, or what would their real definitions be, that made no necessary reference to the human being itself? By contrast, the real definition of a human being, namely as a rational animal, makes no necessary reference to human parts. In fact, this is too quick, and I think instructively too quick, because if we take, for example, body plan to be part of the human essence, then we do, if only for illustration, take the definition of a dolphin. Without getting, to the speci getting into the specifics of defining the cetaceans, it's plausible to include flippers as part of a definition. But it's not necessary to make reference to flippers qua dolphin flippers, right? So it would be crazy if you said that the essence of dolphins is to have dolphin flippers. That, that's nuts. It is, however, of the essence of dolphin flippers to belong to dolphins, and that's not nuts. That's right. And I think this is enough, as far as the present discussion goes, to give plausible content to the idea that the essence of the parts of a substance is given by the essence of a substance and not the other way around. And I think what I'm going to do, given the time available, is to one, I think I can just about squeeze in one more objection, albeit it's quite a long one. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one objection, one last objection, and I'm sure Sonia will um, tell me if I'm if I'm taking too long, but I've got my eye on the clock here and I aim to finish in four minutes. So Kuhns and Kozlicki both distinguish between RME as true of particular killers and is true of kinds and um, I think they both find RME as formulated simply about kinds as more plausible than RME about particulars so Kuhn's formulation for RME about uh, particulars is that if x is a proper part of substance y then necessarily if x exists then y exists and x is a proper part of y but RME when you apply it to kinds only is to say that if x is a proper part of a substance of kind k then necessarily if x exists x is a proper part of some substance of kind K. So the former entails the latter, but not vice versa. So why should we believe one but not the other? Well, here is where Kuhns and Kuzliki both appeal to organ transplants. So RME for kinds, as Kuhns puts it, would be compatible with the possibility of organ transplants. The heart will continue to exist in a new host, even though separated from its original donor. And Kuzliki agrees in similar words. So in three minutes, I'll go, go through as much as I can to tell you what I think is the reply to that objection, the transplant objection. The problem with the position is that once the heart leaves the human to which it belongs, it ceases to exist altogether. Sorry, just bear with me. I need to, I've just received a test and trace call from the NHS because everyone in my family is uh, coming down with COVID. So let me just go back. There we go. Yeah, we're all dropping with COVID one after the other. I'm probably next in the queue. So let me just get to the end. So um, yeah, um, once the heart leaves the human to which it belongs, it ceases to exist altogether. All that remains is a lump of cardiac flesh. Because if RME does not entail that, it doesn't entail anything. So it mu RME must respect that era Aristotelian insight. RME is applied to kinds, as Kuhns would have it, means that if Fred's heart is transplanted into Frieda, it undergoes intermittent existence, ceasing to exist when separated from Fred and coming back into existence when joined to Frieda. But what independent reason would there be for countenancing intermittent existence? Kuhns and Kozlicki both frame the intuition that a heart could continue to exist in a new host, and my heart survives. Well, I'm not sure there is such an intuition. And so I think their framing merely begs the question against RME for particulars. So when we say, for example, how selfless of Fred to be an organ donor, Frieda now has his heart, this statement is perfectly compatible with both formulations of RME, in fact. To say that Frieda now has Fred's heart or Fred's heart survives in Frieda can happily be given a reading that does not take the speaker to be committed to Fred's hearts popping out of and back into existence. It could even be uttered without a commitment to RME at all, so we should avoid these kinds of appeals to various locutions. Um, so, and just I'm going to finish off on this a minute. Um, so the reason one might favour RME for kinds over RME for particulars is the thought that Fred's heart literally still exists between separation and transplant. Um, 
in which case we should think that what goes into Frida just is Fred's heart. Otherwise, what could even ground the thought that it's Fred's heart rather than merely a heart? Um, but Frida's receiving a heart does not imply that a heart existed to be received, only that what ends up in her body is a heart. But if Fred's heart is right there on the table just before the transplant, the obvious thought is that what Frida receives is the pre-existing heart of Fred. And if that's the line of thinking in the objection, it's hard to see what's left of RME. Um, and what Kuhn, and I'll finish on this point, Kuhn says that, well, what remains part of the body of the host, even when physically separated from it, up until it has been, uh, sorry, what remains, uh, so he asked, what should we say about the heart when it's in transit between the donor and the recipient, right, the heart on ice? And his answer is, I would suggest that it remains part of the body of the host, even when physically separated from it, until it has been successfully integrated into the functioning of the recipient's body. Up to that point, it seems reasonable to suppose that it's still supposed to be, con it's supposed to be contributing to the functioning of the donor's body. And this just seems on its face bizarre. It's the kind of magic that I um, rejected earlier to suggest that something which is not conjoined in any way to a substance or integrated into it or not doing anything to it or for it is nevertheless a part of the substance. To say that it's supposed to be contributing to the functioning of the donor looks like a claim that the heart is some kind of artifact and the heart is not um, an artifact. Um, so I'll finish on this couple of sentences. Um, if the heart on ice is supposed to contribute, according to Kuhn, supposed to contribute to Fred's functioning, then actually RME for particulars is, is vindicated after all, as it will be part of the essence of the heart to subserve the function of a particular individual. Uh, but if Kuhn's doesn't mean that, then it's just not clear what he means. So it seems to me, and maybe this has been a bit rushed at the end, but it seems to me that if you're going to, you know, RME needs to apply to particulars, not merely kind. So I'm going to finish one minute late on, on that point. So thanks very much and sorry for the rush at the end. Let me first say a word uh, about what my talk is about. Uh, I will mainly, oh, so, so maybe one word to Howard, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm afraid that I will not manage to stay in time. So uh, please interrupt me, okay? <laughs> uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Oh, well, okay. Um, basically, I will raise a specific challenge uh, to the two main contemporary versions of Aristotelian helomorphism, principle-based helomorphism and power-based uh, helomorphism. Uh, the challenge rests on uh, one important assumption, which is not uh, altogether trivial, but uh, widely accepted, I think, at least among Hilmorphists. The assumption is that objects have, as a matter of metaphysical fact, uh, certain persistence conditions. So they do not have them because of the way we conceptualize them or something like that. Uh, they really have them as a part of their metaphysical nature. So if that is true, any account of uh, objects and I will be interested in uh, physical composite objects. Any account of such object will have to say something about uh, the following questions. What does it mean for an object to have certain persistence conditions? And how do the objects gain these persistence conditions? So what if anything is a metaphysical explanation of an object having specific persistence conditions? I will argue somewhat surprisingly, maybe, that uh, both versions of uh, hylomorphism, at least in their contemporary standard forms, are unable to give satisfactory answers to these questions. Uh, and then will suggest, uh, if I will have the time, uh, my own modification of principle based uh, hylomorphism, which I hope is better suited to meet the challenge. Okay. Here's how. The talk will proceed. In the first section, I will present uh, principle and power based holomorphism in their today's standard versions. Then I will formulate uh, the challenge I want to rise against both. Then I will, in three and four, discuss um, under the name specialization and intentionalization. The name 
the sense of these names will become apparent then. Uh, what seems to me the most promising attempts to uh, meet this challenge for both versions of philomorphism. And then finally, in the fifth section, I will uh, make my own suggestion, which is basically a neurological version of uh, principle based philomorphism. So, well, something like the standard. Definition of philomorphism is that composite physical object, the objects we're interested in, are in some sense compounds of matter and form. Uh, one important question is, of course, what is form? Uh, we have to put this to the side for the moment because that is precisely a question with respect to which uh, both versions of philomorphism disagree. Uh, what we can say so far is that uh, the matter is something like the stuff or material of the object it is made of. Uh, it's not very precise, of course, but uh, it's enough for our purposes. And we can say that for an object to have a specific form is for this form, uh, is for this object's matter to somehow take on this form or to be informed by this form. Uh, am I the only one who cannot uh, see the, uh, the end of the lines uh, of the slices? No, but however, we, we cannot change it. Uh, so, uh, one question that is important for my proposals um, and that seems to be common coin among Hülemorphists is what I call formal essentialism. The form of an object determines at least the object's general essence. That is, an object is a uh, uh, form is what makes the object. It is an object. Yeah, okay, that, that's. Uh, Uncomfortable because I uh, I can no longer read the the the, 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 the sentences on my paper. Uh, I, okay, that so is an object's form is what makes the object the sort of object it is. So uh, the qualification at least here is uh, just uh, to 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 uh, make clear that the form could, of course, determine, uh, determine more than the general essence, namely the individual essence. But uh, all we need uh, for our purposes is this weaker claim that it determines the general essence. So from this, together with what we have just said about uh, objects having a form, we can conclude that each object having a specific form exists if it exists partly in virtue of the being informed of some matter by this very form. Um, I think the claim is not controversial. Uh, uh, first lights uh, on its own, but let me briefly explain how the exists come in. Um, I think the best way to speak of essences is in terms of existence conditions, in the following sense that for an object to have a specific essence means for it to exist if it exists in virtue of the fulfillment of specific conditions. So that is why I uh, yeah, feel uh, entitled to, uh, uh, to reformulate uh, claims about essences uh, in terms of existence and existence conditions. And that is what happens here. So one moment, please. Okay, let's come to the crucial question. What are forms? The principle based philomorphists say they are principles of unity. The following quote from Mark Johnson, which I cannot fully read, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, expresses the idea pretty well. The principle of unity for a, guy, a given item is a relational condition, I guess, holding of some other uh, items such that origins aside for a given item to exist. Uh, Johnson here also use uh, the, 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 the existence formulation is for the condition to be fulfilled by those items. So to get an even better grip on the idea, let's consider the following two closely related questions. What is it for some matter to be informed by a principle of unity? 
what is the general essence of an object that has a specific principle of unity as its form? Well, the answer to both question uh, is quite straightforward. Uh, the principle of unity, as uh, Johnson makes clear, sets some structural relational conditions. And of course, some matter is informed by such a principle of unity uh, by its fulfilling these structural conditions or by the, its constituents fulfilling these structural conditions. That's the basic idea. So what is the general essence? So what are the conditions in virtue of which uh, the object comes into existence? Well, even that is pretty obvious. For an object to have a specific thought, means for it to exist partly in virtue of there being some matter uh, that fulfills the corresponding principle of unity, which is to say principles of unity can basically be understood as principles of composition. Okay. With that in mind, let's come to uh, the second version of philomorphism, principle-based philomorphism according to which the form of an object is a kind of power, uh, which I would call formal power. Again, I have a quotation which uh, uh, makes, which makes clear, at least in rough outline, what the idea is. Forms must be powers, powers to uh, configure, if I <laughs> uh, um, remember rightly, organize order to arrange materials. Each structured individual organizes or configures the materials uh, that compose it. So the idea seems to be that formal power, uh, that powers are formal powers, that formal powers are powers that uh, uh, that imposes some kind of structure or unity uh, on the matter of the object. Again, let's uh, try to get more familiar with this uh, idea by considering our two questions. What is, it, what is it for some matter to be informed by a formal power in contrast to a principle of unity, say, and what is the general essence of an object that has a specific power uh, as its form? Well, this time, the answers are less obvious. The reason is that powers uh, have a kind of double nature, so to speak. They have, in a sense, two poles. For one thing, the power, the instantiation of the power, the object having of the power, and on the other hand, the power's manifestation. And we can spell out, or so it seems, the idea of information of matter by, by a formal power with reference to the powers pole and with reference to the manifestation pole. Therefore, I introduce in the terms of art, uh, p-wise information and m-wise information. So matter is p-wisely informed, p for power, of course, informed by an object's formal power. If its information is a matter of the object's having the relevant power. So we have a fairly good idea of uh, what it means for an object to have a specific formal power. Um, it means to somehow emerge, uh, it, 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 it means that uh, this power somehow emerges or is realized by the powers of the object's constituents the constituents of the matter. Uh, Michael Rea uh, seems to have this, uh, this the sense of information in mind uh, in, his, um, in his 2011 papers, uh, where he speaks of a power uniting the powers of uh, the, the object's constituents. It pulls them together, so to speak, uh, uh, and, and makes make them all into one power, the formal power. However, uh, the details do not matter. Uh, we just need the broad picture. So what we end up with is that for some matter to be p-wisely informed by an object's formal power, 
this forces power to emerge from is realized by uh, the powers of this matter's constituents. So there's, however, also another way one might think about uh, the information of matter by a formal power, namely as m-wise information. An object's matter is m-wisely informed by an object's formal power if its information is a matter of the manifestation of this formal power. Uh, what the manifestation of a formal power comes up to uh, uh, has been expressed, uh, at least in one version, by uh, William Jaworski in uh, the quotation I just gave. Uh, formal powers seems to manifest themselves in imposing some kind of unity of the objects uh, to, towards the object's matter. Uh, the unity might be more or less strong. Jaworski has the idea that uh, uh, it's, uh, it consists basically in uh, the realization of a kind of tight structure, so to speak. Uh, Anna Mamodoro says something stronger. She says that the unity consists uh, uh, in the, 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 the being stripped off uh, of their identity, uh, identity um, the, 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 the constituents being stripped off of their identity. They, uh, they cease to exist as individuals. And uh, yeah. uh, But however, again, the details does not matter for our purposes. We can speak of some kind of unity, whatever uh, that comes up to. So a formal power, uh, for a formal power to be m-wisely inform some matter is for this power to impose some kind of unity on the constituents of this matter. So this ambiguity is not itself a problem as far as it goes. At least both senses are not incompatible with each other. They should better not be. Uh, the ambiguity has, however, a consequence for the answer to our second question. What is the general essence of an object that has a specific formal power as its form? So we found that something like the following is true. Uh, for an object to be of a specific sort means for it to exist partly in virtue of there being some matter that is informed by a corresponding formal power. However, now, we are faced with two readings of this idea of information uh, of some matter by a formal power. And so we get an ambiguity in this claim as well, that we, a P and an M reading for an object to be of a specific sort means for it to exist partly in virtue of the being some matter that is P wisely informed by a corresponding formal power. And the M reading for an object to be of a specific sort means for it to exist partly in virtue of the being some matter that is M wisely informed by a corresponding formal power. And now, of course, we are faced with the question, which reading is true? So what is the essence of an object? The having of the formal power or the manifestation of the formal power? But I think we should say that only the former is true. Only the P reading is true. To have a specific formal power is part of an object's essence. Uh, the P reading is true. Uh, the object's having a specific formal power is what makes it the object it is. The M reading, on the other hand, is not true for the manifestation of the formal power. is not part of what makes the object the object it is. Uh, I think that is most obvious if we assume that even a formal power can stay unmanifested. So in that case, uh, we would not like to say that uh, the object with a, uh, with a relevant formal power does not even exist uh, if the power does, uh, fails to be manifested. However, even if we assume that there is, as Jaworski, for example, does, that there's a necessary connection between formal, a formal power and its manifestation. Uh, 
that still not implies that the manifestation also is part of the object's essence. Essence talk is more fine-grained than necessity talk. Um, so, yeah, but let's leave it at that and accept that only the p-reading is true. That is not to say, however, that the m-reading is altogether irrelevant. Manifestation of the formal power, for there is a claim in the vicinity that might very well be true. Maybe the following. It is part of an object's essence that if it persists, that is, if it persists at any time later than the moment of its origin, it does so in virtue of the fact that there is a matter that is m wisely informed by the object's formal power. So the idea here is what is essential for the object is a having of the power. But also that if the object persists, that if the object continues to exist, it has to do so uh, by virtue of the manifestation of its formal power. Uh, that, I guess, is a reasonable assumption for the power based, uh, uh, to, to endorse for the power based film of his, and it provides the basis for uh, the answer to my challenge that I will suggest to the power base to the Memphis. Okay. Having said this, let's come to the, to the challenge. Uh, the challenge arises pretty straightforwardly from the claim of from the, the assumption of formal essentialism together uh, with what I call essentialism about temporal identity conditions. Part of what it is for an object to be of a particular sort is for it to have specific temporal identity conditions. Formal essentialism again, the form of an object determines the object's general essence. That is, an object's form is what makes the object the sort of object it is. From this, we can conclude that the form somehow has to determine the object's persistence conditions. The format of an object the form of an object determines the object's temporal identity condition. That is, an object's form is what makes the object have the temporal identity conditions it has. Well, and the challenge is, of course, the challenge to the Hülmerfis is, of course, to explain how their respective notions of form are capable of providing the required explanation. Uh, how can an object's principle of unity gives the object its persistence conditions, and how might an object's formal power give the object its persistence condition? Uh, yeah, let's, let me pause, however, to uh, uh, say, say um, uh, to, to, uh, to make two uh, elucidatory remarks. Um, first of all, my use of the notion of the term temporal identity conditions is meant as a, a neutral use uh, that is not meant to imply that temporal identity conditions uh, have to be literally conditions of the obtaining of identity. Uh, it is meant to be compatible with yeah, all interpretations of these kind of conditions that are on the market. Uh, conditions of unity, of temporal unity, conditions of kind membership, uh, conditions of persistence, what I would suggest, and so on and so forth. Um, so no commitment uh, connected with this term. So, and that is why I use it here in this, uh, in this context. Um, well, and secondly, I think it is important to point out uh, how strong or how substantial this assumption of essentialism about temporal identity conditions is. Uh, I think, uh, phrases like this are very common. You find them in many, many books. However, I'm not sure whether uh, whether everyone is always aware of what one says with it. Uh, uh, um, 
I've already pointed out that uh, as I understand this claim, um, or as I understand holomorphism and essentialism in general, that is incompatible with any anti-realist view of temporal identity conditions. So objects having temporal identity conditions cannot be a matter of the conceptualization or something like that of this object. Another important point is that it seems at least that uh, in objects having specific temporal identity conditions or having specific persistence conditions, as I usually prefer to say, uh, seems that it can that cannot that, that has to mean more than just that the object fulfills these conditions. Well, you all know the Quine Lewis view uh, about uh, which uh, uh, Harold Noonan expresses as the view that temporal identity conditions are conditions of kind membership. The, the idea is just that objects are neurological sum of temporal stages and temporal identity conditions uh, uh, are just certain temporal structural properties that some of these uh, meteorological sums meet and some do not. So, and if the meteorological sum that I am uh, accidentally meet uh, uh, the conditions of kind membership for persons. So it is a person, it has a property uh, of a person, but that is not part of its essence. So the important point is uh, that according to this picture, the only way in which the object itself is attached to the, uh, attached to the, the temporal identity conditions is by fulfilling it. And it is not at all clear uh, whether that is a sense that we need for to fulfill certain conditions does not seem in any sense to have these conditions. If, if anything has conditions of kind membership in this sense, it seems to be well, the concept of a person or whatever, but not the person itself. So, and my intuition is that what we say here, and that it is true what we say here, that there's a stronger sense in which objects have temporal identity conditions. They do not just fulfill them, but the conditions belong to, the, to it. So, and that is the idea that gives rise to this chapter. Okay. Uh, okay. okay, that is obvious. Uh, uh, the challenge um, uh, comes in different guises corresponding to the versions of uh, holomorphism we are considering. Uh, uh, on the one hand, the challenge to explain how principles of unity can equip an object with uh, its persistence conditions. And on the other hand, the challenge how formal powers can do so. So before I take a look uh, on um, what uh, both uh, what, what proponents of both versions of philomorphism can say in response, let me briefly point out what is not an answer to the challenge, namely any explanation of persistence. So the challenge is about is not about what makes an object persist, but it is about how an object gets its persistence conditions. And it is plausible to assume, or so I do at least, uh, that an object has its persistence conditions prior to its persisting. After all, its persisting uh, is the fulfillment of the persistence conditions where something parallel of, so I would assume, uh, when it comes to existence conditions. There's a sense in which objects have certain existence conditions, the conditions in virtue of which they exist, if they exist. Uh, but it seems 
that objects have these existence conditions prior to the fulfillment of these conditions. It is even metaphysically prior to my coming in existence. It was true that if I come to existence, I do so in virtue of such and such, uh, of the fulfillment of such and such condition. So I had uh, these ex my existence conditions prior to my existence. And basically the same, I assume, is true of persistence conditions. Of objects have their persistence conditions prior to their persisting. And therefore, no explanation of an object's persistence can, at least not without further ado, provide an explanation of an object's having persistence condition. Well, so let's come to the two uh, answers that uh, the two versions of principle-based holomorphism might provide. Uh, the, uh, I call the, 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 the principle-based answer spatialization. Um, well, Indeed, I, I think we are already familiar with this uh, idea from the talk of Thomas Satte, uh, but uh, I wasn't able to incorporate this in my, in my talk. Um, the, the basic idea is, or, or there, there's a very natural way in which uh, principle-based holomorphists uh, might incorporate uh, temporal identity conditions in their view. After all, they already deal with the kind of conditions that objects have, that apply to objects, uh, no, no, that objects have prior to the fulfillment of these conditions, namely the conditions of composition or the conditions of unity. So why not assume there's a sense um, that uh, it is true of an object according to a principle-based homomorphism prior to its uh, actual composition that uh, it is composed if it composed by virtue of the fulfillment of the fulfillment of the, uh, the condition set by a specific principle of unity. So why not say the same thing about temporal identity conditions? After all, it is a very common interpretation of temporal identity conditions that they are conditions of temporal unity or of temporal composition. And this idea can be smoothly incorporated into this, uh, the idea of principle, into the picture of principle uh, based holomorphism. It is surprisingly hard to find an explicit statement. Uh, of this view, maybe I should read papers from Thomas Satte about this. Uh, but here's a quote, quotation from Mark Johnson. Uh, 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 yeah, Seem to indicate that he has something like that in mind. In a full account of these matters, and certainly in any treatment of the identity over time of those items that exist in time, it would be helpful to distinguish two aspects of a principle of unity the synchronic and the diachronic. I will elide this distinction uh, yeah, for my proposal, whatever, uh, and treat principle of unity of items existing in time as incorporating both aspects. So what he seems to have in mind is that we have a principle of unity that sets both spatial and temporal conditions of composition. Is both part of the content of the principle of unity. And that, at first glance, uh, seemed to meet our challenge very well. So it's quite a nice explanation of how objects get their temporal identity conditions, at least as good as the explanation of how they get their temporal, uh, their spatial, um, uh, their, their, um, their, their conditions of spatial composition. Well, however, I'm not happy with this answer. Um, okay, no, uh, okay, first of all, uh, uh, that is an instance of what I call spatialization. Uh, 
spatialization, not of time itself or something like that, but of an object having specific temporal identity function. The idea is that uh, an object, that objects have their temporal identity conditions in the very same sense in which they have uh, something like uh, they are conditions of spatial composition. That's why I talk, call about um, a spatialization in this context. So for the object to have these conditions is for it to come to existence, to become composed in virtue of the fulfillment of these conditions. So, uh, uh, what we end up with is the idea that objects come to existence as temporally structured and therefore as temporally extended holes. The temporal structure has to be realized to bring these objects into existence in the first place. So, and just that is a part of the view uh, I'm not happy with because I think it is a is a misguided thinking about an object's persistence. I assume it's precisely the right way to think about the persistence of an event. Think about uh, a dinner party or something like that. For a dinner party to come to existence, uh, some kind of temporal structure needs to be realized. There's first the greeting, then the first course, the main course, or whatever. Uh, uh, the details doesn't matter, but some kind of temporal structure has to be realized. But I think the same is not true of objects. Objects uh, do not come to existence as temporally extended and temporally structured holes. They come to existence as instantaneous objects. So the question that a specific objects, be it me, my computer uh, or the table it is standing on, uh, that, a specific, that, that one particular object comes into existence, is settled, so to speak, wakeness aside, uh, at the first moment of its existence. Nothing that might happen afterwards has any bearing on this question in contrast to events, whether a specific dinner party exists depends on what goes on after the moment of the dinner party's um, uh, beginning. There has to be the main course and whatever. So there would not even be a dinner party if uh, uh, an explosion would take place immediately after the, the starting of the party and so on. Uh, and that's different with respect to, uh, uh, to objects or so I assume. Objects come into existence at specific moments. With, it, with that, the, the fact of their existence is settled. And then they do or do not stay in existence. But even if they fail to stay in existence, even if they fail to persist, that does not not affect um, uh, uh, the, 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 the fact of their existence. Therefore, objects' persistence conditions cannot be part of the object's conditions uh, of existence. Therefore, they cannot be part, uh, they, they cannot be um, conditions of temporal composition. What kind of conditions are they? Yeah, I would like to say the following. Oh, the, 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 what, what is it for? What then is it for an object to have persistence conditions? Of course, persistence conditions are what else? Conditions in virtue of whose, whose fulfillment an object persists. In, in virtue of whose fulfillment an object stays into existence that already exists. There is a picture. Um, so, what then could it mean for an object to have persistence conditions? It certainly can no longer mean. Uh, that the object comes to existence in virtue of the fulfillment of these conditions. Rather, we should think about it as something like follows. For an object to have specific persistence conditions means for it to be such that these conditions are in force 
that the object is such that it imposes the conditions of its own persistence upon the world. With the coming into existence of the object, its persistence conditions are somehow set into force. And if these persistence conditions are fulfilled, the object persists. Otherwise, it does not persist, but still exists, of course, as an instantaneous object. Here are two uh, crude pictures um, that are meant to represent the two. Uh, Two ideas to, to, to contrast the two ideas with specialization with uh, conditions of spatial and temporal compositions. Uh, so coming down from platonic heaven, so to speak, and uh, whole aggregates of temporal stages has to answer to these compositions. And that is how an object comes into existence as a temporary structured whole. Uh, on the other hand, the persistence approach assumes that. We have only spatial con con conditions of compositions. The object comes into, ex into existence as an instantaneous object. But by its coming into existence, somehow its persistence conditions are set into force. Um, and if the object persists, it does so by continuously meeting um, these persistence conditions. Let us assume, at least for the sake of argument, that this picture is true and basic outline. Um, so, yeah, we have, first of all, to reject the, 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 what I call spatialization, the, um, um, the, uh, the principle based hylomorphist answer to our challenge. But we also have, so to speak, uh, a way to, to make this challenge more concrete. The challenge now for the power-based homomorphist is to answer to this approach of persistence conditions. To explain how the formal power of an object can bring it about, so to speak, uh, that the object imposes its own conditions of persistence upon the future world. Uh, as far as I know, uh, or I know of no uh, power-based philomorphist who has ever considered uh, this problem explicitly. Therefore, the following is just my creative suggestion. Um, it rests on two assumptions. Those are contentious, but uh, each one has been defended by some power-based philomorphists or power theorists. The first is, uh, yeah, uh, basically the one we are all very familiar with for any time. T, if an object persists at T, uh, it does so in virtue of the manifestation of its formal power. The idea that objects persist by the continuous manifestation, the continuous unification of incoming matter by the object's formal power. The second more controversial assumption, for example, defended by George Molnar, um, is that the directedness of powers to their manifestation, powers that seems to be are somehow directed to their manifestation, that this directedness is of just the same kind as the directedness of intentional states towards its objects. Molnar speaks even of physical intentionality. With these both assumption in place, we can construct an answer to our challenge, to our question uh, that seems promising at first glance, but what, that in the final an analysis doesn't work, uh, or so I assume. Yeah, let's start with a. Um, with the with 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 second assumption that the directedness of powers is just like the directedness of intentional states towards their objects. Well, what does this directedness of intentional states consist in? According to a common way of thinking this, that issue, um, it consists in the imposing of current, uh, certain conditions, namely conditions of satisfaction, as Searle calls them, upon the world such that 
these conditions are fulfilled if and only the object exists uh, uh, the object exists and is how the state represents it to be the directedness of intentionality is somehow a matter of the imposing of uh, uh, conditions of satisfaction upon the work it follows that the same would have to be true about uh, uh, about powers uh, the directedness, the directedness of powers is uh, parallel to the directnesses of intentional state. And if the latter is a matter of uh, the imposing of uh, conditions of satisfaction, the same has to be true of the former. The directedness of a power towards its manifestation has to be somehow a matter of the powers uh, imposing conditions of satisfaction such that, such that uh, these are met if the power is manifested and not bad otherwise. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, see, I'm running out of time. Uh, so let me hurry up a little bit. Oh, oh. Yeah, okay. Uh, So let me try to be very brief. Uh, then this, uh, the first assumption comes in, the first uh, the assumption about um, how objects persist. Um, if the persistence of an object is a, mani uh, is a matter of the manifestation of this object, the unification of some incoming matter. Um, and if this directedness towards this manifestation, towards the unification uh, of the incoming matter, uh, has to do with the imposing of certain conditions of satisfaction by the formal power. It seems natural to suppose that these conditions of satisfaction just are the object's persistence conditions. After all, the manifestation, what uh, uh, the power is directed to well, seems to play a role at least in the fulfillment of books. It seems to play, play the role in the fulfillment, fulfillment of persistence conditions, uh, so makes the object persist. And it also seems to be, according to this view at least, uh, what fulfills the power's conditions of satisfaction. So that is the picture where. We end up with, uh, it's pretty clear, um, uh, in this picture, the formal power can do both. It imposes uh, the conditions of persistence conditions by imposing its own conditions of satisfaction, and it brings about the fulfillment of these conditions by continuously manifesting and so makes the object persist. Uh, it would be great if it would work, but as you might think, um, might expect it's too good to be true. Also, I assume here's my argument against this idea. It's a little bit subtle, but uh, I hope uh, I can make it clear. Well, start about thinking what, uh, independent of this idea, what the persistence conditions of an object at a specific time really are. Uh, whatever the details, I seems it seems to be that two things need to be incorporated. After all, persistence conditions should encompass everything that makes the object persist. So, and what makes the object persist according to power-based polymorphism is first of all uh, that um, uh, some matter is s wise uh, unified, so that uh, uh, relevant structure is imposed on the matter, uh, but also that this s wise unification is the result or is the manifestation of the object's formal power. So just the fact that, uh, say, some matter is, uh, is car-wisely unified, as a car-wise structure, so to speak, is not enough for a car to persist. Uh, it can only be a stage in the persistence of a car, according to the power-based picture, if 
it is a manifestation of the formal power of a company. So, uh, but if you know, see, uh, look at um, um, again at the powers and what uh, they are uh, manifestations are. I think we have to say that it is only e. Uh, it is only the, the first element, but not the second. That is part of the power's manifestation. The manifestation of the power is this uh, S-wise unity of the relevant matter. But the fact, whatever it consists in, finally, that this S-wise unification is a manifestation of this formal power, is not itself a part of the power's manifestation. Therefore, according to the picture at hand, uh, it cannot be part of the conditions of satisfaction of the power. Of course, by assumption, the conditions of satisfaction uh, consist just of the manifestation. For it is just the manifestation to, to what uh, uh, a power is in some sense direct. Uh, so we you've now gone nearly five minutes over but but yeah you don't I'm, mind losing your discussion time that's up to you uh, yeah, yeah no, no i i finish i finish imme immediately after this slide okay uh, yeah. so we find here a difference between the persistence conditions and the conditions of satisfaction the persistence conditions in a sense operate on a higher level they incorporate the fact that uh, the unity imposed on the matter is a manifestation of the formal power that is part of the object's persistence conditions, but it is not part of the object's uh, conditions of satisfaction. So, and that is why both cannot be identified. We need uh, yeah, an even more abstract uh, uh, account of persistence conditions. Yeah, that is the one that I would... Uh, no suggest, but uh, maybe my own uh, proposal is not, <laughs> not the most, most important point of the talk. So I finish here. Uh, thank you very much. OK, thanks a lot. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks a lot to the organizers for uh, inviting me. All right, so this uh, presentation is linked to, uh, to uh, an entry for the Handbook uh, of Essence. Uh, it's going to be published by Catherine Kostiki and, and Michael Raven. Uh, I already presented uh, most of what's here, okay, what's, what I'm going to present a few months ago at, at a conference, at a workshop, uh, where the speakers were precisely the, the, the people, the contributors uh, to, this, uh, to this handbook. Uh, some, some of you were there, so I think Tuomas <laughs> Taco was, was there, so I apologize in advance. The presentation is not exactly the same as uh, as, as, as the one I gave uh, then, because I took some, some feedback uh, into account. So before writing really properly the, the, this, uh, this entry, I wanted to have further feedback. So I took uh, this opportunity to, uh, to try and get some. Uh, so I'm interested in, in, in non-modal conceptions of essence. Uh, as you know, uh, Kit finds essence and modality uh, marked, uh, 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 you know, what was made, made a big difference uh, uh, on, on thinking about essence uh, in the 20th century. Uh, so basically, the, 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 you know, to summarize the ideas that uh, people uh, used to, 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 to like modal conceptions of essence, and then they moved to, towards uh, non-modal conceptions of essence, uh, in great part because of, of, of Fine's uh, paper. So that's the rough uh, summary. Uh, as you know, uh, in his paper, Fine uh, criticizes the, uh, the modal conceptions uh, of essence. Uh, he suggests also that uh, the, uh, so to speak, order of an analysis uh, should be reversed. Uh, that is me metaphysical modality that is to be understood in terms of essence rather than uh, the other way uh, around. So my main task in this, uh, in this, in this entry will be to uh, to will be a threefold actually. So will be will be first to discuss uh, the objections against the modal conceptions of essence uh, by by Fine uh, and others. Then it will be to discuss uh, the non-modal conceptions uh, of essence, uh, and finally uh, to discuss the uh, the characterizations of metaphysical modality in terms uh, of essence. Okay. 
so in this presentation, and actually in the entry as well, I'm going to leave completely aside uh, anti-realist view about essence. Not that they're not uh, interesting in themselves, but other people will take care of that, uh, that uh, these issues uh, in the in the handbook. Now this task is very challenging. So I have uh, on my list 76 papers of books which are which have been published since 1994, roughly, and which are directly relevant to to my uh, to my to my topic. Uh, and the number of publications has grown exponentially. So here is a nice uh, diagram that, that shows you uh, how things evolve through time. So I'm lucky I'm writing this right now because I wouldn't like to write uh, to write that uh, in five years time or 10 years time. Uh, okay, still, still uh, there's a lot to do uh, and to take into account. Uh, now, here is a very important question which I didn't raise in, 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 the, in the first, uh, in, when I first presented the, this material. Uh, and which, which, which is prompted by, by discussions that I had during the, 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 the workshop, but also after, afterwards. Uh, the question is, what, what is a conception of essence? So when we say that, you know, we moved from modal conceptions of essence to non-modal conceptions of essence, what, what, what are we saying? What, what, what notion of conception of essence do we have in mind? I think there are two options, two relevant options there. Uh, on the first option, the conception of essence is a is an account of a particular notion of essence. Uh, which notion of essence? Well, the, the roughly Aristotelian notion of what it is to be, right? So there is this particular notion of essence and you have a moral take on that notion, okay? And then you have non moral takes uh, on that very same notion, right? So that's the way, uh, uh, that's, I, I think that's what essence in modality uh, is about. So Fine argues that the moral accounts of these very notions uh, are wrong, okay? And he puts forward his own normal account and, and other people have put forward other uh, non-modal accounts of that notion, right? Now, there is another option uh, for understanding what a conception of essence is, which is to say that, well, it's, it's, it's simply a particular notion of essence. So when we talk about a moral conception of essence, we talk about a moral concept of essence. It's not a moral view about a certain concept. It's simply a, a, a moral concept, okay? So basically it's their necessity, if you want, okay? Uh, now, and on that option, when people, to say that people moved from a moral conception of essence to non-moral concept, conceptions of essence, uh, what we're saying is that people were more interested in uh, you know, their necessity at some, up to some point, and then they became uh, more interested in, uh, say, uh, Aristotelian, uh, the Aristotelian notion of what it is to be, right? Now, this, again, I think this is not what Fine was, was onto. Uh, and this second option was brought to my attention by uh, Teresa Robertson, uh, precisely in that, in, in that workshop. Uh, and she uh, argued at length that actually people working in the 60s, 70s, 80s uh, on essence had a particular notion of essence, a modal notion of essence, rather than a particular view about Aristotelian essence in mind. And she cites Kripke, Salman, Plantinga, uh, uh, and others. Okay. So I did my little inquiry on, on these issues. I do think that Kripke had <laughs> something like the Aristotelian notion in mind, naming a necessity. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Salman had is a different case, uh, Plantinga as well, that he, these guys really had just their necessity in mind when they were talking about essence. So still there, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's an interesting uh, uh, you know, inquiry to, 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 be, to, be, uh, to be pursued there. Uh, I still have to, to, some work to do on that, but de definitely these two options, the, the two options that I've just mentioned uh, make, uh, you know, make the, uh, the interpretation of the impact of essence and modality uh, uh, quite different, so depending on which option you, uh, you, uh, you, 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 you put forward, okay? So I think this is a very important, uh, uh, this is a very, very important uh, point that was, that was raised, uh, raised in discussion by, uh, by Robertson uh, back then, okay? So I'm going to presuppose that fine is right uh, from now on. Uh, it's, it's not really essential to everything I'm going to say, but to fix ideas, I'm going to presuppose that really there was people who were interested in the Aristotelian notion and that, that they had uh, a model take or, or view about uh, that very notion. Okay. So what are the uh, the, the, the standard model conceptions uh, of essence? Uh, 
uh, as you know, find identifies uh, at least two of them, two main uh, options, uh, two main conceptions. There, there's the non-conditional uh, uh, conception according to which uh, an essential property just is a necessary property. Uh, and then there's a slightly more complicated uh, uh, conception, conditional conception according to which uh, an object is X is essentially F when necessarily it is F if it exists, right? Uh, and the modality here obviously is uh, supposed to be metaphysical uh, modality. Now the objections that find raises against these two uh, these two conceptions uh, of uh, of essence are well known. Uh, so Fine says, look, I mean, the, the, the following properties are not essential to Socrates, yet uh, he necessarily has them if he exists. So here we're focusing on the conditional uh, concept, conditional account uh, of essence. And the properties are existing, uh, being such that 2 plus 2 equals 4, for instance, being distinct from the Eiffel Tower, uh, and being uh, a member of Socrates, uh, of Singleton so Socrates. So I mentioned my, John Michael Dunn there because he uh, anticipated actually the, the, the two of the uh, of the examples that, that I listed there. Um, and I mentioned Totsa because he, he elaborated on, 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 that, on that, that sort of example. Okay, uh, so, uh, so these are objections to the conditional uh, account of essence and uh, the last three objections can be easily turned into objections against the non-conditional account as well. So all, all this is, is certainly uh, well known. Uh, there's one important point that uh, that that should be mentioned, and 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 which which people have uh, I think largely overlooked is that uh, these objections by Fine uh, assume a, a classical conception of metaphysical modality. Okay, uh, so roughly the, the the kind of conception that people usually have, and 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 the one that they have when they say, for instance, you know that that metaphysical modality obeys the uh, the S five uh, the S five. Uh, system. Uh, some people, including myself, uh, argued that if you put forward uh, non-classical conceptions of modality, then you can escape at least some of the objections that that, that Fine raised, and actually Fine agrees with that. Okay, so he was really explicit in his response to my own uh, to my own paper uh, that he really had this classical conception of metaphysical modality. So he does the, doesn't want. To, to deny that uh, it's impossible to have some, you know, modal accounts uh, of essence, but it's just that the modality then will be uh, of a very uh, peculiar sort. All right. Uh, there's another objection, further objection to the to the modal accounts uh, of essence, uh, which has been raised actually by many uh, many uh, philosophers. Uh, you have a, a list here, and this is that uh, the view that uh, being essential implies being necessary uh, is wrong, okay? Why, so, suppose that, you know, Socrates is essentially human, okay? So it's part of what it is to be uh, uh, Socrates that, 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 he's, that he's human. Why should that imply that he must be human, that he is necessarily human, okay? Uh, so again, many people have, have, have gone in that direction. Fine did not because he's, he's or at least he was happy uh, back then with the view that uh, uh, essential properties are necessary, uh, but still, this is a further objection to the, to the moral uh, accounts of uh, essence. Okay, and this will be relevant, but I'm going to come back to that, uh, to that objection uh, later on. Okay, now the replies to the uh, to 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 find objection and to and to the the, the other objections and to the objections about other people. Uh, Objections, similar objections by, by, by other people. Okay, so one, one reply uh, is, uh, and I've, we've just seen, seen that, is to invoke another kind of modality. Okay, so I did, I did invoke priorian, so-called priorian uh, necessity and possibility. Other people have uh, invoked, uh, you know, counterfactuals of some sorts uh, and so on. So that's, that's one, one line of, uh, of reply to, uh, to find uh, objections. Uh, another, uh, line that has been pursued is simply to deny that uh, some of Fine's counterexamples really are counterexamples. So I here mentioned Sam Cowling and Nathan Weidman. Uh, uh, so that's, that's, that's another, another, another 
goods. Personally, I think that the, 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 these people do not manage to get rid of all the counterexamples. Okay, some some of them, especially the singleton example, uh, is particularly hard to to deny. It's hard to deny that it, it really is a counterexample uh, to, to, to the accounts. Uh, and then there, there, there's a, a an option, a, a line uh, of reply that that has been uh, that has become quite popular recently, uh, and which simply consists in you know, keeping the, the moral condition, right? But adding a further condition on, on the property. So it has been suggested, for instance, that an, an essential property should be a sparse property uh, in rough, roughly the sense uh, David Lewis, uh, or it has also been suggested that uh, an essential property should be an intrinsic property, okay? And the thought here is that, well, by, by imposing, imposing this further condition, then uh, we can escape the, uh, the, the, the objections, right? Uh, what about the objection that, uh, you know, it's not true that always uh, every uh, essential property is necessary? Well, what people there usually do, I think, or very often do, is to simply invoke intuition. It's obvious that, you know, an essential property is, is a necessary property uh, of, the, uh, of the object. Uh, there's a more so sophisticated uh, approach here, which I've pursued with uh, Alex Kynes in, 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 in uh, basically two papers, uh, the idea is, is there is to defend an account of essence uh, that entails that essential properties are necessary. Okay, so I'm going to come back to this, to this very account. So here it's not just appealing to sheer intuition, it's really proposing a positive account of essence that has as a consequence that all essential properties are uh, necessary. Okay, let me now turn to the, to the non-moral conceptions uh, of essence. So there's first the, the, the a category I will call primitivism. Uh, so that's basically Fine's, uh, Fine's uh, view there. Uh, essence cannot be understood in other terms. So remember here, I, by essence, I mean, what is it to be, the, the notion of what, it, what, what is it to be uh, put forth by, by Aristotle, okay? So the idea is that, well, you have that, that notion and you cannot uh, understand it or analyze it in, in, uh, in different terms, okay? Uh, many other people have uh, been have taken that, 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 that very same line. Okay, so we have this notion of essence, it's primitive, uh, and we have to live with that. Uh, even fine, so fine more recently uh, defended a, a, a quite different account of, uh, of essence, actually in the paper on essence and grounding. Uh, in that paper, he defends the view that uh, grounding is a, is, is a kind of, you know, uh, uh, he describes grounding, grounding as, as, as corresponding to kind of constitutively necessary condition and essence uh, corresponds to the idea of um, a constitutively sufficient condition. So the details are um, not completely straightforward, but still even in that case, he takes, uh, in, that, in that paper, he takes uh, essence to be, uh, to, be a primitive, uh, to be a primitive notion. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that, that's the primitivist take. Now, there are other uh, non moral conceptions which are not primitivist, okay? So I, I, I cited uh, John Michael Dunn uh, earlier, it's actually in, in his paper, uh, he discusses two accounts of essence in terms of relevant implications. So you here have the, the accounts, I'm not going to elaborate on them. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, you have uh, uh, this arrow, which is not the regular, you know, material implication arrow, it's an arrow for some sort of relevant uh, implication, right? Uh, another account, which is, which, which uh, and another conception of essence, which is non-modal and which is not primitivist, has been put forward by Michael Gormans in two papers. In the second one, he uh, clarifies, elaborates on, the, on, the, on, on what he did, uh, he proposed earlier. Uh, the account is interesting. It's framed in terms of the notion of grounding so that's what's expressed or supposed to be expressed by the, the locution because there and uh the other uh, relevant notion is that of characterizing of or really characterizing an entity so x is essentially f when first being f characterizes uh you know so really characterizes x and uh, uh second uh, there's no uh, uh property g such that being f characterizes x because being g characterizes uh x okay uh, so, and this particular account by Gorman has been put forward explicitly in reaction to Fine's uh, objections. Uh, 
to the to the to the model account. Uh, and then, uh, as you probably know, uh, Ed Zalta uh, proposed a special account of uh, essential properties for abstract objects uh, using uh, invoking his notion of encoding. So X is essentially F, where F is an abstract uh, object. Uh, if and only if uh, X encodes uh, being F, where encoding is a special way of, uh, of uh, uh, instantiating. Okay. Uh, then there is an account uh, I've mentioned earlier. So actually, it's not, uh, it's not, this account has not been first proposed by Alex and I. It was, uh, it all, already appears in, in Agustin Rayo's book, uh, The Construction of Logical Space. Uh, and it's an account that's formulated in terms of uh, what we call uh, generalized identity. Okay. Uh, so generalized identity is just like standard identity, except that, uh, you know, statements of generalized identity can take not only, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, names of, of for objects as, uh, as, as relata, but, or, or, you know, expressions of any uh, any uh, syntactic categories, so predicates, for instance, or, or, or sentences. A central case of, gen of generalized identity is generic identity. Uh, and this notion is expressed by means of claims like for something to be F is for it to be G. Okay. Uh, using this notion of generic identity, we can propose an account of what we call generic essence being F uh, is essential to being G if and only if being F and G. Uh, for something to be F and G uh, is for it to be G, okay. Uh, and then you can reduce the, the standard objectual case of essentialist attributions uh, using this notion of generic essence. Socrates is essentially F, if and only if being F is essential to being identical to Socrates, okay. So that's something that Ryo already proposed and that we, uh, we defend uh, in uh, the 2019 paper. Okay, so this is an account. This is a non-moral conception uh, account of, of essence. That's not uh, that's not primitivist. Okay. Uh, a quick word about the, the relationship between essence and, and, and definition. So many friends uh, and fine in particular, okay, uh, of non-moral conceptions of essence hold that there's a link between essence and real definition. Uh, and the link is, is this, to say that an object is essentially so and so is to define at least partially this object. So if I say that Socrates is essentially human, I give a partial definition of, uh, of, of, of Socrates, okay? Uh, it turns out that this, this was also uh, Aristotle's view, okay? So when you state, when you say what, so you know, make explicit what so Socrates is, then what you're doing is to give a definition, at least a partial definition, uh, of this uh, of this object. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this is not uh, something that you have to do. Okay. If you hold a non model conception uh, of, of essence, so that's one remark. Uh, and then there's also something an interesting discussion to be had there, and, and I'm not going to elaborate on that. Uh, uh, on the question whether uh, a real definition uh, is uh, just that or is more than that. So and fine rules and, and, and myself have defended the view that in the, in the idea of a very idea of real definition, not only the concept of essence plays, plays a role, uh, also the concept of grounding or some similar concept uh, plays some, some role. So you cannot just account for real definition, you cannot equate real definition with, uh, with essence. So that's, the, uh, that's the view. Okay. Uh, let me now move to uh, the other uh, big claim, okay, made by Fine in essence uh, and modality, which is that uh, metaphysical necessity uh, can be understood in terms of, of essence. Right? So this is the the, the, the the first big part of the paper is his rejection of the moral accounts of essence. And the second big part is his defense of the view that metaphysical necessity can be uh, accounted for in terms of essence. So his own view, at least as formulated in essence and modality, as you know, is that uh, a proposition P is metaphysically necessary when uh, it's true in virtue of the nature of some entities, some entity or some entities uh, in the plural. Uh, the notion of, you know, uh, collective essence or collective essential properties is crucial here. Why? Because, you know, sometimes uh, 
uh, you have necessary propositions which uh, cannot be true in virtue of the nature of just a single object. You have to appeal to several objects taken together uh, to, uh, to, 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 to find a, a, a ground, so to speak, uh, essentially ground for the, uh, for the proposition. Uh, several people have followed that, that very idea, okay, the, the idea of accounting for metaphysical necessity uh, in terms uh, of, of essence. Uh, you know, here have a, a list of people who explicitly did so. Uh, now, seeing essence as a source of metaphysical necessity doesn't imply uh, accepting Fine's uh, reductive, uh, reductive claim. Uh, there are other options, uh, okay. Now, before going to that, sorry, I, I, I skipped something. Uh, you have this, uh, this Feinian claim, okay, reproduced in blue here. Uh, then there's the question, obviously, of how if and only if should be understood in that claim, okay? Should it be taken to be a simple con biconditional, a necessary biconditional? Uh, uh, should it be taken to express generalized identity, a reduction link, a link of ground, or an explanatory link of another sort? Uh, so it's not really, people are not al always very clear about that. So, for instance, fine in essence and relate is not specific at all about whether, uh, but how to understand that, uh, that's that if and only if. Uh, in a later paper, he explicitly talks about, uh, about reduction there. So he's happy to talk about, about reduction. Uh, Lowe uh, talks about grounding. Okay, so for him, the connection is one of grounding. Uh, Bob Hale uh, talks about a link of explanation of some sort. Okay, so th there's there's room for disagreement here about the status of this uh, of this account uh, of metaphysical necessity in terms of essence. Okay, uh, and uh, definitely things should be should be clarified further uh, there. Now, as I as as I said before, so uh, seeing essence as a source of metaphysical necessity doesn't mean uh, that you have to ac accept the Feinian uh, biconditional, okay, in, in any form. Uh, so you have a weaker position, for instance, which is that only some metaphysical necessities have their source uh, in essence, okay. So that's the position that Bob Hale, so not Bob Hale 2018, Bob Hale 2013, okay. That's, that, that's his view, uh, uh, that, that's a view that he, that he advocates there. So according to him, uh, logical necessities have their source in the nature of logical entities, conjunction, disjunction, so on and so forth. Uh, but he claims that essentialist truths are necessarily in a brute way. So they are not just true, they are necessarily true, uh, but there's no you know, account of, uh, there's, there's no source to be found uh, for, these, uh, for these necessary truths. Okay, so that's one, that's one line. So that goes roughly in the direction of, of, of Fine's view, but not exactly precisely because uh, he denies that uh, all necessary propositions have their source in, uh, in essence. Uh, and then you have a more recent uh, claim uh, uh, by uh, Goldman, Malozzi and Papino uh, that goes in a way in, in the other direction. Uh, so they hold that the fact that it's necessary, for instance, that gold has this or that atomic constitution has its source in the nature of gold, okay? But the logical necessities don't have any central source. So that's really uh, the opposite of what, uh, what uh, Hale uh, claimed in, the, in his book. Okay. All right. There's another approach, okay, uh, which is quite different, which is, which is more classical in a way, uh, and which I, 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 I only discovered recently. I should have discovered that earlier, obviously. Uh, and that has been put forward by, by Boris Kment. And the idea is to read to start with, with a possible world's uh, account of metaphysical necessity. So proposition is metaphysically necessary when it's true in a metaphysically possible world. Now, uh, the originality of the account lies in, uh, in how uh, he uh, identifies the, uh, the, 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 how Kant meant, uh, identifies the uh, metaphysically possible world. So he takes in his account the world to be a way for the world to be, and he identifies that with a set of propositions. So that's as standard move, obviously. Uh, and then, and that's the, uh, that's the, the, the crucial point. Uh, he says that the world is metaphysically possible if and only if it has the same metaphysical laws as our world, okay? And he counts among the metaphysical laws uh, essentialist truths. So he puts in that, that same bag uh, proper laws, if you want, and uh, essentialist truths, okay? Um, And then, so 
at the end of the day, you have uh, an account of metaphysical necessity in terms of essence, but of a quite different form uh, compared to the uh, to the other uh, accounts that we uh, talked about earlier. Okay. Finally, uh, I'm going to advertise a little bit uh, the approach that I've uh, defended recently with uh, Alex, uh, which uh, relies on the notion of generalized identity. Okay. Uh, so the thought is that the, the main idea is very simple. You say that a proposition P is metaphysically necessary when it's a logical consequence of the true generalized identity. Okay, so you take the pool of all the generalized true generalized identity, you take the logical consequences of that pool of propositions, and then you get all the metaphysical necessities. Uh, by the account of essence that we, uh, the account of essence in terms of sorry, uh, generalized identity that we. Uh, proposed in the previous paper, uh, that basis, so that pool of uh, generalized true generalized identities, uh, contains all the essentialist truths. Okay, so already we see that the account of metaphysical necessity is in terms of essence uh, in some way, right? Now, I think it's also even plausible to say that uh, the basis contains only essentialist truths. So the, the, the thought here is that, and, and it's a further claim, that every true, every generalized identity is an essentialist proposition. Okay, uh, but there's probably room for, for discussion there. Okay, uh, that proposal, the initial proposal, looks like a proposal that Ryo uh, informally uh, makes in his book. But when he comes to developing properly the, the view in the same book, uh, we see that uh, you you see that really the the the, the idea is quite different from the one. Uh, that Alex and I uh, uh, chose to uh, to defend. Okay. Okay. So that's all for uh, the view uh, that essence can be seen or could be seen uh, as a source of metaphysical necessity. So I went through a number of different uh, different options from uh, the primitivist uh, Fanian primitivism uh, uh, to uh, to other uh, non primitivist. Uh, uh, views. Let me now turn to, uh, to what I want to, to do to till the end of, the, of this talk is first to uh, talk about uh, objections about uh, uh, against sorry uh, the non-modal conceptions of essence, and finally I want to turn to objections uh, against uh, the uh, the accounts of necessity that I've just uh, that I've just uh, uh, presented. So first, first the objections against the, the non-modal conceptions of, uh, of essence. Against primitivism, okay, uh, the, the, the standard objection is that the notion of essence is too obscure to be taken as a primitive. So that's really a very common, common uh, objection, right? Uh, so, uh, and uh, against the non-primitivist uh, non-modal conceptions, okay, there is the, a similar kind of objection. The view is that the, the primitives that these views uh, or these, these conceptions uh, uh, used to account for, 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 uh, for essence uh, are also uh, too obscure to be taken as a primitive. So I've mentioned some of them in, in the presentation. There's relevant implication, there's grounding, there's uh, the Zaltian notion of encoding, there's the notion of generalized identity. Uh, so you, you, you know, these, these, these notions have, have been uh, actually uh, Attacked on, on the grounds that they are uh, uh, very obscure. Okay, so that's a general line uh, against the non-modal conceptions of essence. The thought being that, on the contrary, if you adopt a modal conception of essence, then you're only using uh, uh, notions which are at least uh, clear enough uh, to be taken uh, uh, as primitive. Uh, there's another objection uh, which I've mentioned uh, earlier, okay, which is simply that essence doesn't imply necessity, okay. Uh, and among the, the 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 friends of non-primitivist conceptions of essence, which I've talked about uh, earlier, only Gorman escapes this objection. So only his account, the, all the other accounts have as a consequence that essential property, essential properties uh, are necessary properties. Uh, so Gorman's uh, view doesn't have this implication. And he's actually explicit on that. He's aware that that his account doesn't have this uh, this consequence, and he takes that to be to be a good thing, a, a good point in favor of his uh, of his account. There's then a, a 
So let me move now to, to the objections against the accounts of necessity uh, that I've talked about uh, earlier. Uh, first, an account against the Feinian uh, account of necessity. So proposition is necessary when it's true in virtue of the nature of all things. So there's what I think is a very powerful objection to the, to the, to the account uh, that, was, uh, that was given, formulated by Taito uh, recently. And the objection is that uh, this characterization of metaphysical necessity is incompatible with the conjunction of two uh, uh, widely accepted views, okay? The first one is that the logic of metaphysical necessity is S5, because okay, so you often hear philosophers uh, claiming or you know, sometimes arguing that uh, S5 is the correct system for metaphysical necessity. Uh, and the other view is uh, so-called contingentism. Uh, that's the view that uh, it's not necessary that everything necessarily exists, okay? Uh, which should be opposed to necessitism which is precisely the view that necessarily uh, uh, everything necessarily uh, exists. Okay, uh, so these two views are quite popular. Uh, Timothy Williamson is known for uh, defending necessitism, and some other people are happy with the view. But clearly, contingentism uh, is the is the orthodox majority view. So titles. Uh, objection is to the effect that you cannot have uh, these two uh, these two. Uh, these two these two views uh, together there's at least a tension between between the two views. Uh, okay so I, I i think it's a very important objection because it's definitely not obvious how you can escape it right um, i mentioned also uh, uh, a paper by by hale because in that paper he makes roughly the same uh, uh perhaps even ex exactly the same points uh, uh, and uh and he proposes his own um very non-standard uh, solution to the problem. I think, if I remember correctly, the, the, the view is to uh, is to uh, is to modify the rule of necessitation or restrict it or something like that. Okay. Uh, anyway. All right. Uh, and then there's a really a, a bunch of quite recent objections to the Feynman account of metas metaphysical necessity. I won't have time to uh, enter into the, the details here. Uh, I've, I've put some some references, uh, and then I should mention uh, uh, an objection uh, which I think is a bit annoying against uh, the, the account that Alex and I uh, recently put forward. Uh, and the objection is that the only necessary propositions that the account delivers are biconditional propositions, so propositions of type, uh, you know, for all x, uh, f of x, if and only if, g of x, stuff like that. Okay, uh, so. Uh, uh, all right, so that's 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 all for my presentation. So here you have the uh, the, the 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 bibliography bibliography I mentioned earlier, on the basis of which I've drawn this nice uh, diagram. Uh, there are seventy six entries there. I, I'm sure I forgot some of them. Uh, so uh, please uh, feel free to make uh, suggestions for uh, enriching this uh, this list. So I'm going to be talking about a dispositional theory of modality. Um, I'm going to be giving you a little bit of motivation why dispositional theory of modality um, and the placement uh, of my specific account. Um, I'm going to talk about dispositional accounts of modality first in general and see how they look like what their problems are. Um, and then I'm gonna introduce my own favorite account um, and see if it fares better. Um, especially, I want to focus on the question, which kinds of modality are the ones that dispositional accounts of modality are accounts of? Okay, so let's start right into this. So why dispositions? I mean, I personally come from the angle of laws of nature. So I was working on a disposition theory of laws of nature. And this is why I started doing fundamental work in dispositions. So my background is something like philosophy of science and I want dispositions to be empirical, traceable and stuff like this. Um, but one thing which I particularly liked about dispositional accounts, and this is something which 
normally people tend to like, which give disposition accounts of anything, is their locality. So if I have a class and a hammer and I break the class with the hammer, um, it's a local matter of the class and the hammer of the things here and now and not of something like eternal or uh, atemporal some laws of nature, God, or some, some entity. Okay, so this is something what disposition is normally like. So this is something which we should keep in mind. Um, I'm going to be talking about ontology here in this talk. So I'm going to be focused on ontology just to make this clear. Um, and especially I want to focus on the narrow field of modality. Um, and within that, I'm going to give a possibility-based account of dispositions. Um, I think this is a sensible way to go. Um, so why should one want to give a dispositional account of modality in the first place? Well, Alexander Pross lists some benefits that such an account would have, and I tend to agree with him. So first, he thinks that uh, capacities, power, dispositions, and all these concepts are very close to the ordinary language notions of possibility. Um, second, he thinks that we have direct experiential knowledge of um, dispositions. And third, he thinks that they're concrete. So a dispositional account of modality is not a reductive account because dispositions themselves are modal concepts, but still Pross thinks um, it increases the comprehensibility because of the concreteness of the modal notions of dispositions rather than modality in general. Okay. And I, I think those are good motivations for looking for a dispositional account of modality. So how would such an account look like? So very general. Also, Alexander Pross thinks that a non-actual state of affairs, so this is the thing that's supposed to be just possible, so non-actual, is possible, so it's an account of possibility, if there actually was a substance capable of initiating a causal chain, perhaps non-deterministically, that could lead to that state of affairs that we claim is possible. So we have an actual substance, and this gives us the basis for non-actual state of affairs, and along that lines, an account of possibility is given. Or take John Jacobs, who uh, gives an example of him being a truck driver. And he says, because of the properties I have, my powers and capacities and dispositions, I could have initiated a chain of events leading to my actually driving a truck. So once again, we have the actual entities, the dispositions on the one hand, and then we have the state of affairs in question, him driving a truck. Um, and it's linked by a causal chain of events. We will take a look at the details in a second. But basically, we have the actual entities, which are the basis for the non-actual state of affairs. And third, we have uh, Borghini and Williams. Um, and they say a state of affairs as is possible if and only if there is some actual disposition B, the manifestation of which is or includes S. So once again, we have this link between dispositions, which are actual, but which might not be actually manifested, but whose manifestation then is a state of affairs, and this manifestation is the thing that it's possible. So this is important to note, it's an actualistic account, so the dispositions are actual, but they need not be manifest, so the manifestations need not be actual, but as the dispositions are actual, their manifestations are anchored in actuality, and this is how very roughly possibility is anchored in actuality. Um, this sounds quite, I mean, for me, <laughs> this sounds quite attractive. Um, so let's see how to give a little bit more flesh to this account, how this account could be worked out. Um, Jennifer Wang gives four desiderata, and I think this is a good starting point for uh, um, any dispositionalist account of modality. So first she thinks if it's dispositional account, it should not include more primitive modal notions than dispositions. So that it's like a strong dispositionalist account for all kinds of modality is reduced to dispositions. 
Then she thinks it should be an actualistic account. So if I include non-actualist features, then we lost kind of the, the, the basic um, approach that you wanted to give. Um, then, and this is like material adequacy, all other things equal, possi the possibilities that we accept pre-theorizing should also be predicted. So it could get the right possibilities out. And the last thing, which is not trivial, this theory should be informative. So I should have an account of why it is the dispositions, what the link is, not just positing what we wanted to get out of the account. Okay. Mm. And then Jennifer Wang goes on and say that dispositions work well for local, diachronic, and credible possibilities, but they have problems with other kind of possibilities, namely with global possibilities, which is the same as negative possibilities. So saying that some non-existing entity could be possible is kind of a global possibility, if you think about this. Then synchronic possibilities, where it's at the same time and not like later, because normally people think that manifestations are also later as the dispositions. And absolute possibilities. So there the, the examples are often things that are very unlikely, but still possible. She talks about smoke collecting in the corner of a room in a cat-shaped form rather than dispensing even the inner in the room, which is possible, but unlike the dispositions normally give us the things which, which we tend to and smoke tends to or is disposed to disturb easily. And I think this is a good challenge. So basically, dispositionist's account can give us a very good idea of certain forms of possibility, namely the things that we normally formalize in manifestations of dispositions, but for other this um, for other for other possibilities, they have problems. Also, this is at least just in the, in the whole debate. And so, what people tend to do is increase kind of the scope of the possibilities that are covered by the dispositional accounts. So, for example, um, Borghini and Williamson also include anything that is part of a manifestation. Their account of part is rather strange, I think, because the examples they give are more like logical consequences. But anyway, it is clear that this is meant to increase the scope of what can be covered. So not only a state of affairs, for example, that the class is broken, but also that something is broken, that something exists, that class exists. So all the stuff like the logical closure of the state of affairs, so to say. Um, the other thing they do is they not only take state of affairs, but they also take conjunctive and disjunctive state of affairs. And with that, try to give an account. So if we have two state of affairs, which are possible, then also the conjunctive state of affairs is possible. The problem with this is, Jennifer Wang has pointed out, that this uses more modal notions than just the disposition. Because surely going left is possible and going right is possible for me if I stand in the middle of the room, but going left and right is not compossible. Right? So not every conjunction of individually possible state of affairs is compossible, but this compossibility is a modal notion. Okay. Another way to go would be to go the way Barbara Fetter goes. And there the idea is that we have iterated these positions. So we don't only have the manifestations of a disposition, but we could have iterated these positions. So what does this mean? Take our class, where well, it's possible that the class is broken, but now with the shards I can cut. So in a way, it's possible to cut the paper, but this is not directly a disposition of the class. So with the intact class, I cannot cut the paper, but with the intact class, I can get to the broken class and with the broken class, I get to the cutting of the paper. And in principle, this could be prolonged. So I get iterated dispositions. And notice that another switch happened here. 
So now the focus gets to the manifestations. So in, in the Fetarian account, you could say, if there is a manifestation, which somehow by some dispositions is brought about, then this, this, then this what is the manifestation is, is um, possible. So here you have the compossibility of this disposition manifestations already built into. So you have a manifestation, whatever dispositions are needed to bring them, bring this manifestation together about, if you get the manifestation, it's possible. So there's a switch of focus here, which I think is rather important. Okay. And I this switch of focus is what Jennifer Banks thinks is also problematic because we lose kind of information here. So this is um, at odds with her um, desideratum number four, because take the possibility of a glaze being molded and the glass is breaking, and this comes out possible, but which dispositions give you the molding and which give you the breaking, kind of, it gets swept under the rug, so you don't, don't see these this differences there. And by that, you lose kind of informativeness. In the end, you just say, all the dispositions together give us everything which is possible, which might be, true, but not really an informative account. And I think Jennifer Wang is up to something here. So it's not that the Fetarian account is wrong or doesn't work, but it works too easily in a way. Um, and Sophie Allen goes along the same line. So another thing that Barbara Feta does is she includes uh, more entities into her account. She talks about potentialities, and potentialities are not only dispositions, but a broader class of disposition-like entities, like, um, like abilities, powers, and stuff, also fall, fall under the term. And by that, she can cover more cases. But as Sophie Allen says, this comes with, with a price. So potentialities might be exactly the right kind of property-like entities to crown modality, but as potentialists have been made ontologically richer than mere powers, they have become progressively left safe and sane as ontological categories. So I think here we now have our um, an understanding of the first, as I want to call it, challenge for this position as accounts. You lose informativeness and you kind of lose locality because if you go for this, somehow the manifestation must come about and I don't care about which dispositions actually are involved in bringing about the manifestation or they come in later, right? You lose also the locality because now the possibility of the molding and the glass is somehow smudged, right? It's the, the, you lose the locality and this was something we started off as liking something which gave us an argument for giving a dispositional account in the first place. Okay, but there is a second challenge and it's the well-known problem of masking. But if you look at how some of these theories try to increase the scope, you can see it's like a strengthened masking problem. So the masking problem in general, as you all know, is that dispositions do not show their manifestation under all circumstances, they can be masked. So think of an oil drop falling because of its mass, and then, but you have it electrically charged, and then you turn on a plate condenser and the oil drop starts falling slower or even hovering on the spot or rising, this masks the falling of the gravitational disposition. And here, this case is harder because of the causal chains. So if something is in principle possible, but for example, it needs more energy than there is in the whole universe, it's necessarily masked in a way it cannot or necessarily think in a way it cannot, cannot come to as manifestation. So it is a possible manifestation, but it's not a possible manifestation. But if you now think of if you look closely at the accounts I've, uh, I've, I've given you, Brass, for example, talks of a starting of a causal chain, Jacobs talks of a chain of events, and 
Petter and Borghini and Williams both talk about iterated dispositions. And I take it to be roughly the same idea. But if you now have, say you have an amount of energy, which is enough for every step in the causal chain, but which is not enough for like all the steps taken together, then you don't have some disposition which is like in a way necessary mass, but still the whole chain cannot run through. So initiating a causal chain, chain I claim, is not enough for making the manifestation like the end result of that chain possible, even if I find all the rest of the accounts plausible. So we have a strength and masking problem here, which we have to take care about, I guess. Okay, but let's take a step back. Um, what do we want when you give an actualist a dispositional theory of modality? We for sure want to be actualists. So what we give is an actual theory of something possible. We want to be naturalists. I mean, at least if the natural, if, if the actual world is natural, we want to be naturalists, and we want to be realists. Perhaps something more. Um, I don't think we have to keep all the desiderata that Jennifer Wang does. Um, and I will tell you in a way which I drop, but I think this is the core which we have to stick to. Okay. And we can sort the accounts given. So we can have direct accounts, which directly give a dispositional account of modality or indirect accounts, which give us a dispositional account of possible worlds and then take the normal possible world story for modality or give us a dispositional account of counterfactuals and then take a counterfactual account of modality, something like that. And we can have a strong account which says all modality is reducible to dispositions or weak account where we give just an account of some kind of modality reduced to dispositions. And I personally favor the weak direct account. My account might be even more direct than the other accounts on the market because I think talking about truth makers is an unnecessary and perhaps problematic detour because I don't want to give the truth makers for this position statements. I'm doing like hardcore metaphysics. I want to give a disposition account of modality. Okay. So a direct weak disposition is account. And by that, we have already had dropped one of the desiderata of Jennifer Wang, because I don't think that all, that only dispositions are allowed to be modal notions. I think dispositions give us a good account of a very specific kind of modality. I will come to that. So I've already been talking about the masking cases, right? The case where the, the gravitational pull and the electrical pull interact. And these cases are in the heart of my favorite account of dispositions. I won't argue for this here in long. I've written about this. Basically, the idea is that it's a triadic account, which has a third level in between the dispositions and the resulting behavior. And I think this can be easily shown, illustrated by an account like the Millikan's oil drop experiment. Because if there is the lonely oil drop in the void with no other masses, no electric field around, it stays in the same spatial position. But if I have the, gravitation, uh, the gravitational pull and the electrical pull um, so finely adjusted that it also, in the equilibrium case, keeps the oil drop in the same position, right? The resulting behavior is not differentiated, but the, um, the, the, the story is different how this gets about. And I don't think it's about the dispositions only, but the electrical disposition is already there if the plate condenser is not turned on. It's about like the, the actions, the doings, the pushings or the pullings. I like to call them the wirkungen. So it's about the different wirkungen about. So we have two wirkungen interacting over time to give us the resulting behavior. And I give you a wirkungen based or working centered account of possibility. The interesting thing is that this um, working can be, also the behavior can be multiple realized, as I just said. So staying on the same spot would be behavior one. And this can be if there are no working around or if there are two working around like the electrical and the gravitational, then it can give you the same behavior. So it's multiple realizable. 
Maybe also the spatial arrangement matters, which is not a disposition itself, according to Molnar, but still relevant to the output. So we have the same dispositions in a different arrange, sorry, the same Wirkungen in a different arrangement can give us a different behavior. And these functions are kind of the link between the Wirkungen and the resultant behavior, so between level two and three of patriotic ontology. But let's not get too much into the details of the account. How, what do you want as a Wirkungen based account of possibility? Well, easily the idea is um, something is possible if there are the right Wirkungen around. And that in a way then is based because the Wirkungen are the Wirkungen of dispositions. So something is possible if there are the right dispositions to give you the right Wirkungen and if there is the right arrangement, of course. So if I have the right Wirkungen and they are not rightly arranged, it doesn't work. So for example, here also the timing can play a role. So if kind of the the one Wirkung comes too late, it gives you a completely different result. But basically this is the idea of possibility. And then we can have necessity as the dual of possibility and just saying something if necessary, if there are not the right kind of objects with the right kind of, sorry, the right kind of dispositions with the right kind of Wirkung and inner arrangement to exclude a certain behavior. So it's necessary, it's not excluded. Okay. Now, some might think that dispositions are dependent entities. They, as all properties, need bearers. I'm not sure, but I have nothing against this sort. If you think so, the ultimate source of the modality goes further away. So it goes from the Wirkungen to the dispositions to the bearers. And then can also give an account of what then possibility is. Possibility is you have certain objects whose dispositions have the Wirkung in the arrangement to make it possible. And if any step of this falls down, it is not possible. So not just having the object is enough. It needs to be the objects with the right dispositions, which give you the right Wirkung in the right arrangement to make it possible. And once again, necessity as the dual then says, if none of them is, is, is able to like exclude a certain behavior, this behavior is necessary. Okay. Now, let's once again, take a step back and um, look at this account. And I think something is very, very, um, like obvious or noteworthy, we have talked about that dispositional accounts want to increase the scope of the cases they can account for, right? They want to have more and more cases of possibility. But I would rather ask a question of which kind of modality comes out of a dispositional account. And the obvious candidates are, are we have logical modality, metaphysical modality, nomical or natural modality. I mean, logic modality is problematic. There are papers around which axioms can or cannot be um, accounted for by a dispositional account. And we have problems if something is true and then it's possible true, then we have another source of modality. This is what Gates calls like weak dispositionalism. I would just take this on board so I have no crowd with other sources of modality than dispositional. And uh, I think we can exclude logical modality as the kind of modality that dispositions talk about. So the question is, is it metaphysical or nomic or natural necessity? A short side note, I don't like to call it physical necessity because I don't want to presuppose a reductionism to physics. So this is why I go with nomic or natural necessity. Um, and I've said, if you have a, like a, a three-part ontology, right? You have a dispositions on the first level, then you have the Wirkungen on the second level, and the behavior, the resulting behavior on the third level. The normal link that your Aristotelians posit between the disposition and its manifestation, namely that it's in the nature of the disposition to manifest, that dispositions are for that and that manifestation. This link 
is between the dispositions and the Wirkung in my case, because the Wirkung are stable. The same disposition gives you the same Wirkung. So the gravitational pull is the same in all these cases, but it, it's combined with the, with the, with the, with the electric, electrical pull. And this gives us a very uh, vari a big variety of outcoming behavior. And this function then should be the stable link to give you the variable behavior. This was the idea. So this function gives us the combinatorics in a way, and it can be smarter than just listing all the possibilities out as I have done, but just wanted to show that this is, but it does something more, right? It's an ontological link also. It does not give us only the computational results. It's also an ontological link between the two levels of the ontology. Now you could ask, where are these functions? And I think this is a sensible question, which has to be answered, cannot be ignored. And I think also one answer is very um, um, in line with what we've talked about, namely, we, if you think locality is a reason for you to go this position list, then take this function and put it in the powers, right? Put it in the dispositions themselves. Because then it's the, in, in the end, it's the class and the hammer which have the dispositions and they, these dispositions, then know how to combine. Um, I think this is sensible and I think this has consequences which once again give us something where we can test the account with. I think it makes sense. So let's see. So what are the consequences of this? Well, think about alien properties. Think about dispositions which are not um, realized in the actual world. I think we don't want them in an actualistic account of modality, but in a way they play a role. And so the, the, one of the famous examples you can find, right? It's on necessity is schmass. So you could think of uh, gravitation working with inverse cube law rather than inverse square law. Um, and of course, we've all read our crypt key, so it can be that we say, no, no, this is, this, this is then not mass anymore, right? So we, either it's possible that mass works with the inverse cube law, or we say, ah, no, it's not, I cannot call it mass, right? It, it's mass. Anyway, um, so fine has a nice way of putting this together and saying that the naive pre cryptian and the sophisticated post cryptian actually can agree. Namely, they say, in either case, the fabric of the universe is envisaged as excluding a certain kind of behavior, whether this be the deviant behavior of mass or the normal behavior of schmass. And I totally agree with this. So it doesn't matter if you call it mass or schmass. The, the idea is that certain kind of behavior is excluded. And this is the behavior of the of the, which includes like these alien properties, as I would call them. And the, the idea is that I think this behavior is then not possible given the dispositions and the combination, the inbuilt combination rules. And this tells us, because obviously Schmerzi behavior is metaphysically possible, right? So this tells us that dispositions give us a nomic or natural necessity. Now we have this famous like onion <laughs> of, uh, of, of necessity of modalities. And if you think about the natural um, possibilities and the metaphysical possibilities and the logical possibilities, you normally think that they are included. But I rather think that they are uh, mutually exclusive. So we have the natural possibilities and then we have the metaphysical possibilities and we have the logical possibilities. For the logical possibilities, like laws of logic and truth, right, can be the source of their necessity. For the natural, I think it's the dispositions and metaphysical necessity. Well, it could be abstractions from actual dispositions or something. I don't want to give an account of this. So I'm a weak dispositionalist and I think we should we should really not try to give an account of dispositions in all kind of cases for all kinds of, of necessity. And I will, I, will, I will tell you why. Mm -hmm. 
so I don't think this uh, dispositional account is reductive. I mean, nobody thinks this because you have dispositions in there, but I'm happy to uh, get more and more modal notions on board if you really want to get all the kinds of modality, logical truths, maybe abstract, maybe even absences, maybe these combination rules I've talked about are the essences of this position property. So I, I get essences in, in, the, uh, in the end. But I don't think that's a problem. I don't think this positions and essential is, is like mutually exclusive once again. I think the problem or the, my diagnosis is there is something hidden deeper beneath this. And the one thing is that David Lewis, you can say what you want about him, but he was consistent and his account like kind of works together. He gives you a possible world's account. He is an eternalist and he's an perdurantist. And it kind of is strange that we now want to give a dispositionalist account and then still have an eternalist idea about all the possibilities lying around in the whole block universe. I, I think we should like open our minds and also think that dispositionalist maybe works better with a presentist theory of time. I actually think this is the case. And maybe we should also not presuppose perdurantism, but maybe, maybe endurantism or even uh, a process theory of perdurance like produrantism. Um, so I think it is not a bug of a dispositionalist theory that it only gives us natural um, modality. I think actually this is a feature because we don't have this big pot of all the possibilities. And then we have to artificially look for some ways of organizing them into metaphysically logical and uh, natural or other kinds of possibilities. We can acknowledge that different kinds of possibilities have different sources. And we can see that this position list, for example, works very well with a theory of, of as an understanding of uh, metaphysics uh, modality, which I have not been talking about, but which I have listed. And it's something like real or historical possibilities, which are kind of dynamic possibilities. And I think if you have, if, if you're inclined to think about this, then a kind of dispositional basis um, for this kind of modality, it's a perfect match. Okay, thank you for your time. So we are skeptics uh, about Aristotelian essence, or perhaps about neo-Aristotelian essence would probably be a better way of putting it. Um, and we're not sure how long this talk will take, because the plan is really just to outline uh, a, a line of thought, uh, a general bit of skepticism about the notion of Aristotelian or Neo-Aristotelian essence, as we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, we're, we're looking for discussion. We're looking for people to tell us why we're wrong um, and what there is about Aristotelian essence, which is so, uh, well, that, that is so that, that is coherent, really. So I guess we're worried about the coherence of the notion more than anything. And as should be familiar, I think, to people here, the, the standard account of essence from the 19 well, really from the 1950s up until the 1990s, was the account of essence where essence was defined in terms of de re necessity. We're not really going to be questioning that, although we're also skeptical about that notion of essence as well. Uh, we're going to be questioning the, the new or the neo-Aristotelian account of essence, whereby people, um, in particular Kit Fine and Jonathan Lowe, but others as well, want to try to define uh, the notion of de re necessity in terms of essence or give an explanation of essence, sorry, of de re necessity in terms of essence, so to go the other way round. And um, in that regard, we take uh, the following to be um, a commitment of neo-Aristotelian um, essentialism, and it's the one that we're going to be giving our line of thought against really and it's just the we're calling it the essence necessity link um it, it has been this this kind of principle has been given by quite a few people um and it's just that if something has a property essentially then it has that property necessarily and i mean well to, to, 
to sort of formalize it a little bit uh, to make it clear that this is a day ray, uh, a day ray property, we can put it in this terms, or a day ray uh, uh, necessity at the end there. So something, I take it, in the English language version can be taken as a bound variable. Uh, we can quantify from the beginning there, so it, it becomes day ray. Um, and it may be that some people want to necessitate this very principle as well. So it might want, be that people want to say that necessarily for all x, x is essentially f, if, uh, if, uh, if x is essentially f, then x is necessarily f. But we're sticking with the non-necessitated version, which presumably is going to be true as well. And the key thing to note, I think, about this principle is precisely that it, it applies at worlds rather than across them, um, right? So at least for the first instance. So our point is, we don't see why we should accept this principle. And um, in fact, we're going we're gonna to try to give uh, a line of argument to explain why we don't see uh, why we should accept it. OK. So we start with an initial question. I mean, this, this begins to, to spell out our skepticism. And we, we kind of, we just want to ask this, well, why can't it be that a thing is essentially F, but only contingently so? Um, why isn't that a, uh, why isn't that, I mean, what is it that makes it such that if something is essentially F at one world, then it's going to be uh, F at all other worlds, right? In virtue of the fact that it's essentially F at a particular world. It's this, this idea that the property is possessed in one world, but somehow makes it, that it's possessed in other worlds as well is mysterious and we're not sure why we should accept this so to give an example uh why can't it be that aristotle is essentially human in the actual world i mean I suppose we accept that uh, but why shouldn't it be that he could be a centipede in another world and perhaps essentially a centipede in another world so, I mean, putting, that's putting it in terms of possible worlds, but we don't have to put it in terms of possible worlds. It's just easier to, uh, I think, uh, see where we're coming from, put so. Um, and the Neo-Aristotelian then, I think, owes us an account of essence that explains why this can't be so. It's not enough for them to just assert it. Uh, there's got to be some kind of an explanation for why this can't be so. And the explanation is going to have to flow from the account of essence. And I'll say more about this in a second, but Kant's, as it were, itself appeal to the notion of de re necessity. Um, here's another way of putting, I mean, we take it that this is just really another way of putting pretty much the same point. Um, we can ask this, uh, why can't it be that the essence of X is a non-rigid designator? So. Aristotelian essentialists seem to think that the essence of X is rigid, that it's going to pick out the same uh, property or uh, perhaps set of properties um, in whatever world, uh, in every world. But we don't see why, for example, the essence of Aristotle uh, couldn't include being human in the actual world uh, and not contain being human in another like, Include being a centipede in some other possible world. I, I take it that this is just a, another way of expressing the um, what I've just said uh, about the skepticism in the previous slide. The the point really is well, what account can the neo Aristotelian give that rules this out? Okay. So um, the way we approach this then is by looking at the the answer uh, or that Neo-Aristotelians tend to give when talking about essence or when trying to give an account of what essence is. And it's with the, the we call it the, the what is X question. I mean, I'm sure people are going to be familiar with this. It's often introduced really by example. So, you know, there's the famous uh, example given by Kit Fine about Socrates and Singleton Socrates and so on. And we're supposed to have some sort of an intuition about what properties uh answer the what is x question but in general we take it and again right this this should all be familiar to neo-aristotelian essentialists and really we're, we're laying this out to say are we going wrong somewhere here at the beginning is isn't this the account if not uh, have we gone wrong somewhere early on so we'd like to know 
Uh, f is an essential property of x, if and only if. Specifying f gives an answer to the question, what is x, where that question is understood in a special Aristotelian sense. And I guess our point is we don't really know what this special Aristotelian sense is supposed to be. Um, I've said uh, that the, it's often introduced by a kind of intuition that we look at this and we, you know, we're supposed to have an intuition about what properties satisfy that question, which ones don't. Um, so being human is often said to be an essential property of Aristotle by a neo-Aristotelian essentialist. And the idea is, well, that's because Aristotle is human, gives an answer to the question, what is Aristotle, understood in the special Aristotelian sense. Okay. Um, so what we want to say is, all right, look, I mean, well, maybe I'll say a few words uh, sort of extra in here. It's like, I'm not sure I really have that kind of intuition that other people think they have. Um, I mean, I can certainly recognize that being human is a kind of, in a sense, a more natural answer to the question, what is Aristotle, than say, uh, I don't know, being six foot tall or however tall he is or whatever it all he was. Um, but I, I mean, I think it's much rather than say that this is because of some sort of metaphysical intuition that we're somehow latching on to some sort of metaphysically significant property. I just think that these kinds of um, intuitive, um, intuitive sense in which some answers seem more appropriate than others is probably better explained in terms of uh, the fact that there's a broader range of contexts in which that would be an a, appropriate answer to the ordinary everyday question of what is Aristotle. Um, so I'll say a bit more about that perhaps in a minute. But okay, um, yeah, if we want to understand what the essential properties of a thing are, then the special sense of the question should be clarified, we say, and it should be clarified in a way that explains uh, this essence necessity link, why a correct answer specifies a, a de re necessary property. So uh, that's the reason why the clarification cannot itself appeal to the notion of de re necessity. Right. So I said that this is ordinary every day, what is X question? And for example, let's take uh, this as our question, what is Barack Obama? And we can imagine many, many contexts in which there are lots of, dip well, many answers are, are capable. The everyday question, what is Barack Obama? You might say human being in some contexts. There might be other contexts in which you say a carbon-based life form. Uh, if it's in a hospital, I don't know, and you need to know uh, somebody, somebody's uh, a doctor is asking about Barack Obama, you know, or uh, th there's a context in which he's, he's on the operating table or something. You say, well, what is he? He's, oh, he's rhesus negative. That might be an answer that is appropriate in some context. Male, an American, a politician, a Democrat, an orator, happy. All of these things can be answers to uh, the ordinary everyday question, what is, what is Barack Obama? But obviously, not all of these answers correspond to correct answers to the special, in the special Aristotelian sense. Um, at least they're not supposed to. Uh, the first one certainly does. A human being is, well, many uh, neo Aristotelian essentialists at any rate would take that to correspond to a correct answer to the special sense of the question. Um, for my own sake, I don't really see why, but anyway, let's go with it. Um, but I'm not sure about some of the others. I don't really have a carbon based life form. Is that is that supposed to correspond to a, um, a correct answer to the Aristotelian sense? If we only rely upon intuition, it's not going to get us very far, in other words, because, you know, where does our intuition stand on these some of these things? So we need to clarify this question. And one way of doing this, then, is to think about what restrictions can be given to the, um, the ordinary everyday question uh, that brings out the answer. So I'll just run through these pretty quickly. I'm not going to spend too much time on them. But here's one. So you might want to say, well, look, happy is clearly not an answer to the special Aristotelian what is X question. Obviously not. That one definitely gets ruled out. So what restriction rules it out? One thought, OK, well, um, Barack Obama is sometimes happy and sometimes not happy. So what we could do is we can place a restriction and say 
A correct answer to the Aristotelian what is X question posed for some thing must specify a property that is such that it, that thing has it at all times. So because Barack Obama isn't happy at all times, well, then that doesn't count as a uh, uh, one of the essential properties of and that. That's, it doesn't count as what he is because he might not be uh, at some times that. Something like that. And that rules out happy. It rules out a politician, a Democrat, I presume, unless you, people think that people are born Democrats, uh, and a narrator. Um, but it's not going to rule out other incorrect answers. So it doesn't rule out male. I, I mean, I assume that Obama was born male and will always be male. Um, but people can, at least in, in principle, change their sexes. So it doesn't seem to me to be, um, well, it isn't a, a, a correct answer. We might then think, well, okay, that's that's because um, although Obama uh, might be always male, uh, people can change their sexes. So what we want to do is to give the research in a slightly different way. A correct answer to the Aristotelian what is X question must specify a property that is such that for all things Y, if they are Y at some time uh, T, then they're Y at all times T, i.e. specifies properties that are such that they are permanently had by anything that has them. And that does seem to work for male, but then it fails to rule out other properties. For example, uh, being an American understood in, you know, originating or being born in America, for example. Um, sh surely not an essential property of anyone. Okay, uh, what else can we do? Well, we could try necessitating this principle. So if we just uh, think, okay, well, maybe we can add a necessity in here. We can put it in like this. A correct answer uh, is such that necessarily for all Y, if Y is F at some time T, then Y is F at all times T. But that still fails to rule out an American. So it doesn't take us any further forward. And look, um, the general strategy that we've, we've, we've got here is, is one of trying our best to think of restrictions that are going to do the job, right? Um, trying to work out what restrictions could be placed on the ordinary everyday sense, uh, what is X question, that, that are going to end up giving us the right kinds of answers uh, for the Aristotelian, what is X question. And look, we, we tried, we thought about it, we've sat around, we've banged our heads against the wall trying to come up with such things. We, we kind of get to this point and um, we get stuck. We can't think of what are the restrictions that we can put on the question unless, and this is the, the kind of way out, unless we appeal to substance uh, sortals. Uh, by the way, I've got perhaps better ultimate sortals in here, uh, in particular because Howard and, uh, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to offend any Wigginsians. Uh, and uh, perhaps it's better to say ultimate sortals. We're not going to worry too much about that. In particular, maybe uh, how it could, because I, I believe that Wiggins never actually tells us or gives us an example of an ultimate sortal. So it's uh, a bit tricky to sort of give examples using that. So we're going to stick with substance sortals, but maybe this is better uh, formulated in terms of ultimate uh, sortals. Uh, but okay, we get stuck unless we appeal to these. And um, I've got a little quote on here because, well, here's an appeal to authority for you. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a, an appeal to authority. Um, it, it looks as if Kit Fine himself agrees with this. So he says, when talking about giving a non-modal definition of essential properties, uh, he says, the only plausible non-modal definition of man, so here he's, he's um, taking man as an example, is one that classifies the object under a sort. To be a man is to be an F, uh, where this is the sort differentiated in such and such a way. If we use only ordinary non-sortal properties in stating what a man is, then it is hard to see how the definition could have the required modal import. Well, um, we also think that this is the only way to give a non-modal definition. Uh, however, we still find it hard to see how the definition could have the required modal import. And, um, okay, uh, there's the restriction. A correct answer to the Aristotelian what is X question posed for some X must specify property F that is a substance sortal, brackets perhaps ultimate sortal. Uh, and I've got here one that is entailed 
by the possession or one that is entailed by the possession of a substance sought or property by X. So that's just because I take it that, for example, um, being a carbon based life form is not itself a sort of uh, property, but it may very well be entailed by so being human is a sort of property and I'm not sure about this, but maybe being human entails being a carbon based life form, in which case that's going to count as an essential property as well. Um, so this kind of gives us not only an, an answer, you know, gives us the sort of, but it also gives us a way of deciding for for cases where we're not sure, like is a carbon-based life form an essential property or is it not? Well, it gives us a kind of a way of deciding those questions as well. But all right, this seems to do the job. Um, but, and here I pass over to Harold for the but. So thank you very much. And uh, Harold will, will speak to you for the rest of the presentation. Um, so Ben, do you want to move the slide on please? Right. Okay, so um, as Ben has said and has just summarised, we're interested in the notion of Aristotelian essence and we're sceptical about the essence necessity link, which seems to be uh, pretty important in the minds of neo-Aristotelians. And so we're thinking about how that can be justified. And we thought of, we thought of um, understanding the notion of essence in terms of um, the question, what is X? The what is X question, but clearly you've got to restrict the sense of that question if it's going to be uh, enable uh, enable uh, us to uh, get hold of this special um, notion of neo Aristotelian essence. And so Ben has been through various ways to restrict the question, and I think pretty predictably he's arrived at the conclusion that, that the sort of answer you need in in, um, in answering that question if you're going to give what would be called an essential property of X is um, a sort of answer. The, the, the question has got to be, uh, the answer has got to be given by a substance sort of, or maybe an ultimate sort of. That's Wiggins' distinction. I may say something more about it in a minute if I've got time. Um, it's not really important to us, and I'm trying to keep time on my counter here. Um, so um, uh, the, the two questions then. First of all, what is this notion of salt or substance salt or that we're appealing to here? How, do, how, how are we to understand this? How do people understand it? What, what, are, the, what are the elements in the understanding of this that people appeal to? And secondly, if we understand this notion in this way, does that enable us to, to justify the essence necessity link. So what I'm first going to do is explain um, the notion of substance sort of drawing on uh, familiar ideas, and then simply argue that these explanations don't provide a justification for the essence necessity link. So if you understand the notion of um, essence by the notion of substance sort or, or an ultimate sort or, you're still left with the question why we should accept the essence of Hestilling. Okay, so what are the ideas via which typically people explain the notion of a sort of substance sort or ultimate sort of? Well, one idea is the notion of a criterion identity. Sort of supply criterion identity, that's what they do. Uh, and this distinguishes them from adjectival terms, non sort of terms, which don't supply criterion identity. That's one notion that people have. Another idea is that sort of, in the case of um, uh, persisting things, um, supply or impose um, persistence conditions on the, on the things. Or another way of putting that is that they supply criteria of identity over time. So this is a special case of the first. And the third idea is that sort of concepts are somehow very important to the identification, the singling out of things. Maybe they're necessary. Maybe you can't pick something out unless you supply a sort of concept. I can't just pick something out by saying this and pointing. I've got to do a bit more than that. And maybe what I've got to do is actually to um, supply a sort of concept, this man or this tree or whatever. Maybe I don't. Maybe in some concepts I don't have to. But in some sense, 
uh, in some concepts, it may be necessary and it may be crucial to supply a sort of concept. So recognition of, of the possession of a, a, a sort of concept is necessary or very important in some way to identify and reference to things, the things we think about. Okay, so those are, I think, three basic ideas people have about sort of concepts. Uh, but our claim is that if we spell these out clearly, they can be spelled out clearly in terms of de dicto necessities only, even if we if we need necessities anyway at all. We only need de dicto necessities to explain these uh, ideas. And, and so they, this, these explanations don't support the essence of necessity link. Next slide, Ben. Next slide. Ben? Ah, good. Right. Okay, so let, let's look at the first one. Um, the idea that a substance sort or is in some way linked to uh, a, a, a criterion identity supplies, in some sense, a criterion identity. So what's a criterion identity? Well, I've got a statement there. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just use examples to illustrate. I won't go through the, um, the, the, the formulations. I'll just use examples. So familiar example of a criterion identity is Davidson's uh, criterion event identity. Events are the same, just in case they have the same causes and effects. Or again, a, a criterion or identity of the set. Sets are the same, if, if just in case they have the same members. And you don't necessarily, I think, have to use any modal formulation um, to get uh, to, to state these criterion identities. For example, Davidson and Quine debated Davidson's criterion of event identity, and they surely didn't have any modal formulation in mind when they were debating what they thought of as a criterion of event, uh, event identity. But maybe we should stick in um, uh, a modal operator at the beginning and, 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 and say that, uh, um, that, that necessarily um, um, the, the relevant criteria, criterion holds. Well, and what does the criterion say then, if we're thinking of, in terms of event identity? Well, it says that necessarily events are the same if, 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 um, um, if, if they have the same causes and effects. That what that tells us is that any event is the event which has the same causes and effects as it. It tells us that any event has that property. It gives us a necessary condition for being an event. We can spell it out in, in, in terms of two other conditions. We can say that it says that necessarily um, uh, one condition, um, if, an, if something is an event, it has trivially the same causes and effects in itself. It also tells us that if something is an event, then if anything is an event, uh, which has the same causes and effects as it, it is it. Uh, these are necessary conditions for being an event. They're necessary conditions for something being an event in any possible world if we've got the, the necessitation. So they tell us if you find an event in any world, um, it's been an event requires uh, that it satisfies certain properties, that it satisfies certain conditions. It doesn't tell us anything about counterfactual existence conditions for events, or as Ben said, identity across time for events. So we don't see that if that's the notion of a criterion identity we're employing here to explain the notion of the sort of, then we've got um, we, we've got a, a, the basis for a justification for the essence necessity link. Um, another standard um, under two there, and what I have in mind is the other standard example of a criterion identity. The forget familiar example used when he's explaining his criterion identity for numbers, uh, the, the identity of directions, the direction of line A is identical with the direction of line B, if and only if A is parallel to B, line A is parallel to line B. Well, what this is, is an implicit definition, of, because everything else in the, in the statement is known, of, of the functional expression, the direction of. And we can explain what a direction is by saying that direction is something which uh, is the direction of something. So we can there introduce in this way, by this implicit definition, the, 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 the um, um, uh, sort of term direction. Um, but uh, uh, again, the, the thought is that this, even if we state this 
uh, the necessita necessitation of this. Just because it's a de dicto statement, um, it doesn't uh, import anything about the, the necessary, uh, uh, about the, con the con conditions of counterfactual existence of the things in question directions. It doesn't tell us anything about the identity across possible worlds of directions. It doesn't therefore support the essence and necessity link. So these formulations of the notion of criteria of identity don't do the job. Uh, if we want to support the essence and necessity link by this notion uh, of a sorrowful. Uh, next slide, Ben. Right, well, the other familiar idea is that what sorrowful concepts do is that they provide, in the case of persistent things, is that they provide the uh, persistence conditions of those things or the criteria of identity over time. I prefer to say, they provide the persistence conditions rather than they provide the criteria identity of the time, because that's closer to, to what I think they actually uh, do. They tell us what changes uh, things of the kind can undergo and what changes they can't undergo. That's what a criteria identity, for example, if you're talking about personal identity and you're in, in, engaged in this debate, you, 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 you have a, what interests you is can persons have different bodies at different times? Can, can a person have a completely different psychology at different times? What changes can people undergo? So it's the idea of what changes are possible that's in question here. Now, the way I think we should think of this, I'll, I'll take an example again, to, and I will go through the, um, uh, these formulations here, but I'll take an example to illustrate them. Let's, let's suppose that a restaurant is a sort of concept. And then we may say that, well, look, um, one thing, a you can't have the same restaurant at different times, um, offering different cuisine. Uh, um, if, 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 you, if, if a building's taken over and the management decides to change it from a Thai restaurant to a, to a French restaurant, well, it's a different, it's not the same restaurant. The original restaurant has ceased to exist. So uh, it's a necessary condition of something being a restaurant, if it exists at two times, it provides the same uh, cuisine. Uh, and we might also wish to say, look, um, but there are lots of changes restaurants can go as long as certain conditions are satisfied. So if, 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 if something is a restaurant existing at one time and there's a restaurant existing at another time, it's the same restaurant so long as it provides the same uh, same cuisine. Perhaps it has some of the same staff. Perhaps there are some other conditions. And as long as that's so, it's the same restaurant. So we we in this way we specify conditions for being a restaurant, and in uh, conditions we take into account the kind of the kind of history uh, a restaurant can have. And in this way, we, we, we answer the question, what changes can restaurants undergo and what changes can they not? Which is what we're interested in. Well, we're interested in the preservation, uh, the, the uh, persistence conditions of restaurants. And we can spell this out in terms of two conditions. I call them passing away and preservation conditions. I actually think I got this terminology uh, from Penelope Mackey, so I should give credit here. Uh, I'll skip the third condition, the symphonic. So again, the thought is that here what we've got are necessitations of um, statements of necessary conditions of being a thing of the sort of kind. Uh, and these are de-dicto claims, and therefore we don't have here any, requirement, any requirements on the counterfactual existence of a thing of the type of the sort in question. And therefore, we don't have anything here supporting the essence necessity link. Okay, Ben, next. Good. Right. The third was the idea, the third concept, I think, in, uh, in our uh, idea of a sort, which is a sort was a particularly relevant to the identification of the singling out of things. Now, it seems in many cases you, you can single things out without mentioning the thoughtful because things may be in different places. So um, you, you can 
uh, pick them out by their places. And even when they're in the same place, uh, uh, maybe they, they differ in their pasts and futures, and therefore you can um, uh, single them out without um, um, referring to um, any sort of. But take the hard case. Suppose we can have uh, two things which are all time coincident in the same place at all times, uh, like the, the familiar example of the statue and the piece of clay. So here I've got in front of me two things a statue and a piece of clay. They're in the same place, they're indistinguishable. They always are going to be, um, and they always were. So how can I pick out the one? Well, it seems the obvious thing, thing to say is I pick out the statue by saying this statue, and that's how I pick it out. So maybe in this kind of context, we have to make reference to or employ uh, the sort of concept something falls under in order to pick it out. Okay, well, let's suppose that's true. So, and it may be that in every possible situation in which a thing is picked out, it can only be picked out by reference to a sort of concept it satisfies in that situation. It doesn't follow from that uh, that, uh, if, that in every situation in which something exists, it must be picked out by the same sort of concept. If, if, if Aristotle is, is a human being in this situation, maybe in, in, in certain contexts, the only way to pick, pick him out is to pick him out as a human being. But given that he might have been a centipede in another situation, why wouldn't that have been good enough for the way of picking him out in that situation? And I've given a couple of silly examples here to illustrate the general point. Um, uh, sorry. That was my time was going off. It's telling me I should stop, but I'll carry on just for a bit longer because Ben went a bit longer than I we expected. Um, so uh, again, we don't see that the role of sort of concepts in identifying reference um, entails that we have to accept if we explain explain the notion of essence via the notion of sort of concept uh, the essence. The essence necessity thing. Um, okay, Ben, do you want to go on to the next slide? Right. Um, okay. Um, so um, this is more or less our conclusion. I just want to add a little bit to what I say on this slide, and then it'll be the conclusion. So we don't see why we should accept the essence of necessity thing. And to repeat Ben's claim, we think neo Aristotelians owe us an account of essence that makes the link clear. Now, we've followed a route to understanding the notion of essence via the what is X question, which leads us to the notion of a, a, of a substance of ultimate sort of. And then we try to spell that out in a way that, that um, restricts the answers um, uh, to the what is X question, to what would be intuitively thought of as specifications of essential qualities, and appealing to these um, uh, spellings out of what the notion of a sovereign concept is, which, uh, uh, which I've outlined. We don't see how this provides justification for the essence necessity link. Now, um, just to finish off, the, the, uh, as Ben said, um, we're open to um, uh, um, suggestions here. And uh, one thing, a, a couple of questions, questions, several questions I have in mind is this. How, how have we gone wrong? Um, have we gone wrong in linking the notion of essence with the what is it, what is X question, or have we not understood the question in the appropriate way to uh, in order to link it to the notion of essence? Um, have we gone wrong in, in in following this route to the notion of uh, a sort or suggesting that the, we must we must introduce the notion of a sort or here? Um, 
Or is it that the various specifications um, I've considered of how to spell out the notion of Azorto inadequate and that a better way of spelling out the notion of Azorto which does support Dessa's necessity link? These are the, the various questions that um, uh, we were thinking might be answerable uh, and therefore our scepticism is genuinely a scepticism. Um, and I just want to add one final point uh, and finish on this. It does seem that the notion of a sort of does give us a respectable notion of essence. It does seem to give us an answer to the question, what is X? A way of answering the question, what is X? Which would be, it would be reasonable to say, uh, gives an answer to the question, what is the essence of X? Or what is, what is part of the essence of X? But I think it would be completely inappropriate in this in, in this philosophical climate and given the state of debate about this to, to say, well, yes, here is a notion of essence uh, which we can identify by this notion of thought. Well, it's, an, it's a notion of contingent essence. Um, essences can be contingent. I think that would be very misleading. So I don't think we should say that if in fact the um, this, this explanation about the notion of sort of doesn't lead us to a justification of the essence necessity link, then um, still we've identified um, a notion of, uh, of sort of. But I think we could say, for example, that the, there is a notion of temporal essence given by the persistence conditions of things. And the temporal essence uh, limits what, what something can become but it doesn't follow, it limits what something can be. And therefore we could ex express our skepticism in a different way, uh, maybe by saying, well, given that we've got this notion of temporal essence, why do we need the, the Neo-Aristotelian notion of essence? Okay, I will stop at that point. So I want to consider three areas which seem to be common to talk of as involving an Aristotelian revival. The first is talk of essences, especially real essence. The second is talk of powers and causation. And the third, which is the main one, is the concept of substance and sortal, as developed by, as I say, my former tutor, David Wiggins, in four books, Identity and Spatio-Temporal Continuity, Sameness and Substance, Sameness and Substance Revisited, and the uh, most recent one, which is um, Continuance, their activity, their being, and their identity. So first of all, essences. I'm not, there's not too much on the handout for this. There are three classical sources for talk of essences. One is Aristotle, one is Locke, and the third is the modern tradition represented by Putnam and Kripke. It's easiest to start with Locke. He distinguished between real and nominal essences, the latter are the standard verbal definitions. The former is the atomic constitution, the real essence, two features of which are salient in Locke. First, these are far beyond what we could ever discover, according to him. And second, Locke thinks that they are so remote that multiple realizability applies even to natural kinds, such as water or iron, etc which is to say that similar macroscopic effects could be produced by quite dissimilar real essences. So the real essence of something is not the real essence of a kind for Locke, but the unknowable constitution of an individual. It's this Latin agnosticism about real essence that the modern theory, thanks to chemistry and physics, abandons, giving discoverable a posteriori real essences to natural kinds. Where does Aristotle stand in relation to these more modern views? David Charles, in his 2000 book on that, thinks that the moderns are conventionalists, not realists, but that Aristotle is a realist about real essence. Actually, Aristotle does not, I think, make much of, if anything at all, of the nominal real distinction, not in a very formal way anyway. 
For reasons we shall see, but Charles has to admit, then rather ignore, that Kripke is not a conventionalist, though Putnam claims to be one. I'd hazard the opinion that this is just Putnam wanting to hang on to some of the spirit of his radical empiricist background, not a general feature of modern essentialism, which when it discusses the question of whether it's realist or conceptualist, um, probably is realist, though it's interesting that issue never came up in the last paper, whether essence belongs to our conception of things or, whether, or how far it belongs to the things themselves, which seems to me a very important uh, issue. The real difference, it seems to me, between Aristotle and the moderns is that, is that there is no real hidden essence, according to Aristotle. The elements are common things, earth, fire, air and water. And though the exact mixture that goes up to make different kinds of things may be complicated and difficult to find, that does not seem to have the interest that discovering that water is H2O has. Aristotle doesn't waste a lot of time on that, I don't think. It does not give you the same scientific control, unless, of course, you could make gold out of lead. The real essence for Aristotle is more like a philosophically rigorous nominal essence, discoverable a priori by analysis. More like some of the things Dave Chalmers says about what could be proved a priori with rigor. So the modern notion of a real essence is a combination of the anti-Aristotelian atomist theory of matter, Locke's distinction between real and nominal essence, and the achievements of modern science, none of which seems to owe anything to Aristotle beyond the adoption of the Latinized version of his jargon term. That's all I want to say about that. Aristotle and the modern conception concerned with powers. I shall be even briefer here because I think Anna Mamadoro has already said it, namely that Aristotle's dunamis is more or less the opposite of the modern sense of powers, being receptive and passive. This is an ambiguity that runs through cognate English words like passion, potentiality, signifying either passivity or dynamism. Causal powers are solely about the active, though disposition, for example, fragility, can be either. In case one might think that the positive sense goes with energia, the transfer of one form to another is not terribly like quantifiable force or energy in modern science. Power in the modern in science is of course found in Locke, not to mention Voskovich later, and in the non-human human understanding of force, field or energy, which is surely what most scientists take for granted. I wouldn't have thought they were naturally humans, most of them. This leads to the morale, the moral, oh, sorry, of these two brief sections. The introduction to the program of this conference assumes that anything non-human is down to Aristotle. Modern philosophy is not primarily, has not primarily been radical empiricist, and Hume and semi-positivism are outliers, though very important ones. Standard forms of modern realism are neither Humean nor Aristotelian. Now for something more or less completely different. Substances and sortals. The Aristotelian tradition anchors the concept of substance, at least in nature, primarily to instances of species of natural objects. The kant strawson tradition ties it to those enduring bodies, the individuation of which gives sense and structure to our spatio-temporal framework. David Wiggins, in the four works I mentioned, has made a sustained attempt to prove that these two objectives necessarily go together. And to give what you might call a transcendental proof of the Aristotelian notion of substance even including its bias towards the biological, making that central to our practice of individuating objects and therefore holding the world together. Wiggins assumes that individuating a temporally enduring object involves being able to re-identify it at different times. 
Now, how do I get this to go down? Um, how do I get this move to move down? Can anybody tell me? Now, where is it? Let me move everybody along a bit. Ah, that just appeared. Yes, I was, it was code up. Sorry. All right. Wiggins assumes that individuating a temporally enduring object involves being able to re-identify re it at different times and under different descriptions. This assumption makes it possible to state substance individuation using the language of identity. Within the scope of this assumption, he makes two claims. The first is the sortal relativity of identity. That is, when any A and B are asserted to be the same thing, they must be the same something or other, and the something or other must be the kind of concept that answers what is it questions. In other words, there is no such thing as a bare identity, identity under no concept at all. Furthermore, the relevant concept must be an Aristotelian substance concept or sortal. Sortal, of course, I think is a Lockean phrase again. More formally, this can be expressed as follows. And now you have it here. If A is identical to B, then two things follow. There is a sortal F such that A is an F, B is an F, and A is the same F as B. The second thing that follows is that if the object picked out by A also falls under another sortal G, then so will the object picked out by B, and it will be the same G as A. This is represented as an application of Leibniz's law, for if A is the same G as A, as it must be, then as A is identical to B, B must be the same G as A. And then you get the little formal proof of that. The conclusion is striking because it is a denial that A and B might be identical under one form of identification and not under another. In fact, it implies that every individual object, individuable object, falls under just one ultimate sortal. Uh, Wiggins admit this, it admits this in his 2001 book. For every ultimate sortal has its own principle of individuation, and if any object fell under more than one, there could be a time at which it satisfied the criteria for one and not for the other. Wiggins's thesis is very, a very strong claim, apparently backed up by a powerful argument. It's a strong claim for it purports to prove that any world with individual objects must be constituted by Aristotelian substances. And the argument is powerful because it follows by simple logic granted seemingly plausible claims about identity and Leibniz's law. We can see that there's a parallel here with Tim Williamson on vagueness, which Wiggins himself picks up in his later works, namely radical consequences if you want to preserve two-value logic. On the other hand, there seem to be many cases of objects which can be identified under a variety of concepts leading to different life histories. This is termed relativity of identity. For example, A and B may be the same person, but not the same child, because B is grown up and no longer a child. Or A and B may be the same lump of clay, but not the same statue, uh, because B is a lump after it has been reshaped out of its statue shape. 
These are the most typical kinds of counterexamples, and Wiggins has responses to both. He deals with the first by invoking the concept of a face sortle. A face sortle is one that, by its meaning, denotes part of the life history of something, which as a whole is denoted by another sortle. So child is a phase sortle that applies to a phase of the things fully de designated by human being. This illuminates an important aspect of the concept of a sortle. It's a necessary condition for F's being an ultimate sortle that whenever it applies to something, it applies in a present tensed manner to the thing through the whole of its existence. The statue and the lump of clay are dealt with by denying that the lump and the statue are identical. The lump of clay constitutes the statue, but is not identical with it. Notice that he could have argued that the statue was just a phase of the lump, but he doesn't do so because statue is not, by its very meaning, a phase sortal. Statue, unlike child, does not indicate that by meaning, but by its meaning, a period in the existence of something. I'm not going too fast, am I, or too slow, or to anything in the way that I'm speaking. Is it all right? Yeah. So Wiggins deals with objections mainly by two distinctions. One is between sortals that apply to objects through the whole of their existence and sortals appropriate only to a phase of their existence. The other is between the is of identity and the is of constitution. Correspondingly, criticisms center on whether the concepts under which we pick things out behave in as regimented a way as Wiggins requires, and on whether the is of constitution is sufficiently different from the is of identity to perform the task he wants. So the discipline of subtle identification. I'm just doing that. There are certain kinds of counterexample that Wiggins does not discuss in print. There might, for example, be a sword stick which has its blade removed and the inside of the cane filled with resin so that it ceases to be a sword but remains the same walking stick. Walking stick and sword are perfectly good concepts for picking out objects if any artifactual terms are. And on pain of excessive artificiality, a sword stick is both a sword and a walking stick. This kind of example does appear to occur, does not appear to occur, sorry, among natural objects, but as a sword stick is a perfectly good re-identifiable object, this fact about natural objects would seem to be a contingent truth about them. Of course, perhaps it is not an accident that nature works that way, but neither is it a conceptual requirement. Wiggins' original proof was a priori, and it should allow no exceptions. Wiggins' response to this example, this is an impersonal communication, is that the sword stick ceases to exist when it loses its ability to function as a sword and is replaced by a walking stick. Well, this response is too is ad hoc. It implies that the principle that if anything is both an F and a G, where F and G are normally ordinary sortals, then it's really an FG and ceases to exist if it loses either its F or its G features and is replaced by something that has either just an F or just a G. Yeah, no, no. One possible way out of this kind of case is to say that the sword is a phase of the walking stick, thereby introducing ad hoc phase sortles. By the expression ad hoc phase sortle, I mean a sortle that can be used sometimes as a phase sortle, designating an object only through part of its existence, and sometimes as an ultimate sortle, designating an object through the whole of its existence. Of course, even a normal phase sortle might contingently, in a given instance, designate an object through the whole of its existence. One might say that the phase sortle baby could designate something through the whole of its existence if, for example, a human baby died at the age of six months and never got beyond the babyhood. But it remains the case that by dint of the meaning of the term baby, it's a phase of a human being. And even when 
a particular creature fails to get beyond that phase, it's still so. A sword is not, however, in virtue of the meaning of the word sword, a phase of anything. And to use the term to name a phase of something in a given case when it suits is ad hoc. Yeah. Mm. More importantly, that there are no ad hoc sortals is essential to the significance of the formal proof that there is no such thing as relative identity. In logic and in the application of Leibniz's law, A is F is normally equivalent to A was, is, or will be F. Otherwise, the law would not apply to such accidental properties as is brown or is sitting. This is also the way phase sortals work. A human being is, was, or will be a baby. The argument against relative identity works by arguing that if one allows relative identity, a contradiction would follow, namely that one would be would get a situation in which A is G, A is identical to B, and B is not G. And this is a contradiction. Where are we now? For this to be a contradiction, is G must be univocal in both cases as either was or will or was, is or will be G, or is at all times G. For there is no inconsistency in A is, was or will be G, A is identical to B, and B is not at all times G. But if whenever a contradiction is generated, one deems one of the sortals to be a face sortal, and so to fall under the is, was or will be rubric, and the other to be the ultimate sortal, which applies at all times, no contradiction will ever arise. Another possible line is that a sword stick is not one object, but two objects that share some of their matter. This introduces a category of what one might call Siamese objects. It can be argued, however, that, this, that allowing this kind of entity undermines Wiggins's opposition to those like heirs, who think that the concept for re-identifying objects is, or often is, something more generic than sortal concepts, something more akin to material body. To see how this may come about, we must consider the rationale for Ayer's theory. The fact that sortals do not seem to follow the discipline that Wiggins wishes for them might be taken to support the view that substances can be individuated under much more generic notions, such as same body or same material thing, as 1991 A, for example. On this view, material cohesion is what picks out paradigmatic physical things. Wiggins regards these ideas as too generic to be adequate on their own. Such a concept cannot be understood, he says, quote, except as a determinable that has dog, horse, bull, ball, etc among its determinations. As on the other hand, thinks that Wiggins takes the notion of body too loosely, because Wiggins I classifies as lump mass terms, everything from bars of soap and pats of butter to pools of water and pots of stew. Wiggins, in other words, does not take seriously enough the cohesion of real bodies, conflating them too easily with looser masses of matter. One natural thought is that we can re-identify middle-sized physical objects that have fairly stable properties, irrespective of whether there is any interesting sortal terms under which they fall. This is not to say that they could be re-identified under the purely generic notion, body or physical things, if there is no continuity of manifest properties. This may be a powerful criticism of Wiggins's view, that this may be a powerful criticism of Wiggins's view can be seen by considering the notion of a Siamese object, which seems to be necessary to answer the kind of problem posed by the sword stick. The physical mass that houses both the sword and the walking stick can be identified independently of either. If this were not the case, it's difficult to see how one could even make the mistake of thinking 
of it as one thing. The composite Siamese entities form are quite identifiable, yet that entity is not supposed to fall under a sort in its own right. The ontological status of complex bodies and masses of matter in Locke's phrase is an issue very much under dispute, in which you return to it. So the is of constitution. A statue and a lump of clay occupy the same place at a given time. What is their relation to each other? The apparent options are, one, they are identical, and two, they are not identical, but the clay constitutes the statue. The first one appears to be ruled out because they have different identity conditions. The second has seemed to many philosophers to be the natural solution to the problem, but it too faces difficulties. First, it, it has the intuitive disadvantage that it allocates two solid physical objects to the same place. Each of them weighs, say, 10 pounds, yet the total of their weight is only 10 pounds. It might seem natural to think, and it was formerly a well-established maxim, that there can be only one solid physical thing at one place at a given time. So while impressed by the idea that two bodies cannot be in the same place at the same time, might think it more natural to say that there are two different ways of conceptualizing the material presence at that point than that there are two material things. That, that way, it is easy to see why two 10 pound objects need not add up to 20 pounds when put together. They're just different forms of conceptualizing, one of which may be held to be ontologically more fundamental, though not necessarily the more interesting. Second, the language of constitution is more natural if the situation is described in some ways rather than others. It's natural to say that the statue is made of clay It is natural to say that the statue is made of clay or even from a piece of clay. But suppose one characterizes the clay more exactly in terms of the particular atoms in a particular arrangement. Strictly on modal grounds, this structured collection and the statue are different. The statue could have been made of a collection of atoms with at least some different members. But the entity defined as containing just those atoms could not. This entity, atoms A1 to AN, in a given special, spatial arrangement, S, is not a very natural kind of object, but it's a real body, in a way that something arbitrarily composed of, for example, half of this desk and two toes from President Bush's left foot, is not. This collection of atoms in this structure is what investigation would show to be really there. Though it is natural to say that the statue is constituted by the atoms, it's less natural to say that the atoms and the structure taken together are what it is made from. Rather, it might seem natural to say that it's what it is, even though it could have been made from somewhat different atoms. To use the Aristotelian terminology, there is strong pressure to say that the atoms and structure together are matter and form, and hence are the complete individual. But it didn't have to be just those atoms. All these issues are very controversial, and different philosophers have different intuitions. But if one were to conclude that the statue and the lump are neither identical, nor stand in the constitution relation, what else could one say? One strategy is to take the notion of body or material object as basic, ontologically, and the other levels as different forms of conceptualization. So, a possible reconciliation of the Wiggins in lines and the Ayers line. As we saw above, for Wiggins, the concept body is always generic, never sufficient in its own right to sustain identification, needing to be filled out by appeal to a more determinate sortal, such as dog or table. Call this sortalism. For Ayers, on the other hand, 
the, the notion of a coherent unified body or material object is the basic notion for individuating objects and is presupposed by sortal concepts. It is only insofar as dogs and tables are unified bodies that these notions can be used to individuate objects. Call this somatism. Although Van Inwagen's position is different from both, his reason for thinking that the concept of a complex body is of its own an inadequate concept are consistent with Wiggins's claim that the idea is too determinable to function in its own right. How I, yeah, I should have cut that out. How might we choose between sortalism and somatism? The dispute between them can seem difficult to pin down. Perhaps an irenic compromise is possible. Metaphysically, this compromise favors the somatist, but seems to give the sortalist much that he could want. Though not quite in the way that Wiggins wants it. The principle of the compromise is that Wiggins' formal argument is correct, and hence it is necessarily true that relative identity is not possible. But it is only a contingent truth that the terms that can substitute for F in his formal proof are generally, but not always, sortals of an Aristotelian kind. Anything can be substituted for F that picks out the object as, an, as a unified body. Take Wiggins' formula, A is, a is uh, uh, the same F as B, where it is assumed that the F is a material object, not God or a spirit. The following theses might plausibly be maintained. <clears throat> One, for any identifiable and re-identifiable object, there must be some predicate F that applies to it in a present tense manner through the whole of its existence, and that by its meaning picks, out, picks the object out as a unified physical whole. Two, all natural ultimate sortals designate unified physical bodies in the manner presented in one, and so are very suitable for substitution for F. It is logically possible, however, that this might not have been so, there might logically have been natural sortals that work like sword stick. But that they do follow this model and are not like sword stick is a pretty deep fact about our world and about any world with similar laws of nature to those that hold in our world. Three, artifactual sortals generally designate distinct unified bodies, as do sword and walking stick in the ordinary cases, though exceptions, as in sword stick, are more common and less fantastic than in the natural cases. Four, there are acceptable substitutions for F that would not normally be classified as sortals, but using concepts such as <coughs> piece or hunk or lump of stuff. In at least some of these cases, there is no sortal available of any obvious kind. And five, unified body could always do the job of it because other more specific terms work just because the things they designate are unified bodies. On its own, same body is just not very explanatory. The account given in these five points has the advantage that it's compatible with the fact that most identities involved re-identification involving it are categorizable under sortals, but there are other cases, such as piece of, hunk of, where this is not so. It also avoids the need to employ the ears of constitution to link sortals and particulars. <coughs> like lumps and hunks, rather than just mass terms such as clay or gold. The case where the lump and the sortal individuated objects do not coincide applies only to some problematic artifactual cases. <coughs> now, Wiggins and the classical two-valued logic with identity. <laughs> I referred above to the similarity with Tim Williamson on vagueness. And indeed, <clears throat> um, Wiggins does show his commitment to the same view on vagueness as a result of his own theory. In his 1996, in the Feshtry <clears throat> replying to Williamson, Wiggins concedes 
that he'd previously been an absolutist about identity, but not about difference. And that Williamson had just proved that these two could not be separated. <clears throat> Furthermore, when discussing the ship of Theseus, I think in the 2000, yeah, 2016, sorry the way that's come out, I don't know why that happened. Uh, will the mariners and the priests conception of the 30 or ship really suffice for them to say which addition or subtraction of a plank or spa marks the ship's very last moment? I am committed to saying yes. The question might have angered the relevant authorities. They might have objected being put on their metal to answer it. But the idea that it lay within their competence to give a ruling on the matter amounts a little more than we agreed to when, having already embraced the proof of the determinacy of identity, we embraced the quasi-constructivist model of artifact individuation. Priests and mariners could make a mistake about the moment when the ship ceased to exist, but such a mistake could only be demonstrated, I suggest, by reference to their conception or some going improvement of that. In other words, there is a fact about which plank loss changes the ship's identity. <clears throat> According to Wiggins. And therefore, he's entirely on uh, Williamson's side on the issue of identity, of, of vagueness. The issue of how to preserve two valued logic without following what I, seems to be this bizarre line on vagueness is something I argued about in an Aristotelian society paper in 2009. And in part two of a 2016 book. A similar approach, as I tried then, will explain how to avoid Wiggins' proof of his theory from pure logic. In brief, my approach to vagueness was as follows. Like many others, I regard vagueness as a feature of concept, not of reality. So if some concept suffers from vagueness, it cannot be a way of characterizing a feature of the world that one regards as ontologically fundamental. <clears throat> In fact, I gave there two criteria for deciding whether a feature of one's discourse counts as realist or merely conceptualist. One is whether it is subject to sorites involving vagueness, and the other is whether the putative entities in question make a causal and not merely explanatory difference. In a purely physical realm, this, this means, does it contribute to the location and motion of matter? By this latter criterion, sometimes called the Eleatic standard, if the world or part of it is closed under physics, only the fundamental physical level is real in the strong sense, the rest is conceptual, or as David Armstrong puts it, its supposed properties are just predicates, not real universals. Present purposes, the main issue is whether Aristotelian substances are plagued by vagueness. In a sense, I've just answered this above, on the whole, natural or biological substances are not, and artifacts are liable to be. But this is not enough to explain the way Wiggins' theory rests on pure logic for then there should be no exceptions to his criterion of re-identification uh, requiring his discipline. A solution to this requires a closer look at the relation of logic, natural language, and metaphysics. Williamson's position could be expressed as follows. If we are to preserve classical two-valued logic, there can be no indeterminacy about whether some X is actually F. Vagueless can only be an epistemic phenomenon. Williamson is not actually a realist, though, about whether things are mountains and hills. It depends on the use, whether, whether they are or not, depends on the use, the way, the way the word's used. It's not a fact about the world out there, whether they're really mountains or hills. It's a function of the discourse in question, um, which is, I don't know that's often observed as much as it should be. So perhaps in Manchester, what counts as a mountain is going to be different from what counts in York. Um, it's not what, about whether it's really a mountain or not. But anyway, Wiggins' position is very similar, applied to sortals and not just properties. If we are to preserve two value classical logic with identity, then if sortal concepts apply to things in the world, as they must, 
an absolutely determinate identity under one sort will must apply to every object. And this is an Aristotelian theory of substance formally demonstrated. I argued against Williamson in these other places that this rested on a false theory of the relation between language and logic. I think that Wiggins has the same problem. They both suffer from assuming what I called a logical unity of language. This is very common among people who approach metaphysical and philosophical questions from the point of view of a rather formal notion of philosophy of language or logic. The logical unity of language, one, a consistency condition, that all true propositions expressed in a natural language must be consistent with each other, and two, the formality condition, that the relations between all propositions be defined exp defi definitely expressible in some formal canonical way, for example, in classical logic, or perhaps in some more elaborate, but still equally formal system. It follows from this that if there were non-epistemic vagueness, and if two valued logic were correct, then in the case of vague predicate, the law of excluded middle would be breached. In fact, what happens is that if vagueness of a concept becomes salient, you drop that concept and move to a more exact way of description. Is Snowden a mountain or a hill? Sorry, that should have been turned this down. Well, it's 1,085 meters. Not quite sure how many feet that is. You can call it a mountain or a hill as you wish. While you're using a discourse, you stick to standard logic. And where it doesn't work, you change the discourse, not the logic. Just as if you want to know how many objects there are on the table, you decide what counts as one object. You don't try to devise a fuzzy arithmetic that works however you individuate them. All one needs to preserve classical logic is, one, the logical unity of the basic ontology, but at the level of one's fundamental ontology, there must be a characterization of what there, of what there is, which is free of inconsistency and can be regimented according to some canonical form. Thus, the logical unity principle is applied not to the whole body of truth expressed in the natural language, but to one's picture of how the world fundamentally is. There's also the principle of the competence of logic. All deductively valid influences can be captured in a formalizable logic, hopefully in the classical two-valued one. But that's not about the nature of language and how all the bits in ordinary language are held together. That's a complete red herring. Um, and the harmonization requirement that all ontologically non-basic ways of characterizing the world can be re related to the basic or to some more basic and ultimately to the basic ontology in a way that makes it intuitively clear that and how the basic ontology legitimizes and subsanes the rest. Feet above sea level ex explains roughly how we can get away with talking about mountains and hills. So if we allow that natural sortals are part of our fundamental ontology, then what Wiggins says will be true of them, but not of everything that can be picked out and re-identified as a particular object. Last remarks. What does it mean to say that something is part of the fundamental ontology or is real only in a conceptualist sense? There are two fundamentally different senses of fundamental. One, the epistemologically fundamental, We are bound to see things in these terms initially, then either we can ditch them later, eliminativism, or we always need to deploy these ideas whilst recognizing them not to be ontologically fundamental, instrumentalism. Physical objects uh, by the ordinary source are certainly um, at least that. Ontologically fundamental, ones that are what's there ultimately, irrespective of what kind of conceptualization we apply. Aristotelian substances are meant to be ontologically fundamental, not just essential features of our scheme of things, given our perspectives. Wiggins does not prove that. Indeed, my argument suggests the opposite. I've not had time to discuss, but he specifically rejects also, this is another issue, Aristotle's invocation of teleology in his account of substance. And there is nothing connected with the ontology of substantial forms in what he has to say, which are essential for hylomorphism. So I think the invocation of Aristotle in Wiggins' case is somewhat ritualistic, probably because he did great. Okay.
So thank you. I'm very glad to be here. And it was fortunate that I get to follow John because uh, this will touch on a lot of the issues he touched on. I originally hoped to do something bigger picture like John did, say something about Aquinas' views about persistence in general and focusing on the case of motion in particular, but his views about the metaphysics of motion were hard enough that uh, I'm still just trying to keep it together. Um, I put a handout in that folder, which if you wanna follow along at your own leisure, you can do that, but I'm also gonna try to share my screen and then just follow along on the handout that I have. Can you see that okay? Okay, good. Okay, so motion occupies a central place in Aquinas's thought. This is not perhaps surprising, given that Aquinas takes the study of motion to be part of the very subject matter of natural philosophy. Despite the importance of motion for Aquinas, his views about its precise nature, as well as the broader metaphysical framework in which he develops, such views remains obscure. And I've put under A on the handout, some of the features of his view that make it difficult for us. Basically motion is a specific, it's, it's less broad than change, but broader than locomotion. It involves all these dark Aristotelian doctrines, act, potency, actuality of potency insofar as it's in potentiality, uh, successive versus permanent beings and so on. What I wanna do in the paper is offer, or in this talk is offer an interpretation of Aquinas' views about motion that not only highlights their general philosophical interest, but also clarifies the metaphysical framework of which they're a part, including all these things I just mentioned. Aquinas' views about change, how the morphism, potency and act, the distinction between successive and permanent beings. I've indicated there a little plan for the paper. I'm gonna start off talking about Aquinas' metaphysics of change in general, and then turn to motion in particular, and then try to draw out the distinctive metaphysical conception of motion that emerges. Okay, so starting with change in general. Aquinas' views about motion are so closely connected to his views about change that it's not always clear how to disentangle them. Part of the difficulty owes to a feature of standard English translations. Motus is one of several of Aquinas' Latin terms that are often rendered into English as change by commentators. And it's not always clear to me at least what commentators have in mind by this term change. But part of the difficulty also owes to a flexibility in Aquinas' own Latin. In some contexts, Aquinas uses the term motus, as well as a couple of other terms, mutatio and generatio, in a broad sense to cover any sort of change. Whereas in other contexts, he uses these same terms in a narrower sense to mark one of two different species of change, with motus corresponding to gradual changes or successive changes, and mutationes or generationes as corresponding to instantaneous changes. So as to avoid confusion, I will hereafter use change as an English translation only for occurrences of these terms in the broad sense. And I'll use the corresponding transliterations, motion, mutation, and generation only for occurrences of the same terms in the narrow sense. And I've put a little table there um, to try to uh, uh, make clear how I'm gonna be doing that. Okay, so change in hylomorphism. Aquinas often describes, describes change in the broad sense in hylomorphic terms. That is in terms of some matter or Greek hule taking on contrary or incompatible forms, the Greek morphe, and thereby success, successively becoming part of distinct hylomorphic compounds. Although the terminology is somewhat technical, the phenomenon that Aquinas is using it to describe, change in general, is utterly familiar. To mention just one of Aquinas' favorite examples, which will feature prominently in what follows, consider some water that's heated over a fire in such a way that it starts off existing in one state, that of being cold, and ends up existing in another state, that of being hot. In this particular example, Aquinas identifies the matter of change with water, the contrary incompatible forms with different temperatures, and the compounds with different states in which the water exists at different times but he thinks the same sort of analysis will apply to changes of any sort, or at least any intrinsic changes. Indeed, as Aquinas sees it, this analysis follows from the very concept of change. And I've, I've included a bunch of texts on the handout, but I won't read them, but you can see this if you look at text T1 under C. 
Elsewhere, I have argued that the central elements of Aquinas' hylomorphism, matter, form, and compound, can be understood in terms of three types of entity familiar from contemporary metaphysics, namely substratum, property, and complexes of each. Uh, and here I've got a little, little thing on the handout to indicate that. On this understanding of Aquinas' hylomorphism, we can state his account of change, at least to a first approximation, as I have at um, D on the handout. I've mentioned four conditions. It's a bit technical, but if you look at that little chart, you can kind of see how it goes. You get some matter in a prior state, same matter in a, a posterior state, but having different forms. And so you get different compounds. Okay, so far my discussion of Aquinas' views about change hasn't made any reference to potentiality or actuality. And yet in many contexts, Aquinas insists that change not only requires potentiality, but consists in its actualization. In order to see how Aquinas' views about potentiality and actuality figure into what we've already seen of his views about change, we must return to his understanding of matter forming compound, for just as he uses these notions to explain change, so too he uses the notions of potentiality and actuality in turn to explain matter, form, and compound. Um, and here I would direct you to the text T3 under E where he closely connects matter to potentiality and form to actuality. In this passage, Aquinas tells us, uh, as I just said, matter can be explained in terms of potentiality, but form can be explained in terms of actuality. Although commentators generally recognize that matter and form are closely connected to potentiality and actuality, I think the precise nature of their connection is not always fully appreciated. Indeed, commentators often speak as if matter could be straightforwardly identified with potentiality in the same way that form can be straightforwardly identified with actuality. But that's a mistake, I think. For as the passage uh, that I just referred to you suggests, Aquinas identifies matter not with potentiality as such, but rather with something that exists in potentiality, that is, with a substratum that possesses a potentiality. But if that's right, there's an important difference between matter and form one which Aquinas himself is often at pains to emphasize. You can see that if you look at T4. As Aquinas makes clear in T4, um, in order to see how potentiality and actuality are connected to matter and form, we must appreciate that the latter two notions are correlative not only to each other, but also to the notion of a compound. Indeed, once we bring compounds into the picture, we can spell out the precise connection of potentiality and actuality to his hylomorphism as follows. So matter turns out not just to be a substratum, but something that exists in potentiality in some respect. Form is an actuality, namely one by which the potentiality of matter can be actualized, and a compound is something that exists in actuality in some respect. If we return to Aquinas' views about change, with all of this in mind, I think we can see that his talk of potentiality and actuality is meant to capture a feature of our intuitive conception of change that I've been ignoring until now. Intuitively, change doesn't merely require something to exist in different states at different times. It also requires that the states in question are ordered in a certain way. Change, we might say, has a directionality. It goes from one state to another in such a way that the latter results from the former. Aquinas, Aquinas captures this directionality by describing the terminus a quo of change as a state of potentiality, the terminus ad quem as a state of actuality and the ordering between them as the actualization of a potentiality. If we want to bring out um, what all of this adds to Aquinas' purely hylomorphic description of change, we can return to our initial statement of his account and revise it as I have here at F on the handout. And the uh, bold text is meant to indicate changes. And again, if you look at the uh, little diagram, you can see the difference. We not only have um, matter in different states at different times, but one's a state of a potentiality, one's a state of actuality. The dotted arrow is meant to indicate the direction of the potentiality, and then the solid arrow, its actualization. Okay. So if what I've said so far is correct, Aquinas' writings present us with two different ways of describing change. On the one hand, there's a hylomorphic description. 
This corresponds to our initial statement of Aquinas's account and characterizes change solely in terms of matter, form, and compounds. On the other hand, there's an act potency description. This corresponds to our revised statement of Aquinas' account and characterizes change in terms of the actualization of potentiality. Now, as I noted earlier, Aquinas' hylomorphic description appears to commit us to three main types of entity, substrata, properties, and complexes of each. But as we can now see, his act potency description seems to commit him to two more types, potentialities and their actualizations. For in the context of the act potency description, matter is understood not merely as a substratum or even as a substratum for form, but rather as a substratum for potentiality. <clears throat> Likewise, in the same context, forms are understood not merely as properties or even as properties that make substrate to be actual in some respect, but rather as properties by which the potentiality of matter can be actualized. <clears throat> of course, all of this leaves us with an unresolved issue as the table, uh, as table two is meant to suggest. How exactly are we to understand potentialities and their actualizations? What sorts of entities are they? In what follows, I provide answers to these questions, arguing that potentialities are best understood as powers of a distinctive type, whereas their actualizations are best understood as manifestations of the relevant type of powers. Okay, so metaphysics of potentiality. <clears throat> Aquinas sometimes understands potentiality in a broad sense to cover any sort of possibility. But in the context of change, he always understands it in a narrower sense to cover what we might call natural capacities. That is capacities of the sort that creative substances have for accidents, that certain animals have for sight, and that water has for a certain range of temperatures, say zero to 100 degrees Celsius. As each of these examples is intended to suggest, there's more to natural capacity than mere possibility. <clears throat> It's not merely possible for created substances to possess accidents or for certain animals to possess sight. It's contrary to the natures of such things, or it's contrary to the nature of each to lack such things. Likewise, it's not merely possible for water to possess temperatures within a certain range. It's contrary to its nature to lack some temperature within that same range. What's contrary to a thing's nature is often impossible, but not always. Even if water can't exist without possessing some temperature or other, animals can be blind. What I'm calling natural capacities can be understood as powers of a certain type. Indeed, I think the identification of potentiality with powers, as the latter are often conceived by contemporary metaphysicians, is an interpretively fruitful one. For it serves to highlight two features of potentiality that are especially important to Aquinas. For just as metaphysicians nowadays think of powers as entities that are both capable of being manifested, as well as being directed toward some specific type of manifestation, so too, Aquinas thinks of potentialities as capable of being actualized, as well as directed toward some specific type of actuality. <clears throat> What's more, the identification of potentialities with powers enables us to explain something that might otherwise seem puzzling, namely Aquinas's distinction between active and passive potentialities. This is a distinction that Aquinas habitually appeals to, depending on whether potentialities are potentialities for producing or for receiving some type of actuality. On the potentialities as powers interpretation, this distinction makes perfect sense. It merely highlights two different ways in which a power can be directed at its manifestation. <clears throat> as should be clear, moreover, it's only potentialities of the passive type that will concern us here, since it's only matters, matters power to receive some type of form that is relevant for understanding its potentiality for change. <clears throat> Although the identification of potentialities with powers goes some distance towards clarifying Aquinas' understanding of potentiality, there's still a question about how exactly they fit into his overall metaphysics of change. Some contemporary metaphysicians conceive of powers as primitive or su a sui generis type of property, but this is not how Aquinas thinks of them, at least when it comes to passive powers. Indeed, in the case of passive powers, I think it's clear that Aquinas takes them to be nothing over and above the possession of forms by matter. In short, on the interpretation I'm advancing, the potentialities involved in change are best understood for Aquinas' passive powers, where such powers are in turn 
best understood as entities that consist in the possession of ordinary properties by substrata. Thus, if some water has the power to become hot, this is to be explained in terms of the waters possessing some temperature, say coldness or warmth. Likewise, if water possesses such a temperature, it will thereby have a passive power, say the power to be warm or hot. <clears throat> As the disjunctive nature of these examples suggests, on Aquinas's metaphysics of change, it's possible for a single type of power um, to be explained in terms of the possession of different properties. Some water can have the power to be hot in virtue of being either cold or warm. We might express this point by saying that passive powers for Aquinas are multiply realizable. That is, a single type of power can be explained in terms of the possession of different types of property. <clears throat> Likewise, on Aquinas's metaphysics of change, it's possible for the possession of a single property to explain a passive power for receiving different types of actuality. In virtue of some waters being cold, it can have the power to be both warm and hot. We might express this point by saying that passive powers for Aquinas are not merely multiply realizable, but also multi-track. That is, a power derived from a single property can be a power for receiving different types of actuality. <clears throat> okay, so much for Aquinas' metaphysics of potentiality. <clears throat> what about his metaphysics of actualization? This is an issue whose resolution turns out to be crucial for understanding Aquinas' views about motion. <clears throat> and here I want to defend three main claims, what I call C1, C2, and C3. First, actualization is power manifestation. Second, actualization involves more than temporal succession of states of potentiality and actuality. And finally, actualization is a specific type of dependency. <clears throat> so let me briefly consider what can be said on behalf of each of these claims, beginning with claim one. This claim is intended to be a straightforward consequence of the identification of potentialities with powers. For insofar as potentialities are powers, it's hard to see how their actualizations could be understood as anything other than power manifestations. <clears throat> Even if we accept C1, there's still a question about what sort of entity manifestations are. Initially, it might be tempting to think that power manifestations just consist in nothing more than the succession of states of potentiality and actuality. It seems clear that there could be <clears throat> states of potentiality that are never actualized. For example, if there's some cold water that's never heated. Likewise, it seems clear that there could be states of actuality that are not actualizations of any prior states of potentiality. Say if God creates some hot water ex nihilo. <clears throat> but could there be some water that is cold at one time, hot at a later time, and yet the water state at the later time fails to actualize the water's potentiality for heat at the prior time? As it happens, the answer is yes for Aquinas. And to see why, consider what I call uh, an illust this illustrative scenario. So some water that is cold at time T1 is heated over a fire until it's hot at T2, then it's allowed to cool until it's warm at T3, and then it's heated again over the fire until it's hot at T4. In this scenario, we have some water that's in a state of potentiality for being hot at one time T1, which is temporally succeeded by that same water's being in a state of actuality for being hot at two subsequent times, namely T2 and T4. And yet intuitively, it seems clear that the water state of actuality um, at T2 is the only one that can be said to actualize its state of potentiality at T1. Indeed, the water state of actuality at T4 would seem to actualize the water state of potentiality at T3 rather than T1. But of course, if that's right, then a state of actuality can temporally succeed a corresponding state of potentiality without thereby actual, actualizing it. <clears throat> Suppose we accept C2 and hence deny that actualization can be, in, can be identified with temporal succession of states of potentiality and actuality. What then should we identify it with? The correct answer I say for Aquinas is a specific type of existential dependency. To see this, consider again the different states of water in our scenario. The reason why it seems clear that the water state of actuality at T1 is the only one that can be said to actualize its state of potentiality at T1 is because it's the only one that directly results from it. And this is apparently just to say 
that the only state of actuality after T1 that depends for its existence on the water's potentiality at T1 is the water state of actuality at T2. The water state of actuality at T4 also depends for its existence on a prior state of potentiality, but it's the one that exists at T3 rather than T1. In short, I think what actualization adds to a temporal succession of states of potentiality and actuality for Aquinas is a specific type of existential dependency. More precisely, a state of actuality actualizes a state of potentiality if and only if it depends for its existence on the latter. And I'm thinking here roughly in the way that an effect depends on an efficient cause. <clears throat> For lack of a better term, I'll continue to refer to this specific type of dependency as resultancy, and hence speak of states of actuality as resulting from states of potentiality that they actualize, and of states of potentiality as resulting in the states of actuality that depend on and hence actualize them. Okay, we're now finally in a position to turn to Aquinas's account of motion. <clears throat> So Aquinas presents his most detailed and developed account of motion as a comprehensive gloss on Aristotle's famous definition of motion in physics 3.1. I uh, put that at T5. Motion is the actuality of what's in potentiality insofar as it's in potentiality. A very straightforward claim. <clears throat> and then... Um, for ease of reference, I'm going to refer to the passage, which is this big gloss as passage A, and I've numbered its lines. I'm not going to go through this in detail. I'm just going to tell you what I think it says. <laughs> so there's a lot going on in this passage, um, but I think its overall structure is fairly clear. In the first paragraph, Aquinas introduces the notion that he takes to be essential for understanding motion, uh, namely that of an incomplete or a partial actuality. In the second paragraph, he clarifies this same notion using his water example to illustrate it, and he offers some further comments by way of explanation. And then in that third and final paragraph, uh, he connects the notion to Aristotle's famous definition. And in what follows, I'm just going to focus on what I think these paragraphs tell us about Aquinas's understanding of motion. I'm not going to address the proper interpretation of Aristotle. <laughs> okay, so in that first paragraph, Aquinas introduces the notion of an incomplete actuality via a threefold distinction designed to locate motion within his broader metaphysical framework of potency and act. <clears throat> so here's the threefold distinction. There's the notion of a complete actuality. This, he says, is a state of a subject that precedes its motion. So the subject is not yet in motion, he says. There's the notion of a complete actuality. This is the state of a subject that succeeds its motion. This is when the subject is no longer in motion. And then there's this notion of an incomplete or partial actuality. This is the state of a subject intermediate between um, potentiality and actuality that explains its motion. So up to this point, Aquinas has been speaking as if states of potentiality and actuality were an all or nothing affair. But as it turns out, he doesn't think this is the case. Indeed, as he now reveals, if we want to understand states of motion, we must think of them not as states in which a subject is in complete potentiality or actuality, but rather as states in which a subject is, quote, partly in potentiality and partly in actuality, as he says in line six and seven. States of the first two types uh, in that threefold distinction are what we might call static states, since they either precede or succeed motion. States of the final type are what we might call dynamic states, since they're just states in which a subject is in the process of moving from one state to another. Okay, having introduced the notion of an incomplete actuality, <clears throat> in an abstract or general way, Aquinas proceeds in the second paragraph to clarify it. And here he begins by explaining how this threefold distinction applies to the example of water changing its temperature. Although we've touched on the example multiple times already, up to now we focused only on the static states that serve as its termini. That is the water state of being cold at the beginning of the change, which he describes as it's being in complete potentiality with respect to heat, and its state of being hot at the end of the change. That is its state of being in complete actuality with respect to heat. In the present context, however, Aquinas invites us to focus our attention on the state of the water in between these two extremes, when it's neither completely cold nor completely hot, 
but rather, quote, participates in heat to some degree, but incompletely, unquote, as he says in lines 10 to 12. Indeed, in this context, Aquinas just identifies the water's heating motion with this intermediate state, describing it, quote, as the incomplete actuality of heat existing in the heatable thing, unquote. When Aquinas characterizes motion as an incomplete actuality, part of what he means to be indicating is that the motion is a state intermediate between two extremes, where such intermediacy involves what we might call limited form possession, that is the possession of some form to a limited degree. But even if this is part of what Aquinas has in mind, it can't be the whole of it. For as he recognizes, even a static state of warmth can be described as intermediate between coldness and hotness and hence as incomplete in the sense of limited form possession. No doubt it's for this reason that immediately after describing the water in his example as something that, quote, participates in heat to some degree, but incompletely, unquote, he provides a more nuanced description saying that, quote, what becomes hot participates in heat gradually by degrees, unquote, where presumably it's this gradual participation in a form or property that distinguishes the dynamic incompleteness of motion from the static incompleteness associated with mere possession of some form of property to a limited degree. But how exactly are we to understand such gradual participation and hence the dynamic incompleteness of motion? The short answer I think is in terms of a successive or twofold ordering, namely that by which motion is related both to a further state of actuality and to a prior state of potentiality. This answer emerges most clearly from the final paragraph um, of passage A. So, and I'll just read that first sentence. Uh, in this way, therefore, an incomplete actuality has the character of motion only insofar as it is related or compared both as a potentiality to further actuality and as an actuality to something less complete. And in the next couple of sentences, he goes on to describe this as a kind of ordering. <clears throat> When Aquinas speaks of ordering in this context, <clears throat> he has in mind the relation, I think, of actualization. Thus, when he speaks of motion as being ordered to further actuality, he's thinking of motion as the subject or principle of this relation. That is, as related to a further state in such a way that it's being actualized by it. By contrast, when he speaks of motion as being ordered to a prior potentiality, he's thinking of motion as the terminus of the relation of actualization. That is, as related to a prior state in such a way that it's actualizing it. <clears throat> now, as we've seen, Aquinas doesn't think um, of motion as unique in its capacity to be ordered to other states as a principle or terminus of actualization. On the contrary, even static states can be related to other states in this way. Consider again the three states of water that Aquinas uses to illustrate his threefold distinction among the different types of potentiality and actuality. Uh, as Aquinas sees it, the first two states are ordered to each other in the same basic way that the third is ordered to each of them. For just as he thinks the third state actualizes the first and is actualized by the second, even if only partially, so too he thinks the second state actualizes the first, which is in turn actualized by it. <clears throat> but even if motion is not unique in its capacity to be ordered to other states as a principle or terminus of actualization, it is unique in its incapacity to exist apart from such ordering. As we've seen, static states of potentiality and actuality can both exist without either actualizing or being actualized by any other state, but the same is not true of motion. On the contrary, it is essentially an actualized actualizer. Aquinas's main argument for the essentiality of motion's twofold ordering as both principle and terminus of actualization occurs in the latter half of paragraph two of passage A and consists in a pair of thought experiments designed to show what would happen if a state of incomplete actuality were to lose any part of its successive ordering. Namely, it would thereby cease to be a motion. I won't go back and look at that with you, but if this interpretation is correct, then the real force of Aquinas's characterization of motion as an incomplete actuality is precisely to call our attention to a kind of dependency that motion has 
on the states that surround it and to which it is successively ordered via relations of actualization. This interpretation, I think, fits well with Aquinas' general practice of associating incompleteness with dependency. Even so, it does complicate our understanding of his views. For earlier, I described the relation of actualization itself as a kind of dependency. It's important to realize, however, that we're dealing here with dependencies of different types. Thus, when I speak of the dependency of motion, I have in mind a kind of generic dependency, one that motion has merely in virtue of the fact that it cannot exist apart from certain other states and relations to them. By contrast, when I speak of actualization itself as a type of dependency, I have in mind a specific type of dependency, what I earlier called resultancy. But clearly these two types of dependency can come apart. For even if states related via actualization must depend on one another in a certain way, static states can exist in the absence of such dependency, even if states of motion cannot. Indeed, if we want to express the dynamic incompleteness of motion using the terminology of resultancy rather than actualization, we can say that states of motion are essentially such that they both result in and result from other states. Okay, and then um, I'm gonna skip this, but under M, I kind of, I have a little chart that's designed to show how the story about motion complicates uh, the picture we've seen before. Instead of simply moving from a state of potentiality to actuality, there's also this uh, process of incomplete actuality or the state of incomplete actuality intermediate between them in which the subject is not completely G, but it is say partially G coming to be hot say. Okay. We now have before us the main elements of Aquinas' views about both motion and change. Even so, we have yet to determine the type of entity that Aquinas takes motion to be and how exactly it relates to the other elements of his ontology uh, of change, including substrata, properties, and complexes of each. And what I want to do in, before concluding is briefly address this final metaphysical issue. Um, in the context of Aquinas' account of change, I have argued that potentialities are best understood as passive powers and that their actualizations are best understood as manifestations of such powers. Aquinas' account of motion, however, complicates this picture. In particular, his account of motion <clears throat> um, as a type of change distinct from mutation requires a distinction between two different types of passive power based on the different types of manifestation of which they are capable. So this is under in here. On the one hand, there are what we might call absolute powers. That is to say powers that must manifest instantaneously or all at once if they manifest at all. Obviously, these are not the types of passive power involved in motion. On the contrary, they're what we might call successive powers. That is to say, they are powers that can manifest gradually or in successive stages. And for the same reason, such powers are capable of being partially as well as completely manifested. Indeed, on Aquinas's view, as we might now express it, motion just is the partial manifestation of a successive power. Um, nowadays, I think powers are generally understood on the model of what I'm calling absolute powers. Thus, when something with a power is placed in the right circumstances, it is generally thought of as immediately jumping to a state involving its complete manifestation much like we might think of a kernel of popcorn as jumping to a new static state when it manifests its power to be popped. Obviously, this is not how Aquinas is thinking of the manifestation of successive powers or motion. On the contrary, as he sees it, when something with a successive power is placed in the right circumstances, it doesn't immediately jump to a new static state involving its complete manifestation. On the contrary, it is instead immediately caught up in a dynamic state or process that culminates in such a state of complete manifestation. On this model, the manifestation of powers is more akin to the melting of butter than the popping of corn. For unlike the popping of corn, the manifestation of butter's power to be melted takes time to complete or is gradual. Although the successive model of powers is not without precedent in the contemporary literature, I think it's still not widely held or known, but I could be wrong about that. So far, so good. But now we can ask, how exactly are we to conceive of the entity that serves as this partial manifestation of a successive power? 
This is the question I want to turn now to because it's the crucial one for understanding Aquinas' complete metaphysics of motion. So up to this point, um, we've been focusing on passages in which Aquinas speaks of motion as if it were a single state that a subject occupies for some interval of time say a single state of heating that some water occupies for the interval during which it's moving from cold to hot. Although this way of speaking is accurate as far as it goes, it's important not to be misled by it. In particular, it would be a mistake to assume that just because Aquinas speaks of motion as a single state, he also takes it to be a simple state. On the contrary, as he himself points out, the complexity of motion follows from its very concept. And you can see this at T6. In this passage, Aquinas makes it clear that he takes motion to be like change in requiring a subject to exist in different states at different times. But unlike change, which doesn't require a subject to exist in more than two different states at two different times, Aquinas insists that motion requires its subject to exist, quote, in a different state at each of the instances, each of the instants measuring its motion, unquote. But given that Aquinas thinks there's an infinite number of instants associated with any interval of time, it follows that every motion is not only complex, but also composed of an infinite number of different states. Thus, although Aquinas speaks of the heating motion of the water in his example as a single dynamic state dependent on the pair of static states that surround it, say 20 degrees Celsius in the case of coldness and 100 degrees Celsius in the case of hotness, it's important to emphasize that he also thinks of this same state as composed of the infinite number of temperatures between these two extremes, say all those between 20 and 100 degrees Celsius. In addition to thinking of motion as a complex state composed of an infinite number of parts, it's important to emphasize that Aquinas also thinks of its parts as being related to one another in the same way that motion as a whole is re related to the static state surrounding it namely via successive ordering. Uh, this is suggested by text T7. In fact, it's precisely because the parts of motion are successively ordered that Aquinas thinks that motion, at least in the narrow or proper sense, qualifies as a successive being. Um, and this is suggested in text T8. Indeed, it's precisely because motion is a complex state having parts that are successively ordered that Aquinas thinks of motion itself as having each of the two types of incompleteness that he associates with all successive beings. Uh, and you can see this is text nine where he distinguishes two types of incompleteness that he thinks all successive beings have. Uh, in the context of explaining motion, we saw that Aquinas appeals to two different types of incompleteness. One type that can be shared um, by both dynamic and static states, namely limited form possession, and one type that's unique to dynamic states, namely this essential twofold ordering. As we can now see from that text T9, Aquinas does something similar in the context of explaining successive beings. That is to say, he appeals to two different types of incompleteness. One type that can be shared by both successive and non-successive, or what he often calls permanent beings, namely division into parts, and one type that's unique to successive beings, namely the succession or successive ordering of parts. As in the case of motion, so too Aquinas thinks of incompleteness here as a type of dependency. As regards the incompleteness associated with the division into parts, I think what Aquinas has in mind is generic dependency. Indeed, it's precisely because he thinks of wholes as depending for their existence on their parts that he insists that God, who is absolutely independent, must lack parts of any kind. As for the dependency associated with succession of parts, here I think what Aquinas has in mind is the dependency involved in actualization, namely resultancy. Now, in later medieval philosophy, the proper understanding of the distinction between successive versus permanent beings becomes a hotly disputed question. As it happens, this is not a question to which Aquinas himself devotes much attention. Even so, I think the basic way in which he's understanding the distinction is clear enough from what we've seen already. <clears throat> successive beings are not a type of entity that can possess all their parts at a single time. On the contrary, as Aquinas insists in that passage, T9, 
uh, above, successive beings, quote, exist at a given time only insofar as they have some part existing at that time, unquote. As this claim makes clear, successive beings are what we would nowadays, nowadays call perduring entities. That is, entities that persist by having different parts at different times. Now, insofar as permanent beings contrast with successive beings, we might expect them to be nothing more than enduring entities. That is, ent entities that persist by existing as a whole at different times. For Aquinas, however, I think it would be better to say that although only permanent beings are capable of enduring, it's not the case that they must do so. For assuming the distinction between permanent and successive beings is exclusive and exhaustive, then if a successive being is a type of entity that can't exist with all its parts at a single time, a permanent being is simply one that can exist with all its parts at a single time, regardless of whether it actually exists in this way at multiple times or not, and hence regardless of whether it actually endures. In short, I think the distinction between successive versus permanent beings is best understood for Aquinas in terms of the type of existence something can have at a time rather than over time, though obviously the distinction has implications for the persistence of things. Indeed, it implies that only successive beings have temporal parts, and this is what I've tried to indicate at table three. And if this understanding of the distinction is correct, um, then Aquinas' description of motion as a successive being will entail that it's a temporally extended state whose parts are essentially spread out over time. Okay. All right, we now are finally in a position to understand what I take to be Aquinas' complete metaphysics of motion. In particular, I want to propose that we think of it as a variation on Bertrand Russell's famous at-at theory of motion. In the principles of mathematics, Russell famously suggested that, quote, motion consists merely in the occupation by the same body of different places at different times, unquote. Russell is thinking of motion specifically in terms of locomotion, but his theory is structurally similar to the type of theory that Aquinas develops for motion in general. To see why, suppose that before we set our water on the fire to be heated, we added a glass thermometer to enable us to track the change in the water's temperature via the corresponding rise in the thermometer's mercury level. So that say at the start of the change when the water's cold, the mercury level will be at 20 degrees Celsius. At the end of the change when the water's hot, it will be at the 100 degree mark. And in between when the water is being heated, it will be in a continuous state of locomotion between the two marks. On Russell's at-at theory, the mercury's locomotion can be understood metaphysically in much the same way that Aquinas thinks the heating motion itself can be, namely as a complex state composed of an infinite number of parts, each of which consists of the same body occupying a different state at a different time. But whereas on Aquinas's theory, the parts are dynamic states involving the bodies possessing different temperatures at different times, in Russell's theory, there are static states involving a body's possession of different locations at different times. Given the structural similarities of Russell's theory to Aquinas's use, as well as the differences just noted, I wanna propose that we can arrive at the correct interpretation of Aquinas's views merely by making a few modifications to our understanding of Russell's own theory. In particular, I wanna suggest that we need only replace all his talk of static states with that, or all talk of static states with that of dynamic states and I'll talk of possessing different locations with that of possessing different properties, taking properties broadly enough to cover qualities, quantities, and locations. In that case, we would arrive at what we might call the dynamic at, at theory of motion, um, which is the last item under P. There can, I think, be little doubt that Aquinas holds something like this variation on Russell's theory. In any case, I want to propose it as a useful point of departure for further reflection. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ralph. And uh, uh, great to be here. Great to see some uh, friends, old friends, and uh, some new faces too. So uh, thanks for the invitation. That's uh, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, so, um, okay, let me just share my uh, screen then. And um, my, uh, just do this. my thesis uh, this afternoon then is principally focused on um, a view I ascribe to Aristotle. Um, so I ascribe to Aristotle um, a, a type of temporal holism uh, in respect of both things and processes, which we can express like this, that uh, a thing exists 
through some period of time and is ontologically prior to its temporal part. So I claim Aristotle um, holds this view of both uh, things and um, processes. Uh, and this seems to me to be a view which has not been widely remarked in the literature, um, and as such uh, ha hasn't, as far as I can see, been named. So because I think it's important to um, not just Aristotle's view uh, uh, and understanding his account of change, for instance, but also to um, really important for um, consideration of wider ontology, I'm going to give it a name and I'm going to call it uh, lasting. So uh, an entity is lasting if it exists through some period of time and if it's ontologically prior to its temporal uh, part. It's, it's a simple idea, essentially. So I'm going to contrast lasting with um, perdurantism, which I suspect is more uh, well known. I'm going to discuss briefly endurantism. And I make the case that lasting is attractive or as an attractive alternative um, uh, to those two ways of persisting. Uh, in particular, it, it, it uh, can solve problems of change for us just as it does for Aristotle. OK, so let's start off with uh, things then. Um, Aristotle's things, of course, are, um, well, most importantly, substances, also artifacts, bundles, heaps, elements. Um, and he, Aristotle splits them into the superlunary and the sublunary sphere. And in the sub superlunary sphere, uh, Aristotle is explicit um, that substances are eternal. Um, so a star, for instance, is eternal. Um, so this uh, would then perhaps contrast with a contemporary view of eternality that um, a star it being eternal could in fact be a series of point in time entities, a dense infinity, which goes on for an infinite period of time. But for Aristotle, uh, superlunary substances have eternality as a form of perfection. It's very difficult to see that um, if the if it was built up from smaller parts, the the stars could really be um, uh, have have a, a, a eternality as a form of perfection. And if one reads Aristotle, it, it, it's difficult to see that um, he doesn't form the view that stars, uh, superlunary objects, are ontologically prior to any temporal parts and certainly any point in time temporal um, parts. So um, on that view, I think they are lasting. In this sublunary sphere, um, things are unable to achieve eternality, um, but uh, they strive um, for the perfection of the unmoved mover. And the perfection in question uh, amounts to uh, largely eternality and eternal motion. So a substance in the sublunary sphere, such as paradigmatically an organism uh, a horse, say, a horse cannot uh, achieve eternality, of course, uh, on an individual basis, but it can achieve individuality on Aristotle's account uh, as a species. It does so by reproducing. And so by reproducing, horses are uh, an eternal uh, species. But again, each individual substance um, must ob ob obtain over some period of time uh, and it seems just inconsistent with Aristotle's account to think that each individual horse is built from its own dense infinity of point in time states with the sort of the tiles of a mosaic, which uh, collectively put down um, form um, the horse over a period. So I take it that the horse here too is ontologically prior to its temporal parts. So um, let me give you some more um, explicit reasons why one might think that in Aristotle's ontology, this is the case. So for Aristotle, substances have natures. That's to say they have internal principles of change and rest. And um, the idea of a nature could have no application for an instantaneous entity for this reason, that an instantaneous entity exists by definition simply for the shortest um, possible duration. Uh, and if it could exist in two different states, then it, 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 that would contradict the idea that it was instantaneous. It would have to exist for at least two instants. So uh, an instantaneous entity cannot change. Um, so an internal principle of change or rest would seem just to have no application for it. So um, substances which are natured 
uh, word could not, I, I suggest, be built from unnatured entities. So they couldn't be built from entities which have uh, existed just a single point in, in time. Again, uh, as a, this is a series of arguments here, another, another consideration is this. Substances uh, as agents and patients are teleological entities. And I take that to mean that they act through time towards uh, some end. Uh, and in doing so, um, they must uh, obtain through time. Um, and again, it's difficult to think that a teleological entity is built from non-teleological point in time type entities. So again, it seems incompatible with the idea that it's built from instantaneous entities. Aristotle is explicit in the physics that nothing moves in um, the now. So again, it's difficult to believe that instantaneous entities could in any way imitate, imitate the unmoved mover in respect of, of motion. Um, so again, it's difficult to see we could have them at the bottom of our ontology. So um, substances then, it seems uh, there's a strong case to have uh, other arguments exist through some period, not just as a single point in time, uh, and they're not built from instantaneous um, temporal parts. But um, is it possible that substances could simply have no parts, right? They're, perhaps there's simples, perhaps there's other ways they could have no temporal parts, sorry, no temporal parts. Uh, is it possible that substances have no temporal parts? Well, um, substances can undergo change, right? And um, time for Aristotle is the number of change. So um, we can ascribe uh, their numbers, temporal numbers, to substances that are changing, which is certainly um, most substances. Um, so at least in this sense, it does seem that we can have temporal parts of substances um, in the sense that we can ascribe, we can abstract from uh, a substance that exists through time, a temporal part, um, which is uh, uh, derived from its temporal number, if you like. So there's, there's this sense. And this uh, accords with a very nice argument from Jonathan Lowe, 2006, Lowe argues that um, we must admit that any object that persists through time has this form of abstractive uh, temporal parts, that we can at least conceptually consider an object which exists through time and conceptually demarcate a proportion of it, which is some period of time. And then in that uh, minimal sense, at least, uh, objects must have um, temporal, temporal parts. So um, if this is right, then um, uh, we argued uh, on the previous slide that substances exist through some period of time, that they're not built from instantaneous temporal parts. It seems uh, on this argument that they must have in at least in a minimal sense, in an abstractive sense, temporal parts. Uh, and, and this is just what it means to say that they are lasting, right? Um, so, uh, okay. I've got some more arguments in the, my uh, paper, but I think that suffices now. I'm just going to um, uh, have argued that, that, that things are lasting. So how about processes? I claim that for Ar Aristotle, processes too are lasting. Um, so uh, just, just to fix this notion of a, a process and what I mean, let's just um, recap very quickly some stuff. I'm, sure you guys um, already know, which is just a, a quick outline of Aristotle's um, account of um, motion. So changing occurs for Aristotle when an agent and a patient are in, in suitable contact. Um, and uh, the powers of the agent and patient, correlate powers of the agent and patient then become activated. And they do so through a period of time, not at a, a single point in time. And the activation of these powers is then uh, 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 manifested as the changing of the patient through time. So um, the changing over time is then a process, a, ky a kinesis, um, uh, uh, otherwise called um, translated as, uh, as a motion. And the motion of a whole then um, is the transfer of a form from the agent to the patient. So the patient changes from being F to not F, um, say. So to take an example, 
uh, we, we have a builder as an agent and a set of building materials as the patient when there is suitable contact. So the uh, builder is, is with the building materials, uh, then uh, building occurs. Uh, and the building, the salient changing is the changing of the building materials over a period of time. Uh, we may suppose these are built into a house. Uh, the concept in the mind of the um, builder originally is transferred um, to the building materials and a house, uh, physical house um, results. The motion, which is uh, the becoming built, the changing of the building materials into the house is a complex entity, which is, and its identity derives jointly from both the agent and the patient. Okay, so are these processes of change then um, a unity or not? On Aristotle's account, they certainly are uh, a, a unity. We might think that we could argue this simply on broad teleological grounds that uh, the motion is the transfer of a form, a single form by a single uh, agent, and that therefore it'd be reasonable to think that um, on that grounds alone, uh, the motion is a unity. But uh, actually, Aristotle is more, is explicit on this point, okay? He tells us that um, the motion is a continuous thing. So, um, to fix our ideas here, let's look at the paradigmatic uh, motion, the flight of an arrow. So this is locomotion, the change of position of an arrow from one place to another, fired by the bow of the archer, the agent, um, and uh, swinging off towards um, some, some target. So Aristotle, in his wonderful second definition of continuity in the physics, uh, uh, gives, says this, the continuous is that which is next to something. But I call them continuous only when the limits at which they are touching are one. So conceptually then, uh, he's laid out the various stages of the flight of the arrow uh, as it goes through space. Uh, and uh, then he's saying, um, is this stage uh, the same, you know, continuous with this? They're continuous if the extremities, the points at which they touch, are numerically the same, they're, they're, they're identical. So the end of this phase, phase of the uh, motion is exactly, is, just is, the, uh, for the, the, the beginning of the next stage of the motion, right? And he goes on, and it is clear from this definition that the continuous is amongst those things out of which some one thing naturally comes into being as a result of their uniting. So we have each of these stage, each of them is continuous with the next, and so the flight of the arrow is some one thing, it's a unity for uh, our, our, on Aristotle's um, account. So it's explicit then that the um, uh, motion is a unity and therefore um, it is uh, one, it is it's prior to it, uh, its ontological parts. It's not simply built from the parts um, separately. And it certainly exists through uh, some period of time uh, and therefore, that's just what it is to say it's lasting. It exists through some period of time, it's ontologically prior to its temporal um, part. So let's just step back um, a second, uh, um, uh, a word on Aristotelian Mariology, which, uh, which perhaps not familiar to those who are principally focused on contemporary uh, um, uh, metaphysics. For Aristotle holds, um, substances, say, are ontologically prior to um, their parts. So, and the parts derive their identity from that of the whole. So if we take a um, human body, for instance, and a hand, a hand is certainly a part of the body, but the body is ontologically prior to the hand. The hand's identity derives from the identity of uh, the body. So the part is potential, right, rather than actual. So that's to say, um, uh, at least this, that it cannot be separated with, from the whole without loss of its identity. So um, we certainly could, um, go forbid, chop off my hand, right? But then on Arist Aristotle's account, it would cease to be a hand. It would be a hand in name only. It would lose its uh, uh, identity. So um, the hand as such cannot be separated from um, the body. So. Um, we can see that this sort of holism with respect to spatial parts then is consistent with his temporal holism um, that I've uh, 
uh, set out, um, uh, the stages of the flight of the arrow derive their identity from the flight as a whole. Their, their potential temporal parts, they can't be uh, separated other than conceptually um, from flight as a whole. The flight is um, a unity. It's not that we start with separate flights of the uh, parts of the flight ontologically and somehow they're there next to each other and that constructs the flight. No, the flight is some one thing and we conceptually uh, can see, can abstract the parts, but they're, 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 they're not actual in, in Aristotle's terms. So then just to summarize, both things and motions are lasting. And there's a nice compatibility here because it might be thought um, that uh, motions are dependent things with respect to what is in motion. So the flight of the arrow is somehow a complex dependent entity, um, uh, which exegesis will set the terms of uh, uh, with respect to the arrow. So it would be perhaps surprising if the flight of the arrow turned out to be uh, a unity, a whole, but the arrow itself turned out to be simply um, an amalgam of parts with no unity. Um, it would be kind of surprising to have um, something that was dependent, dependent on something. Uh, uh, it is implausible that if a motion were um, a whole, that that could be dependent on something that wasn't a whole temporarily. And temporal holism, I argue, argued, um, uh, lasting, as I called it, mirrors holism with respect to uh, spatial parts on Aristotle's account. Um, and we might just on general grounds think, right, that since Aristotle holds these teleological views, things act through time, um, uh, there are natures that, that the world must um, comprise of things which exist uh, through time in, in an ontologically prior sense. Okay, let me see. How, so how am I doing for uh, time? Sorry, let me just check. Okay, so um, perfect. The, the, um, so, so far I've been talking about Aristotle, um, but, but now I want to move from uh, Aristotelian mode into neo-Aristotelian mode, right? This is thinking about the, 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 the um, uh, theme of the conference. And so I want to lift this notion of lasting uh, out of Aristotle uh, and recast it as a kind of a generic um, idea that we can use more broadly. Um, and here's, here's how we might um, characterize lasting then for this purpose. An entity is lasting if it exists in time, so it's not abstract, it exists for some period of time, and is ontologically prior to its temporal part. So nothing surprising given what I've said. But now, um, having lifted this clear of Aristotle, then this form of ontological priority that we're considering in three is going to be left open. We, we, we can choose this as we wish to fit our preferred um, ontology, our preferred contemporary ontology, um, if you like. So this is a generic um, notion of lasting. We've lifted um, clear of Aristotle. And in this sense, um, lasting ontology then uh, provides an alternative to mosaic ontology. So in the mosaic ontologies of the sort that the um, human, uh, humans often suppose, neo-humans in particular, uh, which the world comprises this mosaic of separate tiles, point in time or uh, instantaneous tiles, um, is one view. But lasting would suppose that, in fact, um, there aren't those tiles there that when we see a thing or a process which exists through time, we take that at face value, right? So the, the world then comprises, um, uh, it looks uh, un underneath like a spaghetti, it doesn't look underneath like a mosaic, okay? So this is, this is um, provides us with this generic alternative to um, the, the popular mosaic view of contemporary ontology. And in these sorts of lasting ontologies, then, um, just to be clear, persisting things uh, are, are, are going to have potential temporal parts, notably instantaneous parts, um, uh, but they're not going to have any actual parts, uh, and they're going to be ontologically prior to those temporal parts, right? So that's, that's, that's the key thing here. Okay. Um, so then... Let's turn to uh, matters probably more familiar to contemporary ontologists, 
debate between perduring uh, and enduring, at least um, uh, very briefly. Okay, so um, the notion of perduratism comes to us from Mark Johnson via the work of David Lewis, of course. Um, so it, 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 in the scheme of things, the term perduratism is quite recent. And I want to suggest that we should understand the term enduratism as a complement to the term perdurantism. In a sense, they are, in an important sense, they are born at the same time. I mean, certainly the term enduring is being used earlier, okay? So um, we could go back and I think, you know, read through um, the work of Robert Passnow looking at the medieval period. And Passnow's uh, work certainly does um, cite a number of authors on the topic of persisting who use the term enduring. But those authors can't be thought to have the same meaning of enduring as endurantists, right? They, they use it more as a general term of persisting. Um, insofar as it has a technical meaning at all for those authors, we should really understand it against their own um, technical ontology, right? It would be anachronistic to think that their use of the term en enduring would be the same as that of the uh, endurantists, okay. And, and this um, uh, um, uh, medieval um, uh, perspective, this background to the, could, uh, pro provides, I think, a really important background for the existing debate on um, perduring and enduring. The, the, they pick out some very important ideas which cast light on this debate. There's a, 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 a very an important um, debate about the existence of permanent versus successive entities. A permanent entity is one which exists, must exist all at once. Uh, a successive entity is one which uh, must exist over a period of time. So the paradigmatic successive entity here is a process. Um, uh, and one might think, well, the, the paradigmatic permanent, uh, ent uh, permanent uh, entity must surely be um, a, a substance. But in fact, the medievals um, were split on this, and many of them thought that in fact, God or perhaps angels could be the only permanent entities which could really exist all at once because um, uh, substances need to change in order to exist. They, they need metabolism. So there was a really rich debate um, on, on some of these underlying concepts. Let me mention just one more, polymerism is the view that something ex exists wholly at each place where it exists, right? Uh, and this was the um, orthodox solution of the um, uh, medievals, the scholastics, to the problem of the existence of the soul in the body. The soul must exist in the body, they thought, but it could hardly be that part of it exists in the arm and the other part, another part exists in the leg. So the whole thing must exist in each and every part. Um, so uh, the very rich debate. They, 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 they did take the view that the holomerism really couldn't apply to, to physical or temporal entities. It, it, it could apply to the soul. So anyway, uh, let me turn then. What, what do we mean in contemporary terms by um, perduring? Um, so I think the sort of straightforward answer, which we would all recognize, is that something perdures it persists through time by having different temporal parts at different times. Um, uh, here's a slightly longer and more technical definition. This one, I've chosen Magidor, but um, I think it's um, typical of a whole range of similar sorts of definitions, all um, slightly different. And I'm not going to read through it um, uh, just on grounds of time. Uh, but I think what I want to pick out about this and the important thing here is that we see these definitions rely upon the notion of instantaneous temporal parts. They're concerned to um, uh, consider perduring involves a dense infinity of instantaneous uh, temporal parts, perhaps um, uh, points in time parts. If time is continuous, then, then instants are points for sure. So um, for the perdurantists then, uh, parts are ontologically prior to the whole. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> vast majority of perdurantists are um, neo-humians. Um, 
uh, or uh, of the uh, mosaicist sort of uh, persuasion. Uh, and of course, um, for the Humean, there's an injunction on necessary connection. So the mosaic tiles must be loose and separate. Um, they, they cannot have necessary connections um, together. Uh, and so that would seem to rule out the possibility that the whole could be prior to these, these parts. So <clears throat> a standard um, view uh, on my reading is that persistent things are built from um, these mosaic tiles. You, you put them down, a dense infinity of them, uh, you juxtapose them in a certain way and they're sufficiently similar uh, and one builds them a persisting uh, thing through through time. So such is the, um, my understanding at least of the endurantist position. So how about enduring? Well, um, I think what's agreed about enduring uh, is this, that uh, something that's enduring is wholly present at each time at which it exists. That seems to be a common um, view. Uh, but what does this mean? This is a question that uh, Sider raises, Ted Sider raises in his 2001 classic on four dimensionalism. And he challenges uh, endurantists to come forward with a precise answer. And I think, to be fair, it's very difficult to um, uh, point to an answer that's come forward, which really um, uh, it would be agreed and does the job. One idea is this, that, that, that a, an insurantist, uh, an enduring object is multiply located at each of the time at which it exists. So it's wholly present in the multiply located sense. Crisp and Smith suggest that. But in order to really pull out this um, uh, solution, I think it's going to need a very careful exposition of what being lo multiply located mm -hmm. Uh, is, um, and I don't think the solutions set out, in my view, um, really measure up uh, on, on to the kind of metaphysical requirement that would be needed. Um, so they remain imprecise or perhaps um, applicable only on the basis of certain very uh, precise metaphysical assumptions. Chris and Smith associate um, a space occupation with uh, the existence of uh, objects at those uh, space-time uh, regions. So um, in any case, this is not an option for Aristotle, just to note. I mean, for Aristotle, um, uh, being multiply located is the, is the mark of a universal. A substance um, cannot be multiply located in, 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 in that sense. And when we look for other positive accounts, they're, they're, they're very um, elusive. So Wasserman um, comes to this, uh, he, he, 2016, he concludes that um, uh, we should define enduritism negatively, uh, that it means to, for X to endure is, it for, is for it to exist at T, but not by having a proper temporal part at, at T. So it's just sort of the, you know, you take enduritism and you say the reverse, okay. And, and I think, to be fair, that, 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 that there are quite a number of philosophers who would use that as a working um, definition. But my, my aim here isn't to attack in, in um, I, 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 um, I just want to accept it. Uh, I, what I'm going to suggest is I'm, I'm not going to try and make it precise in, in any sense. I'm going to leave it open. I think it's really a um, family of positions, some of them certainly uh, reasonably um, vague. Um, but uh, my main, uh, what I need here is simply to demarcate it from lasting, okay? So um, here we can, uh, so one thought about enduring, enduring is that an enduring thing has no temporal parts. So that, that's certainly Jonathan Lowe's um, view in his 2006 paper, which uh, sets out to argue explicitly that, that um, enduring objects must have temporal parts. So if insofar as it's true of the endurantist position that they think things have no temporal parts, then that provides a very easy line of demarcation between enduring and lasting. Enduring has no temporal parts, but lasting things have potential temporal parts in the way I, I've discussed. And lasting differs from perduring as well, because perduring things are built out of um, uh, prior uh, objects with their own identities um, uh, juxtaposed uh, to form them, 
Um, and uh, uh, so that they have actual temporal parts, um, whereas a lasting object has no actual temporal parts, it has only potential temporal parts. So um, lasting then is an alternative to uh, perduring uh, and enduring. And in fact, um, this is, uh, I, I, I focused on Aristotle's uh, account of lasting, um, but this lasting is an alternative whether or not Aristotle actually held um, uh, any views about lasting, right? I mean, I, I, I've uh, unashamedly um, appealed to Aristotle in order to um, give lasting uh, some um, uh, credibility and, and some weight as coming from somebody of, um, a, a, by any stretch, a, a substantial philosopher. But even had Aristotle not existed, um, lasting uh, would still be um, a, uh, an alternative to enduring and um, perduring. Okay, so let me just check time again. Okay, so good. So um, let's then ask this quest question, is lasting attractive? And let me make a couple of arguments and then I'm going to summarize. Okay, so um, lasting solves the problem of temporary intrinsic. It solves it for Aristotle and it can solve it for us. So the Leibnizian view is this, that if you've got different properties, you've got a different thing. So the big question has been, um, if uh, how can X at T be numerically the same as X at T plus delta if they have different properties at those two times? And of course, the perjurantist solution is to say there's no problem. You have different temporal parts, uh, so you can have different properties, easy. But of course, um, that's challenged by the endurances. What then changes? It just seems we have uh, these separate um, parts. What is it that holds them together as a single thing? The endurances solution, of course, they have a number of strategies. They could come up with time index properties, for instance. Um, but these, of course, are open to challenges as well. Do we really get change out of um, these strategies? Well, that's an ongoing debate. I'm sure you know the debate um, at least as well uh, as I do. Um, and there's objections to all solutions. So how about the lasting uh, uh, person? What, what could they say? Well, they, like the um, perjurantist, can say, well, look, uh, persisting objects have different temporal parts. And each of those parts can have um, different properties. So there isn't a problem. Um, but they are better placed, I think, than the perjurantists when it comes to the challenge of, uh, well, is there really a persisting thing? Is there anything that changes? Because I think that because the lasting uh, object has an un unimpeachable um, uh, claim to exist uh, on account of its ontological priority to its temporal part. So it exists in a sense prior to them. Its existence is, uh, in that sense, unimpeachable. Uh, and this, um, uh, I suggest, uh, looks like a, a strong solution, the perjurantist solution, but not subject to uh, some of the objections to the perjurantist solution. Lastly, also, I think, provides a key to a central puzzle of causation. Here's a central puzzle of causation then. Diachronic causation is problematic. If we go back to um, Russell's 2013, he notes that if you have a cause followed by an effect, uh, then they can't be contiguous. They can't be contiguous because there are no successors in the set of real numbers. If time is continuous, then there must be a gap um, between the cause and the effect. And a gap between cause and effect seems to him problematic. I, I set out a similar argument in respect of um, diachronic um, powers in a recent um, paper. So um, the problem is this, that synchronic causation is also problematic. So if a cause gives rise to an effect at exactly the same time, then the effect may, may um, mandate a state which is different from the state that existed in the cause, and the two may be incompatible. So is synchronic causation in that sense coherent? And even if it is coherent, how could it underwrite the notion of change through time, which is at least one of the jobs uh, that we seem to need causation um, to do. So do, both diachronic and synchronic causation uh, are problematic, and that creates this central um, puzzle, as I, as I term it. Aristotle provides a solution, of course, and we could dub it this, the changing through time account of change, right? So changing is real, Aristotle argues, because it is the actuality uh, of uh, a power. 
uh, or pair of powers, the manifesting of the agent and patient powers together. Um, uh, and so as the actuality of a power, it is, it is real and it exists through time. Um, Aristotle recognizes that you cannot have changed directly from one determinate state to another determinate state. That's his acknowledgement of the problem of no successors. Change from one state to another must occur through a process of change over time, a process of changing through time, a kinesis. So um, uh, the point to note is this. So, I mean, we too can adopt this changing through time solution that Aristotle does, but to adopt this solution, uh, we need both the power bearers uh, and indeed the powers to exist through time. They must be lasting. So, so lasting can underwrite this solution, but it's a solution you can't have until you have lasting. Right. Is uh, lasting attractive? Well, I've pointed to a couple of, um, uh, I think, important arguments as to why, because it, 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 it solves these profound problems of change, which are um, really um, enigmatic within contemporary ontology. But of course, that's only a kind of a, a start. Um, there are, I think, other major arguments that we um, uh, could put forward. OK, I am um, going to slip the next slide on the grounds of um, time or enough time for discussion. And so let me just have the final slide to conclude. Um, what I've said is, is this, that Aristotle's things and processes are lasting. There's a form of temporal holism about things and processes in Aristotle's view. <clears throat> that lasting could be lived clear of um, Aristotle's account to provide us with an, a generic alternative to enduring and perduring, uh, and that some preliminary arguments suggest that it's attractive, it solves uh, intra-year problems of change. So then, um, in terms of the neo-Aristotelian perspective of this conference, my suggestion is that we can indeed learn from Aristotle and one way we could learn from Aristotle is to adopt his um, uh, temporal holism, to adopt lasting ontology, uh, and it's a solution to persisting and changing. On this view, the world looks like a spaghetti and not the popular um, contemporary mosaic. OK, so I covered quite a lot of ground um, pretty quickly. Uh, the ideas are set out. Um, slightly more fully and perhaps rather more slowly on in some of my papers, uh, particularly these two, all, all of my published papers are available on my uh, website. Thank you. Okay, so knowing how things might have been. So I'm going to be talking about our knowledge of metaphysical modality. So I'm going to be focusing in on metaphysical modality, um, on the assumption that there is such a thing, not everybody does think there is such a thing. Uh, if there isn't, then there's no problem about how we know about it because we don't. Uh, other kinds of knowledge of modality, I, I think the our knowledge of uh, ontic moda, uh, our knowledge of um, you know scientific necessities or logical necessities. Um, there, I think we have. Uh, maybe not a complete story, but a reasonable account of how we know these things. After all, we, we, we learn logic and we learn science and we have scientific laws and we have logical laws. And these give us epistemic inroads to knowing those necessities. Metaphysical modality, by contrast, seems utterly mysterious, both what it is and how we could even know about it. So I think there are certain... Uh, possibilities concerning me and you in ways that we couldn't couldn't have been probably i could have been where you are right now doing what you're doing right now but i couldn't have been you uh and lots of people seem to think they know those kinds of things um which is utterly mysterious because uh it seems like whether something is metaphysically necessary or not whether it is not necessary at all or whether it is necessary in some other way doesn't seem to make much practical difference to the world so whether it suppose something is metaphysically necessary how on earth do we know that okay 
So what I'm going to try to do is talk through two accounts of the epistemology of metaphysical modality, arguing that they don't work. And then I'm going to try and give you an account which I think might work. So I'm not going to say that it does work because it's early days and there are lots of moving pieces and chances are some of them aren't going to work and maybe they don't all line up properly, but we're going to give it a go and see where we get to. OK, let's start with conceivability. Uh, lots of people from Hume to David Chalmers think that conceivability gives us epistemic access to modality, um, knowing how things could have been. So uh, we, we conceive things. Um, we, we, we know about those things. We know that we're conceiving them. We infer that these things are possible. This kind of move basically relies on two steps. Firstly, if it's conceivable, it's possible. That's questionable. Secondly, the, 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 secondly an epistemic step, that our knowledge of what we've conceived transfers to our knowledge of what's possible. And I think we've got issues there at both steps. First problem, I mean, even setting aside, I guess we've got three problems there. You know, the move from conceivability to possibility is controversial. My main issue with it is uh, I think we can conceive things that aren't genuinely possible. Um, uh, Possibly the easiest case there is imagining things that are logically impossible. I mean, if we couldn't imagine things that were logically impossible, how come we all get so confused when we do logic? I've spent all morning teaching my third year students logic. They're really good at it, but they still get some things wrong. We do some reductio proofs, etc. I think they're imagining impossible things. Some people think we should only work in terms of ideal conceivability. If we do that, the epistemic step gets more difficult because how do we know that something is ideally conceivable as opposed to non-ideally conceivable? Um, there are lots of theories about how we genuinely imagine coming out of cognitive science and a lot of them seem to revolve around the idea that we don't merely, I mean how do we imagine or conceive of something day ray? Well one theory is that we sort of have some sort of descriptive content there and then we label the things in that descriptive content. So I, I might imagine, you know, swimming with you. Uh, I, so I'm imagining swimming with someone and I label that someone you. I, I can imagine it being you as opposed to somebody else, perhaps somebody else who looks exactly like you by labeling them you. If those theories are right, then I can imagine various metaphysical impossibilities because I can imagine something and I can label that thing me. Or I can take two things that are distinct and I can label one thing with both of those labels. So taking identity, facts about identity or distinctness to be metaphysically ne necessary, I can imagine things that contradict them. Um, I can imagine being somebody else. Maybe I can imagine being a number. You know, if I was the number one and you were the number two, then I would be less than you. I mean... Uh, yeah. These problems for the move from conceivability to possibility. But let's set that to one side. Even if we grant that, what about the epistemic move about knowing possibilities? Well, suppose it's true that what's conceivable is possible. Still, I don't believe it. And if I don't believe it, I'm not going to take my conceiving as a guide to my modal beliefs. So if I don't form modal beliefs on the basis of conceivability, then conceivability can't be what turns my belief into knowledge. OK, so even if conceivability were a reliable way of forming beliefs about what could have been, that's not how I form them. So where does my modal knowledge come from? Third problem, maybe not really a problem, but I'll mention it anyway. Uh, I think this approach makes modal knowledge easy, too easy. Conceiving stuff is really easy, but modal knowledge is hard, right? I mean, we debate what is necessary quite a lot in metaphysics classes. If it was easy to gain modal knowledge, why would we disagree about it so much? Moving on, second approach, counterfactual knowledge. 
So Tim Williamson thinks that our modal knowledge is ultimately counterfactual knowledge. So again, this approach comes in uh, two parts. We have a nice analysis of modality in terms of counterfactuals. So you can think about it like this. If the counterfactual from A's being false leads to an absurdity. So if not, if not A were the case, then something absurd. We can take that as being equivalent to A is necessary because supposing it's not the case would lead you to an absurdity. So counterfactuals are equivalent to statements about necessity. And if we know counterfactuals, then that might lead us to modal knowledge. And Williamson says quite reasonably, we do have counterfactual knowledge. So even setting aside the difficult question of how we gain counterfactual knowledge, we've at least got something there. We have counterfactual knowledge and we can use that to bubble our way up to modal knowledge. OK, again, problems. First up, I don't think the account works because I think there are counterfactuals that don't translate into necessities. Um, these are counter possibles, counterfactuals with impossible antecedents. So nice example from Daniel Nolan. Um, if Hobbes had squared the circle, sick children in South America at the time would have cared. No, they wouldn't. That's a false counterfactual with an impossible antecedent. Now, it turns out that the kind of approach that Williamson's going for requires all such counterfactuals to be true, to be trivially true. If you've got a false, a necessarily false antecedent, that counterfactual just comes out trivially true. It's the kind of David Lewis, Stolnecker kind of theory. But I think there are I think there are counterfactuals that aren't like that. Counterfactuals with metaphysically impossible antecedents, which are either non-trivially true. OK, they're true, but for substantial reasons or like the one I just gave you, it's false. If there are such if there are such counterfactuals, then Williamson's analysis of modality in terms of counterfactuals doesn't even work. It doesn't get the extension of necessity right. But again, even supposing that Williamson is right, problem number two, how do I gain my modal knowledge? I know certain things about necessity, let's suppose, but I don't believe the corresponding counterfactuals because I have this crazy theory about, you know, counterfactuals with impossible antecedents, let's say. So I don't have the counterfactual belief. I have the modal belief. And let's suppose the modal belief is known. How come? Doesn't provide an explanation in my case. Um, there's also a problem with Williamson's argument here. He argues as follows. I know A. A is equivalent to B, so I know the counterfactual. The counterfactual is equivalent to the uh, statement of necessity. Therefore, I know the statement of necessity. That doesn't follow. Um, I might know one thing. That thing might be equivalent to another. Doesn't mean I know the second thing. In a, in a mathematical sense, all mathematical truths are equivalent. I know that one and one is two, but there's plenty of mathematical things I don't know. That problem for Williamson can be overcome. He shouldn't have argued from equivalence to knowledge transferring. I think what he should have said is that the equivalence gives us a reliable method for turning a belief into knowledge. So probably the third problem can be overcome. The first two, I think, are serious. OK, I want to keep this talk nice and short. I'm probably not going to be successful, but I'm going to give it a go. So I'm going to move on swiftly. I want to think about the positive story of how we gain modal knowledge. And my story is going to be in terms of essence. So part of it is going to be, and you know, this is kind of why it's coming up in the sort of neo-Aristotelian workshop. It's going to be based around this uh, the, uh, concept of essence that you can find in um, E.J. Lowe, Bob Hale, Kit Fine, going back through Locke, Aristotle. Uh, I mean, they all have different concepts of essence, but we're kind of talking maybe the, the same kind of ballpark, particularly if our guide for being in the same ballpark is um, not being David Lewis, right? <laughs> so they don't agree with David Lewis, and that's why we're lumping them together. Um, exactly what we say about essence isn't going to matter too much here. So I do have a theory of essences, and I do have a theory of how you get from essences to necessities, but that's not going to matter so much here. Really, to flesh this all out, we need a modal reduction to essence. So we basically need a story of how you get necessities from essence. But it's just going to be if something's got a property, essentially, then it's got it necessarily. And if something follows from having a property, essentially, then it's necessary. That's kind of all we need. I would also need to give you a full account of what an essence is. 
Um, that's not really going to matter for this talk. So if you're looking at the handout, we've just skipped through part four and through part five. Very briefly, I'm going to tell you about my account of Essence. Just because lots of people think Essences, even if there were such things, they would be so super mysterious, they would just be no good for any epistemology. I don't think the kind of thing I'm talking about is super mysterious. Here's my account of what Essences are. They constitute material objects. I'm basically a bundle theorist, but the properties in the bundle are all and only those that are essential to the object in question. So take all my essential properties, like being a human being and being conscious and maybe some other stuff. Uh, that bundle is me. And throwing a bit of space time and stuff like that. That's me. Um, so when we're talking about an essence, I'm just talking about a bundle of properties and I think we can know about properties I think we can know about bundles of properties so knowing being in touch with causally an essence shouldn't be so much of a problem this theory of essence I mean obviously it's got <laughs> it's a philosophical theory right so it's got loads and loads of issues uh me and Steve Barker we wrote it up a couple of years back um we can talk about that in the Q&A but I don't think that's going to be so important for the epistemological goal that I'm going for here. OK. So I'm going to be talking, I want to start my story of how we can know. So the story is basically going to be we know some stuff about essences and that kind of knowledge transfers or can transfer into knowledge of necessities. So it's got lots of moving parts, essences, knowing about essences, essences implying necessities and the knowledge of the essence stuff transferring to knowledge of modal stuff. Lots of parts could all go wrong. Um, I want to focus quite a lot on the problem of knowing about essences, because I think that's where a lot of people are going to get off the bus. Um, you know, like I said, they sound mysterious. How on earth can we know them? So I want to begin with a problem, a problem that says we can't know about essences. I'm going to try to undermine that explain how we do know about them and that's going to be quite key to the overall story about modal knowledge. So here's the problem. Take some property that I've got. I might have that property accidentally or essentially. Either way it makes no causal difference. Okay, I mean that sounds plausible. I mean it's the property, the possession of the property that does the causal work. Whether or not I have to have it or just happen to have it, I get the causal powers either way. So, um, OK, but knowledge, at least of material objects, is causal. OK, if we've got something that's causally irrelevant, I'm not going to know about it. So whether or not I have the property essentially or accidentally, we're not going to know about that sort of thing. That's the kind of problem I want to target here. I'm going to approach it by thinking about a parallel problem that I think has the same kind of structure but I think we can see a clear solution to the second one. I'm going to try and use that to solve the first one. So the parallel problem is the problem of reference. In particular, reference to coincident entities. Let's suppose there is such, su suppose there is the phenomena of coincident entities. This is controversial. Um, we're talking about the statue and the clay. Uh, people disagree on this, but Lots of people agree that at least in some cases there are coincident entities. So think about the case where entities haven't always coincided. Um, so maybe you take the clay, it pre-exists, there's no statue, but then you make it into a statue. A lot of people think that you do have, once the statue exists, then you have both. You have the statue and the clay. Um, I think the argument I'm going to run is more secure if you believe in permanently coincident entities but maybe we can work with it if we only believe in temporarily coincident entities either way i'm going to be talking about coincident entities right now we've got this coincident entity let's say it's an artwork it's coincident with some daubs on canvas it's called it's coincident with an area of space time or it's me the person versus me the body or let's say me the person versus my physical body versus the region of space time um Lots of coincident entities there. Uh, ref so they're microphysically indistinguishable, either over all time or just now. Premise, reference is a causal process. 
So if things don't differ microphysically, that sorry, Mr. Premise. These things are microphysically indistinguishable, so they're causally indistinguishable. Premise reference is causal, so if things don't differ causally, we can't refer to one but not the other. Conclusion we couldn't refer to one but not the other of coincident entities. Okay, very similar problem to the problem of essence, I think, um, but done in terms of reference rather than knowledge. Response, well, there's got to be a response because we do, right? If these things really are coincident, uh, we really do refer to one but not the other. I mean, we talk, you know, we, we talk about um, me versus my body, right? Um, would I survive this or that case? Um, suppose I go, suppose my mind goes one way and my body goes the other. Where do I go? I mean, to even make that intelligible, we have to be able to talk about one versus the other. So how come? Well, I'm claiming that since these things are microphysically causally indistinguishable, what makes the difference is the sortals they fall under, or as I'm going to put it, their essential properties. So I'm a person. My body is not a person. It has lots of the same properties as me, but some things that I have essentially, it has only accidentally. OK, I'm the person. My body isn't the person. How do we refer to me, but not my body? Well, we can either do it explicitly by saying the person. Or we can do it implicitly by using words or concepts that are associated with the concept of a person. So when I say I, that's a personal uh, indexical, so it's going to refer to a person, not to a physical body. OK, so we use concepts, um, sortal terms to, to distinguish between coincident entities. And this gives us uh, um, access to a thing's essence. After all, when we use concepts like that, we're referring to something that is essentially a person. OK, um, I think it's just going to be in, in fact, on the, the kind of theory of essence that I've got, it, it just comes out that to be a person is to have that property essentially. OK, you have to you can't be accidentally a person. You have to be essentially a person um, to be an artwork is to be um, essentially an artwork. So when we refer in these kind of ways to um, uh coincident entities we are we are we are using a thing's essential properties to distinguish the one from the other okay in fact on, on the kind of account i'm looking at the only way to if we've got permanently coincident entities the only th handle that we can get on why they're different is having different essences so that's what we're doing we're targeting in their essential properties okay so Essence, essential properties are going to be what helps us to refer in these cases. So I think we can solve the problem of reference. How does this help with the problem of knowing essences? Well, again, I think this theory of reference is going to help us out. What in a, the kind of mechanism that's going on with reference here is when we say that thing there, the person, what we're doing is we're singling out, firstly, a, 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 we're saying there, so we're saying it's a thing, it's there, so that singles out the spatial temporal region. And then we're saying the person, so we're picking out a property that belongs to the one thing but not the other. Okay, so we're picking out an essential property that belongs to the person but not to the physical body. Um, that way of phrasing things kind of guarantees that our reference is successful. Assuming there is a person there, OK, the fact that I'm saying the person um, guarantees that I pick out the person rather than the physical body. Um, this this in turn is it's kind of a. Uh, if I form a belief that there is a person there. And there is a person there, uh, the fact that my reference, my, my thought is kind of guaranteed to pick out the person there if there is one. Um, that makes that a safe belief. It can turn that belief into knowledge. OK, so. Uh, if I have reason to believe that there is the property of being a person in this region, um, I, that's a that's a kind of an empirical, easy to get piece of knowledge. The difficult piece of knowledge is to know that the, that the person is essential to that thing. That was our problem. But what I'm saying is the, the way that we use that concept to refer to that thing picking it out via its essential property of being a person rather than being just a mere physical lump. Uh, that guarantees that the beliefs that I form 
if I form the belief that this thing is essentially a person, that's going to be a safe belief. OK, so if I form the belief that that thing is essentially a person, that's something that I can know. So. I'm assuming that the the kind of crux of the question here is how does a belief in an essential property turn into knowledge? And this is the mechanism that does that. This mechanism of reference to kind of bundles which contain these essential properties allows the belief to be a safe belief. It turns the belief into knowledge. OK, uh, I think there's a lot more we could say there, but I want to move on to get to the uh, bits about knowledge of modality. So I just want to assume for the sake of argument that if a property is possessed, essentially, it is necessary to that thing. Controversial, I'm going to assume that because there remains the difficult question. Do we know that or rather does the knowledge of essence transfer into knowledge of necessity? Not obviously. Because like we said about Williamson, it might be I know this and this transfers to this, but the knowledge doesn't transfer. So how's it going to work in this case? Well, the claim I'm going to make here is that when we form that a way of forming beliefs about uh, a property being possessed, essentially uh, a property being possessed necessarily are explicitly or implicitly formed on the basis of considering the thing, the nature of the thing, the identity of the thing. So as I would put it as a theorist, the essence of the thing. But I've got to be careful here. I don't want to say you have knowledge of metaphysical modality only if you believe this theory of metaphysical modality. That would be crazy. This stuff is way too theoretical and high level to be what accounts for most people's knowledge of modality. Rather, what I want to say is that is the mechanism for, for belief formation that is implicitly being appealed to. And I don't know how to argue for that other than by giving you some cases which I find somewhat persuasive. OK, so um, consider some cases like this. Um, uh, you know, somebody asks you, so why is it that Whenever we find an electron, it's always negatively charged, right? I mean, what about the positively charged ones? Somebody might say, look, look, you're confused here. Electrons have to be negatively charged. That's just what it is to be an electron. OK, so appealing to the nature of what it is to be an electron or the, the identity, or if you want to put it another way, to the kind of the, the concept of being an electron, it flows from that, that electrons have to be negatively charged. What I'm claiming is there that implicitly in deploying those concepts, we have a move from the essence of a thing, what it is, its nature, its identity, to a statement, a belief about the way it has to be. Another case, um, you know, suppose we're wondering about why all the bachelors are men. Like, how is why is it every time we, we, we you know, we, we see a group of bachelors, they're always men. Can't we kind of get more women in the club? Well, no, again, you're confused, right? Because to be a bachelor, you have to be a man, OK? There's a have there. It's necessary. And our way of explaining why it's necessary is to say, well, just think about what it is to be a bachelor, either the nature of the concept or, as I would prefer to put it, the nature of the property, the identity of the property. If we've got that property, it flows from it that we've got men. And if you don't, grasp that you haven't grasped the concept you haven't grasped the property if the property didn't imply that it would be a different property so considering the nature of things we can make inferences in these cases to how things have to be i'm claiming that that is often how people do form beliefs about how things have to be and when they do so It is a safe method of forming beliefs that allows knowledge of the way things have uh, knowledge of the essences of things, the kind of thing I was previously talking about, to transfer to the knowledge of the way things have to be. So that's basically the story. That's the story of how 
we can have knowledge of the essences of things, the, the essential properties of things, and how we can form beliefs about the way things have to be based on those kind of, uh, based on the natures of things, the essences of things, and how those beliefs translate into genuine knowledge of how things have to be. Okay, thank you very much. No foundations for metacoherentism. So my topic is metaphysical coherentism is a view about the structure of metaphysical dependence in opposition to what is often called the orthodox or standard view metaphysical foundationalism. So right on metaphysical dependence, I take metaphysical dependence to, to take two main forms. Um, uh, the first is essence, so X is essential to Y in the sense that X is a metaphysical requirement for Y. Um, so what Fine calls constitutively necessary in the 2015 paper, and then grounding X grounds Y and, uh, in the sense that X metaphysically determines Y constitutively sufficient. Um, Foundationalism, the standard view, says that reality rests on a bedrock of fundamental independent things or facts, and that then we have a hierarchy of different levels or layers of derivative things or facts that ultimately depend on the fundament in a, in a, <coughs> I can't read my slides, in a directed non-circular way so that depends is an asymmetric or perhaps an anti-symmetric relation. So here's the picture, fundamental of independent things and uh, things of facts and then non-circular arrows of dependence that uh, lead to different levels of derivative things of facts. Or well, let's bracket infinitism, non-circular depends but no fundament and focus on coherentism. This is the view that reality instead involves or consists in networks are a network of metaphysically interdependent things or facts so that things or facts do or may stand in mutual reciprocal symmetric circular cyclic relations of dependence and so that depends is in any case not asymmetric may hold um, um, so, uh, symmetrically <coughs> so that's the picture no fundament everything fact is dependent on some other uh, instead a network of uh, different effects of things in, in uh, dependence relations, and at least in some cases, mutual reciprocal relations of dependence. So my question is, as foundationalists, and this is a plurality that at least includes me, uh, should we be, or to what extent should we be impressed by arguments put forward by coherentists for their view? And in this talk, I will not discuss alleged theoretical advantages of coherentism, that would be another talk, but the phenomenological claim that certain cases, in fact, reveal metaphysical interdependence. So that's the plan. I will first introduce three phenomenological deficits, which I call superficiality, ambiguity, and insubstantiality by, uh, by rather simple examples. I will then sketch a case study on a coherent view of quantum entanglement and discuss those three deficits with respect to that case. And finally, I will try to highlight insubstantiality as the deepest problem for coherentism that will have to do with the issue of metaphysical explanation. <laughs> so, First deficit, superficiality. The deficit here is that what on the surface of a phenomenon may perhaps look like reciprocal metaphysical dependence is in fact at a deeper level, something much more harmless that is quite compatible with foundationalism. So an example would be mathematical structuralism. So for example, the natural number structure um, and the structuralist would, would hold that here, each number is nothing more than a position in the complete number structure, so that, as they say, each number depends on every other. 
So if we focus on direct dependence, we have direct dependence arrows in both direction as we're mirroring the successor relation. So that would be the idea. Now let's take a closer look. What kind of dependence is that? Quite plausibly, what Fine calls ontological dependence, for example, which is defined in terms of essence. So for example, number one is essentially the successor of zero. And so the claim zero is at the same time, essentially the predecessor of one. However, recall Fine's early observation that such cases of reciprocal dependence may well be admitted for a liberal, as he calls it, consequential notion of essence and dependence. But such reciprocal dependence is always derivative from facts of constitutive relational essence, as he calls it, uh, essence that pertains to different relata in relation. So in our example, we would have a fact of relational essence. Zero and one together, as it were, are essentially such that the latter is the successor of the former, and of course, the former is the predecessor of the latter, which may most perspicuously uh, written not in a sentence, but in the predication notation as follows. Uh, it is essential to zero and one that they, they are entities x, y, such that y is the successor of x. And the important point here is that uh, zero and one together are perhaps presented as dependent on the successor, successor relation. Okay. But they are not presented as dependent on, on each other because no reference to zero or one is made in the formula expressing the essential property or relation here in that case. Doesn't, doesn't occur. So and that's quite a plausible view for a structuralist because a typical structuralist was, would hold that in some sense relations come first and object second. So that dependence of the numbers on, on the relation would be perhaps fine for a structuralist. Now reciprocal essence and dependence may, if you wish, be taken to result, but only by consequence from such cases of uh, relational essence. So, if we wish, we may in the derivative and only in the liberal and consequential sense also say that, okay, it's essential to zero that uh, its successor is one and it's essential, essential to one that, uh, um, that it is a successor of, of zero. Uh, in any case, in the, in the complete story, there's nothing to worry for the foundation because the reciprocal effects of essences are only derivative and only uh, uh, effects of essence in a liberal and consequential sense uh, that derive from, uh, from relational essence, which should not worry the foundation. So second deficit ambiguity. The deficit here is that what on first appearance may look like reciprocal metaphysical dependence is in fact either reciprocal dependence of some other kind or contextual or causal or even epistemic or conceptual, or even dependence of different kinds of different directions. So here's an example by Naomi Thompson. The working of the circularity system depends on the fact that the heart is pumping blood. And the fact that the heart is pumping blood depends vice versa as it were uh, on the working of the circularity system. Okay. So, but let's take a closer look then. It's quite plausible to say that the working of the complete circularity system depend on the fact that the heart is pumping blood in the metaphysical sense that the heart is constitutive of the complete system. So that's quite plausible. And it's also plausible to say that the, heart, that the fact that the heart is pumping blood depends on the working of the circularity system minus the heart. So, uh, but only in the causal sense. So if the circularity system minus the heart stopped working, uh, the heart would after a while stop pumping blood. Oh, but that's a causal relation. So in, in any case, we have no reciprocal metaphysical dependence. But metaphysical dependence plausibly in one direction, causal dependence in the other, and even for slightly different relata, complete circularity system versus circularity system minus the heart. I'm saying minus the heart 
because you told us that cause and uh, effect must be distinct. So I must take the heart out of uh, out of the course here. So third deficit insubstantiality. Uh, here the idea is that reciprocal metaphysical dependence may perhaps be intended by a certain metaphysical view, but either not be substantiated at all by any concrete account of the metaphysical relations in question, or a concrete account or a concrete accounts may perhaps be given, but they do not in fact substantiate reciprocal dependence. So that's insubstantiality. Um, and here, the example from the literature is uh, Armstrong's Metaphysics of Universal and Particulars and Sets of Affairs. So both Elizabeth Barnes and Naomi Thompson have claimed that this is best interpreted as stating a mutual dependence between universals F and particulars A on the one hand and states or affairs of A's being F on the other. But again, when we take a closer look at Armstrong's work, uh, as many of, of you know, um, uh, we find two quite different stories about the relationship in question. So there's the 1989 story you know, to be found in the, in the Universal's introduction. Um, first step, as it were, you must assume Universal's F in order to account for a sameness of type, objective sameness of type. Oh, and we must also assume primitive particulars A in order to avoid implausible bundle views. Okay, second step. And in order to account for the truth of predications, A is F, we must also, in addition, assume states of affairs of A's being F, which result by non merological composition from uh, F and A. So, whatever you think about that story, it's pretty clear that here, universal and particulars are presented as coming first metaphysically, and states of affairs as second as some of the are resulting from non merological uh, or, or by a non merological composition. And then there's a 1997 story from the uh, from the States of Affairs book. First step, we must assume States of Affairs as building blocks of the universe because we need truth makers. And then second step, by abstraction, we additionally arrive at the assumption of universe in particular, for example, we notice something common in the state of affairs of A's being F and the state of affairs of B's being F. That's a universal being F. So in that abstraction story, it's states of affairs that come first and universal in particular is concerned. So the important point here is that Armstrong's two more concrete, but a physically somewhat more substantial accounts, compos composition versus abstraction, pointing to opposite and in fact, incompatible directions. The one uh, in the direction priority of, of universe and, and particulars and the other in the direction of priority of states of affairs. And whatever you may think about that substantial theoretic tension in Armstrong's work, which has been recognized throughout the literature, you may think it can somehow be resolved, but what, it is not resolved by simply adding, simply adding the highly abstract claim that, by the way, the overall view is one of mutual dependence. That fact remains unsubstantiated by the concrete metaphysics. Certainly no mutual dependence arises from telling two incompatible stories about a certain subject area. So that's insubstantiality. Now, quantum entanglement. So the, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, let's say that the phenomenon here is that, that we have two or more particles which are physically described as being in a common physical state in such a way that the state does not analyze or factorize as they call it into states of the individual particles. Now, coherentists such as recently Calosi and Morganti claim that this phenomenon is to be construed as reciprocal metaphysical dependence 
of the particles involved regarding their states or properties or qualitative profiles this. And this coherentist interpretation is uh, presented as an alternative to existing structuralist and holist accounts of entanglement. So uh, what's important for us about structuralism and holism about entanglement is that those two views agree uh, in their reductionism with regard to individual particles. So individual particles reduce either to physical relations, that's structuralism, or to an underlying larger ontic whole or one, that would be holism or, or, or Schaeffer's monism. Um, and uh, in opposition to that, coherentists accept physical particles as unreduced. So, and uh, I'm quite sympathetic with that part. Um, they only add the claim that those particles reciprocally, metaphysically depend on each other with regard to their states or properties. So, as you probably know, the standard example for an entangled state is the so called singlet state of two electrons, for example, two electrons in the shell of a helium atom. Uh, for, for, for simplicity, let's assume that we are concerned with only two possible pure states in which the electrons, which are fermions, can be found by measurement. The one I call up, so that's one half spin up for a chosen spatial direction, the z-axis or so. Uh, and the other is down, one half spin down for that uh, spatial direction. Okay, up and down as pure states of single particles. For an entangled state, we need to consider our two electrons, one and two, in the same physical system. For example, the two electrons, one and two, in the shell of a helium atom. And now, in particular, for the so-called singlet state, focus on two possible complex pure states in which the two electrons, one and two, can be, the one I call up-down, well, electron one is up and electron two is down. And the other I call down up, electron one is down, and electron two is up. So below you find the uh, technical uh, notations of those uh, states, of those pure states in, uh, in the Dirac uh, bracket notation. Now, the singlet state, that famous singlet state, uh, in the singlet state, the two electrons are neither in up, down, nor in down up. Instead, the singlet state is a mixed or superposition state in which those two possible pure states have, as it were, an equal share. And we may untechnically uh, write that as, uh, as follows. Electrons one and two together are in the state 50% up down and 50% down up. And again, you see the, uh, the standard technical notation below with the minus for the asymmetry of the, of the spin function. What's important next is that this singlet state, a sta a state bears a certain relation to measurement according to uh, quantum mechanics. Namely, in a measurement of spin applied to our electrons one and two in the singlet state, we will find those electrons with a probability of 50% in up-down, and the pure state up down, and with a probability of 50% in the pure state down up. And the important thing here is that there's hence a zero probability to find them with re equal spin up, up, or down, down. Um, and this reveals that their common singlet state before measurement is not fixed by the by the individual states of the of the individual particles. Or if you if you only know one particle may be up or down, and the other particle may be up or down. There should be a probability for up, up, and, uh, and for down, down, but there's none. And that is guaranteed by the, by the common state of the two uh, particles. That this is so. Now, that was a phenomenon. Now, coherentists hold that our two particles in the singlet state are metaphysically interdependent with regard to their states or uh, properties. And now let's take a closer look at that claim. 
with respect to the three deficits of superficiality, ambiguity, and uh, insubstantiality introduced before. The first, superficiality. Um, an important point here is that our coherentists do not claim that the particles as such are essentially interrelated and therefore interdependent. But only with respect to their properties, they say. So and my interpretive proposal here is to say that it is only electron one qua in the singlet state together with electron two that depends on electron two qua in the singlet state together with one and vice versa. I'm here referring to Kit Fine's uh, idea of, of qua objects, of course. Um, okay, let's assume that. But then recall Fine's observation that reciprocal essence and dependence in the liberal consequential sense is derivative from relational essence. So the overall view would be at, as follows. At the physical basis, we have two particles, one and two, which as a matter of fact, not essentially, as a matter of fact, stand in the relation of together being in the singlet state. So, and then if you wish, we may assume that this underlying fact, which has nothing to do with, with S or dependence, but this underlying fact constitutes two derivative objects, two qua objects, one qua entangled with two and two qua entangled with one. And those two qua objects are essentially related. So yes, it is essential to one qua and two qua that they are entities X and Y, um, uh, such that X is in the single state with Y. And then third step from this harmless fact of relational essence, harmless from the perspective of the foundationalist, uh, from this harmless fact of relational essence, reciprocal facts of essence and dependence in the liberal consequential sense may be taken to follow. So we may say, if we wish, that in the liberal sense, one qua is essentially such that it is in the single state together with two qua, and two qua is essentially such that one qua is in the single state together with it. And the crucial point here is that this complete view, these, these three steps, as it were, are perfectly consistent with foundationalism. There's nothing here to worry uh, uh, a foundationalist who is open to the nearest Aristotelian uh, talk of S. So next, ambiguity. Still, isn't there a sense in which our particles one and two do depend on each other regarding their states and properties? And could that not be a deep metaphysical interdependence? So now consider facts such as electron one is spin up, electron two is spin down. And consider our two particles, one and two are two electrons before and after an act of spin measurement at time t. So we have time t, a miracle occurs, a spin measurement, collapse of the wave function, whatever. Um, and before time t, we have electrons one and two together in the singlet state. And then measurement of spin is applied. And as a result, we have that that's uh, what, quantum mechanics says, um, let's say we have electron one in the sharp state up and electron two in the sharp state down. Okay, now some questions. First, before time t, does the fact, the actual fact that one is spin up depend on the actual fact that two is spin down and vice versa? Have we, have we here uh, metaphysical interdependence between two facts? No, <laughs> for the simple reason that before time t, those two pure facts don't exist. There is no fact one up and uh, uh, no fact two down. So they, they, those non-existing actual facts uh, can't, be, can't be interrelated. Okay, second, after time t, does then the fact that one is spin up metaphysically depend on the or depend on the fact that two is spin down and vice versa. A 
plausible, yes, in a counterfactual sense. Uh, if electron one had been down instead of up, uh, electron two would, been, uh, would have been up instead of down. If two had been uh, up instead of down, one would have been down instead of up. Yes, okay, that's plausible. But those counterfactuals only hold or obtain due to the earlier singlet state and due to the act of measurement. So it's only because before T, our electrons have been in the singlet state and because at T, we have applied a spin measurement to, to, those, uh, to, to that package of, of electrons, um, that uh, uh, it is determined that uh, after measurement, we can only have the two combinations uh, uh, up, down, or down, up. And that sustains those counterfactuals. So uh, in some, the interdependence here is broadly causal, not metaphysically in kind. Third, let's go back before time t. So, but can't we say that at a particular time t prime before t, we have at least the potential fact one up and the potential fact two down. And those two potential facts uh, uh, depend on each other. And again, I would say yes, plausibly yes, but again, only in the broadly causal sense. If electron one had been up before uh, uh, at time t prime, electron two would have been down. And if two had been down at t prime, one had been uh, had been spin up. But why? Those counterfactuals obtain only because we may assume that electrons one and two have been in the singlet state quite for a while before time t, and so also before t prime. Uh, and that's the reason why we must say that if electron one had been spin up at time t prime, this would have been so due to a only possible act of spin measurement before t prime. I know Lewis's tiny miracle. So. Uh, with the result up down, so that in that case, uh, electron two would have been spinned up. And similarly for the for the other counterfactuals. So again, uh, it's a kind of broadly causal interdependence and not a metaphysical interdependence. In sum, the plausible reciprocal dependence between potential facts concerning particles one and two is counterfactual and broadly causal in character and not metaphysical as our uh, current theory. And I add a quick aside. It is a completely different issue whether such counterfactual interdependence reveals what Einstein in a letter to Born uh, called spooky action at a distance and whether such quantum non-locality is problematic and maybe avoided by hidden variables and so on and so on. That's not my topic, that's a completely different issue. So finally, insubstantiality. So far, I've been presupposing that the singlet state, that entangled state, is some kind of physical state of electrons one and two, uh, of which we mainly know that it has a characteristic relation to spin measurement, so either up, down, or down, up is measured. Now, it may be a possible ambition of coherentists and the indications that they think that way uh, to, uh, to offer a metaphysical analysis of that very physical state, that uh, uh, quantum, the entangled quantum state, in terms of reciprocal metaphysical dependence. So let's look at two possible approaches to provide such a metaphysical an analysis. Or here's the first attempt. Perhaps we could say that electrons one and two are, and now comes the analysis, entities X and Y such that if X were up, Y would be down. If Y were down, X would be up, and so on and so on, a bunch of counterfactions describing that counterfactual interrelation we found. However, first, this is again only counterfactual interdependence. And secondly, at least on a standard view, 
such counterfactuals counterfactual, must be grounded by or made true by or whatever, a uh, 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 suitable underlying fact. So what fact? Here's a possible view, this position of essentialism, not at all my view, but just to see, see an option. Um, we may perhaps say as, as this position essentialist that uh, our antithesis X and Y have an irreducible joint disposition to deliver in spin measurement with equal probability, either up, down or down up. So, okay, that's the fundamental disposition. And this disposition sustains that package of, uh, of counterfactuals. That would be the idea. But this is a version of foundationalism. This disposition, this joint disposition would be uh, postulated as fundamental, or at least as, as relatively fundamental with respect to the pattern of manifestation. And in any case, in any case no metaphysical interdependence really. So second attempt. Recall that the entangled state, the singlet state, is written in terms of the possible pure states, up, down, down, up. Untechnically, we wrote 50% up, down, and 50% down, up. And this manner of the standard manner of writing the, 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 the superposition state may suggest that the singlet state, metaph metaphysically, and now I mean not a particular state of particular electrons, but the single state as a universal, as it were, um, is a metaphysical construction on the basis of the pure states, again, as universals, so to speak. So we may perhaps say that the singlet state uh, of, our, of two electrons is the result of applying an operation of uh, 50% 50, 50 proportion or so to the two pure complex states, X is up and Y is down, and X is down and Y is up. Okay, whatever the merits and whatever the problems of such an approach, um, even if successful, it would only show that the singlet state as a universal metaphysically depends on the two pure states as universals. Not that any states of different particles involved mutually depend on each other. So in sum, no attempted analysis here um, of the integral state even points to a reciprocal metaphysical dependence of particles with regard to their state. Summary on entanglement. First, the coherence view of quantum entanglement is superficial if it states only a harmless reciprocal dependence deriving from relational essence, which foundationalists can, can happily accept. Second, the view results from an ambiguity of the term dependence if broadly causal, counter, causal counterfactual interdependencies between facts are misinterpreted as metaphysical. And third, it is insubstantial if a metaphysical analysis of entangled states in terms of metaphysical interdependence is only claimed in a highly, highly, highly abstract manner, but not, not supplied in any substantial metaphysically concrete way. Now, third part, what's the deep problem here? My diagnosis is that the the problem for coherentism is insubstantiality. So recall that it's quite a consensus that metaphysical dependence in the two forms of essence and ground is intimately linked to or even identical to a specifically metaphysical form of explanation. And now compare scientific explanation. For example, physics does not explain, say, electric conductivity by containing an explicit theoretic clause. By the way, metals are in certain states that explain conductivity. Instead, the physical theory of conduction bands, that's, ba that's basically the theory here in the, in the background, itself is free of the notion of explanation. 
And it's only the job of a meta-discipline, what we call philosophy of science or philosophy of physics in that case, to explicitly conceptualize and assess explanatory achievements. And similarly for metaphysics, I would say that a metaphysical theory is not successful in explaining a phenomenon by simply postulating relations of explanation or dependence or essence or ground, if these are taken to be intimately linked to the notion of explanation to obtain. Instead, the substantial first order metaphysical theory should as far as possible be free of the notion of explanation, dependence and so on. It is only the job of a meta discipline, what we call meta metaphysics to conceptualize and assess assess explanatory relations as they arise from substan substantial metaphysics. So my diagnosis is that coherentists basically confound substantial first order metaphysics with meta metaphysics, uh, because in their accounts, the meta notion of dependence or explanation is used as an indispensable part in stating their allegedly uh, metaphysical view. But what in fact they can do not provide and cannot provide are concrete, substantial, first order metaphysical accounts that then from a meta perspective are convincingly interpreted as engendering symmetric metaphysical dependence on explanation. So and in particular, our coherentists are uh, about entanglement jump right from the facts of physics with, with which they are concerned to an interpretation in highly, highly abstract meta metaphysical terms of dependence and explanation, mutual dependence. That's I call the coherentist stunt here. Um, uh, and what coherentists skip in that stunt are necessary intermediary steps or first, an interpretation of the physical facts close to physics within the philosophy of physics. And then secondly, a substantial concrete metaphysical account of quantum states, quantum measurement, blah, blah, and so on. And only then one may arrive at, a, at an assessment in those meta metaphysical terms of explanation and, and dependence. So in my view is that this lack of substantial metaphysics and currentism is no accident because consider plausible explanation engendering first order relations in metaphysics. What uh, uh, Wilson called the small G relations and uh, Karen Bennett is called the building relation, something like that. So, composition, material constitution, set formation, formation of qua objects, we had them earlier, property abstraction, uh, propositional abstraction, formation of logically complex contents out, out of simpler ones, whatever you find plausible. Very plausibly, they all have all those first order relations have a built in direction of constitutivity that does not toler tolerate symmetry. So I would suggest the following more general lesson, explanation, essence, ground, dependence, things like, this, things like that, are best regarded as notions of meta-metaphysics, not of first order metaphysics proper. And here's a, an except from the recent Routledge handbook of meta-metaphysics. Uh, from the content. So we have a chapter on grounding, on metaphysical explanation, on essence. I like that. That's exactly the place where those notions belong in the handbook of meta metaphysics, not of metaphysics or first order metaphysics. So, ideally, at least, substantial first order metaphysical claims ought to be free of those abstract, as it were, evaluative diagnostic meta notions. And in any case, there's no indication that any substantial first order metaphysical relations engender deep reciprocal relations of metaphysical explanation and dependence as claimed by uh, coherentists. So 
if you take foundationalism to proclaim as it were the dictatorship of the pro pro proletariat the fundament you know uh, let me close with a uh, uh, with a uh, with a sentence foundationalists of all countries don't worry and carry on that's it and i thank you for your patience I'll start with just a, an apology that um, a number of you here were uh, present at the Change and Changemakers Conference a couple of months ago. And uh, I gave a version of this paper then. And by the time that I found out that there'd be this overlap, it was sort of too late to, to work up anything different. The good news is that it's considerably improved since then, or at least changed, hopefully improved. So. Sara Ahmed, and for people who don't know who Sara Ahmed is, she's a very prominent um, Australian now resident in the UK, uh, feminist and queer theorist. Sara Ahmed, in her book, What's the Use on the Uses of Use, describes a phenomenon she calls queer use. Here are some of the things she says about it. Queer use is to make use audible, to listen to use, to bring to the front what ordinarily recedes into the background. It is how things can be used in ways other than for which they were intended or by those other than for whom they were intended. It involves a commitment to a principle that not all uses could or even should be foreseen and can therefore lead to releasing a potentiality that already resides in things, given how they have taken shape. It is not being willing to receive the will of the colonizer and hence living in proximity to violence. To queer use can be to linger on the material qualities of that which you are supposed to pass over. Queer use can be offered as an ethics of finitude, an appreciation of the wrinkle or the scratch. That's a tapestry of quotations from a few pages of her book. Having already in, my, in hand my own neo-Aristotelian theory of artifacts, I want to suggest that it allows us to see queer use as not only the socio-political phenomenon it is, but as genuinely ontological as well. It is capable of creating and destroying things. So I'll begin with just a brief and dogmatic account of my existing approach to artifacts. The founding principle is a version of Aristotle's claim that for substances, the formal, efficient and final causes often coincide. What a thing is, the formal cause, and what it is for, the final cause, are one and the same. And that from which the change originates, the efficient cause, is the same in form as these. That's from the physics. What I take Aristotle to be getting at is that for objects that fall within the scope of a theory governed by this principle, one cannot separate an account of what such objects are, formal causes, from accounts of how they come to be, efficient causes, and what their functions or characteristic activities, final causes, are. Certain kinds of objects essentially have certain kinds of origins and certain kinds of uses and functions. So this is how it looks when applied to artifacts, which is really the, the sort of paradigm for which the whole theory was developed. Artifactual kinds are associated definitionally with certain functions, chairs with a function for being sat on, for example. It's a little too simple because there might be functionless artifacts, but um, generally speaking, that's true. By working on some matter with the intention of making an artifact of kind K, the maker, if successful, brings into existence an object of kind K, which as such has the function associated with Ks. So there you have the, the unity of the origin, the making with the intention to make a K, the essence of the thing and its function. The trick is accomplished by the makers imposing the concept of the kind onto the matter that the artifact is being made out of. The artifact is distinct from its matter, 
it has the function of Ks essentially, the matter does not. And it's also required to be separate if we are to, to allow, as we should, that a given artifact can change its matter over time while maintaining its identity. What then is the artifact? The standard approach to this among contemporary neo-Aristotelians is to bring into the picture a third entity in addition to the object itself and its matter that plays the role of form. The artifact is some kind of product, is some kind of composite of that third entity and its matter. For reasons I won't go into here, that, so that's the approach of Catherine Kozlicki and Kit Fine and, and um, people in that tradition. So for reasons I won't go into here, into here, I find this unsatisfactory. Rather, I think we should take such objects, artifacts, to be sui generis. This isn't meant to be an embarrassing retreat. It is what we should want to say. Artifacts are ontologically distinctive in having their functions built in as they do. I call such things ideal objects, but by ideal, I don't mean that they're not real, they're the realest things in my opinion, but they're objects which depend essentially in position of mind onto matter, an imposition that takes the form typically of intentional work on them. The intention throws a shadow forward and it is this shadow that, as it were, is over the artifact, making of it an ideal object. I, I recognize that that's all metaphorical, and you'd probably like a less metaphorical account of it, which I can't give. Um, so against this background now, I'm going to introduce a concept of what I call counter use. And it's both narrower in some ways and broader than others than Ahmed's queer use but it is nonetheless designed to capture a lot of what she is interested in. And it will be capable, as I hope to show, of performing ontological work. I think of counter use as something that is done collectively by a number of agents or by a community rather than by a single individual, although a single agent might accomplish it if she's sufficiently important or prominent. It is undertaken deliberately and thus requires a collective and at least somewhat explicit intention to change the norms governing the ongoing use of a type of object or of an individual object in virtue of its belonging to a kind under which it is subject to the governing norms being challenged. Counter use is thus performative in its contemporary sense. Its status as counter use is intended to be recognized as such and its success depends, at least in part, on this recognition. The norms that are challenged by it, in the first instance, I'll refine this a little later, are the norms governing the intended use of the artifacts in question. And if intended use is understood broadly, this may include restrictions on who is entitled to use an object. So counter use will typically involve multiple agents using artifacts in ways that lie outside their intended use, uses, which may on occasion consist simply in their use by unintended users, or perhaps better, by intended non-users. This use will be performative and aimed at significant change regarding the object or type of object in question. There are two areas where this needs to be extended to, to bring it in connection with um, showing the ontological potential of counter use in a way that's um, syntonic with Ahmed's treatment of queer use. So uh, one is, it, is in explaining how use can be creative in general, and particularly use by a disparate group of people. And I won't talk about that here just because there's no time, but just uh, to give two little bits of the picture, um, use is creative when you're using an object other than the one you're creating. Otherwise, there's an obvious paradox in bringing into an existence an object by using it. So it's by using one thing as a something that you bring into existence a something. So, for example, um, Zimmerman's, exact, Zimmerman's case that was intended as a reductio of Lynn Baker's views 
there's suppose I use a piece of driftwood as a coffee table. Um, so I would say it's by using the driftwood, which isn't a coffee table, as a coffee table, that you thereby bring into an into existence a coffee table that's distinct from the the driftwood. It has the driftwood as its matter. So that's one point. And the other point is just an invocation of Benedict Anderson's idea of an imagined community as the right kind of collective for performing um, counter use or queer use. Um, but uh, I'm going to, in the, the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on a different area where the theory of artifacts needs to be augmented. So take a case that the core account that I outlined above of artifact seems tailor-made for an artisanal Swiss watchmaker makes beautiful and original one-off watches on commission. There are the materials out of which the watch is to be made on a workbench, springs, cogs, diamonds, and so on. The watchmaker sets to work on these materials with the goal of making an artifact of a certain kind, a watch. It's by working on the materials with that intention that it's by working that mind, the concept watch, that features in the artist, artisan's creative intentions gets imposed onto the matter, the result being a unified single object, the watch, that has those materials as its matter, but is distinct from them, since it will persist even as they're replaced. The entire description of this situation is confined to the artisan's mind and the materials on her workbench. But of course, that is not actually a description of the entire situation. There are many further factors at work in the background. There are the sources of the materials used. The diamonds are blood diamonds. The cogs are made by a small women-owned collaborative in Mumbai. There are the conditions of capitalism that allow someone to pay a huge amount for a custom-made luxury. And clearly one could go on indefinitely like this. When the artisan makes this particular watch at this particular time, it is like a nexus for all these forces, conditions, and histories. When introducing the idea of the imposition of mind onto matter above, I use the metaphor of the maker's intention casting a shadow forward over the resulting object, making it ideal. That was the thing that makes it an ideal object. The same metaphor can be used here. All sorts of circumstances, in addition to the maker's intention, cast a shadow over the object. So the scope of its ideality can be much enlarged. Can we make any sense of this idea? Well, here's a, an attempt, and I've no idea if it will hold up, but it's fairly precise, so at least there's that. So associated with any artifact is an indefinite set of historical conditions. Some will pertain to the particular object in virtue of its kind, and some in virtue of its particularity. Not all of these conditions need be known by anyone who makes or uses the artifact, but at least for artifact kinds that are still current, we may expect most makers and users to be aware of some subset of these conditions. And for some of those known, some number will be deemed salient by that person. It will not be the same known and salient conditions for everyone, but consider some subset of the indefinite set of all conditions that are such that one would reasonably expect them to be widely known and considered salient. Call this an artifact normative salient conditions set, or NSC for short. Now, obviously, the main debt that, that I'm incurring in pursuing this line um, would be to say how members of the artifacts NSC are to be determined. I've left it fairly vague talking about um, salience. Uh, but for, suppose for the sake of argument that you could have at least widespread consensus on at least core members of an artifact's NSC. Now my claim might initially be put forward as follows. 
for any particular artifact A, A is essentially dependent on it satisfying the conditions in its NSC. By itself, this will yield counterintuitive results. Not all cases in which an object acquires a new salient property will be cases in which it is replaced by a new object. So some story, and here's another big debt, some story must be told about the kinds of changes an artifact's NSC can undergo to account for ordinary change over time. Now, call an artifact's NSC its historicity. I use this word because in the full paper, there's a quotation from Philip K. Dick's Man in the High Castle, where a collector is in, talking about the historicity of a cigarette lighter that was in the pocket of Franklin Delano Roosevelt when he was assassinated in that alternative world. So that's part of its historicity. Um, changes to, to the artifact's historicity beyond those permitted by ordinary changes over time will result in the creation of a new object. What happens to the original object will depend on the particular circumstances, as I'll illustrate later. We cannot, of course, change which conditions have been true of it and salient, but we can create new conditions that go beyond those permitted by ordinary change over time. And most important, we can change which of, which of its conditions is salient in a way that one would expect a reasonable person to know of the salience. These are the ways in which counter use is capable of creation. So an initial example that I won't talk, up, talk about a lot, um, but just to give you an initial idea, is the case of slurs, slurring terms. So it's certainly a highly salient feature of slurs that they are used to derogate some population to which they apply. Counter-use of the slur in the form of reappropriation by the group changes that by ostentatiously using such words to create solidarity rather than division. Hence, it brings about the creation of a new word, since the reappropriated word has a different NCS from the old one. The new word might be homophonous with it, but it might also differ subtly in pronunciation or orthography. What happens to the old world, the old word in this case? Uh, the old word, I say, continues to exist. So one can use a word that sounds one way to derogate, and one can use a different word that sounds the same to engender solidarity among the derogated group. And of course, which word one uses will depend on one's own circumstances. And it may often be opaque to the user which one she is uttering. So the phenomenon of someone's wanting to be called by using one of these terms, but they're not really authorized to use it. So they end up, unbeknownst to them, using the old term um, and hence causing offense. That phenomenon is, is well attested. So let me now, and, and this will really be the rest of the paper, try and make this less schematic by considering a couple of examples in more detail. So first, think of an anti-slavery museum that is housed in a slave plantation. The plantation has intended uses and intended users. But after the end of slavery, it is no longer used by those users for those uses. Someone comes along, purchases the place, and begins to display artifacts that can convey how monstrous slavery is, and people come to view the things displayed. At this point, the users are counter-using a slave plantation as a museum. But as a result of this counter-use, a new object, a museum, comes into existence. And when this object is used as a museum, it's no longer counter-use, but ordinary use. That's what museums do. 
when people mount slavery related displays and others come to view the, view them they are intended users who are using the museum in accord with its intended uses what happens to the original object the slave plantation in this case unlike the case of the slurs and unlike the next case that i'm going to discuss in this case the original object which was subject initially to counter use doesn't exactly disappear it becomes the matter for the new object that is made out of it the museum the intended uses and intended uses and intended uses of the plantation are on display themselves the plantation itself is an exhibit in the new museum. This is quite different from a situation in which, say, a slave plantation becomes a modern art museum. In this case, the museum would be made directly from the matter out of which the plantation was made, the buildings and so on. But the plantation itself would no longer exist at all. Nor would we have in the modern art museum any counter use at all. At no point was there a performative rearrangement by an imagined community of the saliences of the former slave plantation. The method by which the art museum comes to exist is not accomplished through counter use, but by different mechanisms. Within this context, we can actually accommodate several of the things that Ahmed says about queer use that I quoted above. Not only do we have the salient contrast between the intended users um, of the plantation, namely white plantation owners and black slaves, and the counter use uh, and the counter users, people of all races intermingling in a common repudiation of slavery, and the contrast between the intended use of the plantation, profitable production of some commodity, and the use made by the counter users, education, memorialization, and so on. The counter use also makes use audible. It forces on us the recognition of the original intended use and the use currently being made of it. It lingers on the material qualities of that which you are supposed to pass over. The new use displays the material qualities of the plantation. We see how small and poorly insulated the slave quarters are and how sumptuous the main house. It offers us an appreciation of the wrinkle or the scratch. We see as marks of resistance, the scrawled initials on the wall, or as evidence of oppression, the well-worn handle of a whip. Furthermore, since the counter use before the non-counter, the regular use of the museum, but the counter use is, is still of the plantation being used to make the museum, um, it's likely to be happening when there are still people who value the original object highly. So suppose this is being done right after the American Civil War. Hence, it could be described as not being willing to receive the will of the colonizer, and it would place the counter users in proximity to violence, a visit from the KKK or something. Okay, here's a different example, a second one. And this is a case that's also discussed by Ahmed, squatting. So suppose there's a house that was built by a single family home built as a single family home in a suburban area in the USA. We have some idea of its historicity, the erection of the suburbs, white flight, the assumption of whiteness by previously non-white people, such as Italians and Poles, redlining, the attempt to shape a nuclear family out of, by the standards of the powerful, the unruly family structures of recent immigrants, and so on. The house we are imagining has all that historicity, but it no longer has any people in it. The owners are very wealthy, live elsewhere, and keep the property empty as part of a tax write-off scheme. Now imagine that a loose-knit group of idealistic but down-on-their-luck young people 
LGBTQ kids who have been kicked out of their family homes by their parents see the empty house, break into it, and start living there, not as a nuclear family at all, but as a commune of some sort. They continue to use the structure as a place to live and the kitchen as a place to prepare food and so on. But the difference between their community and the nuclear family structure adds new salient conditions to the building and subtracts others. Ahmed quotes um, Erica Doucette and Marty Huber, who write that the range of uses for squatted buildings is often much wider than simply providing a place to live. These projects link ideals with material realities and utopias." Unquote. The kids in question make counter use of the building, thereby displacing one set of ideals, those of the nuclear white family with two children and a dog, with another set of ideals, those of oppressed people who dream of utopia ideals that revolve around the tradition stretching back to antiquity of people forming intentional communities, around the place of LGBTQ people in our society, especially children who find themselves rejected by their families, revolve around anti-capitalist protest in the Occupy movement, and so on. Their case would be quite different from a case in which another nuclear family simply moves into the empty home and makes unauthorized use of it. This would not constitute counter use and would not bring into existence any new thing. Unlike the slave plantation and the museum, squatting does not require that the earlier historicity remain in place. The earlier historicity is not being made into an exhibit. What is important lies in the transformation, the takeover of one part of the artifactual environment, and it's being put into the service of other ideals. The essential project of the intentional community in its history um, does not require it to be created in the immediate space of a non-intentional community, a nuclear family, but it does require the loosening of the grip that the nuclear family holds and squatting one particular route to an intentional community is one way in which the utopian actually gets to work at this loosening. The result is, on my account, a genuinely new object. The old object depended essentially on its NSC, its historicity, for existence. The loss of that historicity through the rearrangement of salient conditions and the replacement of it by a new one means the destruction of the old object and the creation of the new. But it does not bring into it, so this is unlike again the museum and the slave plantation, it does not bring into existence an object of a new kind. Right. All that happens is that one house or home is trans is is uh, transformed into a numerically distinct house or home characterized by its historicity. OK, that's that's what I got. I dropped off the um, title, the metaphysics of objects. Um, Bit and one of the reasons is because I think and I'm trusting that what I want to say it, it's a tiny suggestion, um, but I I'm trusting that what I want to say it's going to be actually neutral uh, with respect to the metaphysics. So whichever metaphysics one has, you might be able to plug it into the um, the suggestion and still have um, an intelligible um, an intelligible proposal on the table um, for scrutiny. So what I want to do. Really, the, 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 the new stuff, the, the, the suggestion is going to happen in section two, but um, I need to give you a little bit about where I'm coming from so that it makes um, sense, so that you, you see where I'm coming from when it um, comes to the conceptual um, engineering move that I would be submitting for scrutiny. So let me start with um, 
why I'm unhappy with um, accounts of metaphysical knowledge that um, base their the source of knowledge on concepts. So um, my position has been an evolving um, argument to the effect that concepts have a very limited role to play in the epistemology of modality. So in the epistemology of modality about concreta in particular. Um, against um, um, conceivability accounts, for instance, and by, um, by which I um, mean accounts like Chalmers and Yamblos, but also Williamson's. Um, um, Williamson's would be a counterfactual account, but it's also a conceivability um, account. And my, my reason for the satisfaction with this um, type of accounts is that conceivability um, turns out to be a guide to possibility, but only to the extent that the reasoner or the conceiver has available some essentialist information that is guiding um, these um, conceivability exercises, which makes them also um, to be essence first epistemologies of modality and this bit will become um, relevant later on so I want to anticipate it here. Now in the case of Chalmers and, and others but not in the case of all conceivability um, people this essential information makes it into the concepts then the um, their concepts resulting in, in modally loaded concepts and so the account resting on that kind of concepts and by modally loaded or essentially loaded concepts I mean concepts whose application conditions require of the entities that are to fall under them to have certain modal profile. Generalizing beyond the conceivability accounts um, therefore I have been hostile, hostile to the idea of a concept-based epistemology of essence which crudely put would take that would take it that our epistemic access to essential truths is intimately tied to knowledge of conceptual truths, again resting on concepts being uh, modally or essentially loaded. By way of a footnote, for the purposes of this um, talk, I'm not distinguishing necessity and essence. So when I speak of modally loaded or essentially loaded, um, you might want to take me as. Um, um, speaking of the same, even though um, we know that there are good um, metaphysical arguments there for the divorce between modality and essence. My complaint here is that um, I think that as a matter of fact, our concepts are not modally loaded, they are modally neutral. For instance, I don't think that it's part of the concept or the nature of the concept um, being human that origins are essential to the entities that fall under them. And so the concept of humanity doesn't impose the essentialist constraint um, about origins to the entities that are to fall under, under that concept. Now, uh, I have recently been strengthening that kind of complaint. Um, you can see that this complaint is just, as a matter of fact, I don't think that concepts are so. There is, um, this is, if you want an empirical claim or just a report of, of my beliefs. Um, but recently I have been um, strengthening that complaint and argued that even if concepts, the salient ones um, for the purposes of modal epistemology, even if some concepts were modally loaded, concepts would still have a very limited role to play in the epistemology of modality. And the main reason, um, um, which might also give you an idea of why I was coming from um, yesterday um, um, uh, in discussion with uh, Mark and, and Mark Jago and his um, talk, the main problem is that if our concepts are modally loaded, then admittedly, they are going to be able to generate conceptual essentialist principles. Like if it's part of, if it were part of our concept of humanity, um, that humans have their origins essentially, then in the same and mysterious way in which we can come to know that um, bachelors are unmarried men, we would be able to know that humans have their origins essentially. That would be an essentialist principle, but it would be of a conceptual type um, and we would have a readily available epistemology of those essentialist principles. But admittedly, even if our concepts um, were modally loaded and thus generating this kind of conceptual essentialist principles, 
Now, the, the question and depressing question for the concept-based epistemologist of modality would be how we can knowledgeably apply them. So if I encounter a human-like organism, the relevant epistemological question now is how do I know that the concept of humanity is so modally loaded understood applies to that organism in front of me? And these questions have been left unaddressed. So the idea that we can have knowledge of essentialist principles by conceptual analysis, while at the same time maintaining or treating the knowledgeable application of those concepts as unproblematic, that idea that we can have both things would be a myth. Because if, if concepts are essentially loaded, then the thought with those concepts that Socrates is a human being might not be a modal thought in its surface, but it's definitely a modal and essentially thought um, in its deep structure. And, and, and the epistemology of these kind of facts would need to be um, accounted for. And it would be precisely where the, the hardness of the epistemological tasks would lie. So the idea that you can have concept-based concept concept-based known essentialist principles and still treating knowledge of facts like Socrates is human as unproblematic, that this tandem um, cannot be had. I mean, if you have the one, you're going to be um, having locating the problem on thoughts like Socrates is human. And if you don't have that problem, that's because your concepts are not model loaded. So you don't have um, concept-based essentialist knowledge. So this is the rubric of the main problem. Now, there is a corollary problem for this type of accounts that stems from the fact that they rest model knowledge in turn on the essentialist knowledge. And this is something that I anticipated earlier on and I said it would be relevant later on. So then now it's when it's relevant. So a crude caricature of concept-based epistemologies um, and, and, and this is all bold claims and I'm happy to, um, to go deeper um, into them during the Q&A, but just for the sake of giving you enough context so as to be able to make sense of what will come in section two. A crude caricature of the, um, of the diagnosis is that possibility knowledge on these um, essence first accounts is explained as somewhat derivative of essentialist or necessary uh, knowledge. So graphically, what you have is that you would have here the essential truths, you would have epistemic access to them. And because ontologically, the possibilities are taken to be those things that are compatible with the essences, you would be able to access them by, by derivation. So these kind of accounts, I take them that because of what their structure of model knowledge is, these kind of accounts are very powerful if they succeeded. So we would just need to focus on the orange bit of the, of the phenomenon to, to explain and that would give us the rest of it, the, the possibility cone um, by deduction. The problem, I'm going to summarize two problems. The uh, two problems, let me, okay. One of them, the first one, is that um, it suffers from extensional fragility in the sense. Uh, all right. Sorry, is, this, is my voice coming okay? I can't really see you. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Good. So there is some extension of fragility in the sense that if one gets the, the essence is wrong, for instance, is if one were to think that there are less essential facts than there actually are, then one would think that possibility is less, const less constrained than it actually is. So one would think that the cone of possibilities is larger than it actually is. And on the other hand, if one were to believe in more essential facts than there actually are, what one would think that the cone of possibilities is smaller than it actually is. And this extensional fragility um, at the same time turns into a, 
an explanatory fragility precisely because um, when essentialist knowledge is not satisfactorily explained, as I think it's the case of the concept-based um, accounts, um, when essentialist knowledge is not satisfactorily explained, then this deficit is going to compromise also the explanations that one is to um, give when it comes to knowledge of possibility, because in these accounts, knowledge of possibility is uh, parasitic or very strongly dependent on knowledge of essence. Now, this first problem is just a problem about there being an explanatory deficit. Someone might want to say, well, yes, OK. Um, Yes, okay, what all, all this shows is that um, I, we still have a lot of work to do, so let's keep on working and, and complete our, um, our epistemology by saying something um, to secure the, um, the explanation of uh, our essentialist knowledge. That would be great, but I think that there is a second kind of problem that it's not going to be... Um, um, it's going to be more damaging if if um, if it's shared. Um, so the problem is that on essence first accounts, because of their analysis of possibility knowledge is somewhat derivative on essentialist knowledge, on essence first accounts, our rational degree of confidence that this desk can break cannot be higher than my rational degree of confidence about my desk's um, um, essential properties. And I think that this um, gets the rational degrees um, wrong. I think that um, for reasons actually that Barbara was alluding to um, yesterday as well during um, one of the Q&As, I think that I can rationally believe that this table can break to a degree that is to, 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 to a degree that I um that it's um sorry I can rationally doubt the table's essential properties to a degree that is would not be rational for me to doubt that the table can break. And the same for many other ordinary propositions um, possibilities. So I can um I can rationally doubt that I am essentially a human being to a degree that I cannot doubt that my arm can break. And this fact is incapable of being accommodated by an essence first account. And if one shares the philosophical instinct that I'm onto in this slide, then this, um, this problem no longer points to an explanatory deficit, but it's now pointing to an explanatory inadequacy. Whichever explanation of possibilities can be engendered by this kind of accounts is not going to be adequate because it's not going to respect the the the, the robustness or 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 yeah the robustness of our epistemic foundations for the kind of knowledge possibilities and the kind of knowledge uh, necessities slash um, essential facts. Because of this um, explanatory inadequacy, um, then um, I think that this problem calls for different developments altogether. And that's what I've been doing in part of my research as well. And for the case of concrete entities, I have been suggesting an inductive epistemology. So my reaction to these um, problems that I was um, um, briefly summarizing um, has been like, well, okay, forget about essentialist knowledge and then um, focus instead on possi ordinary possibility knowledge. Can we say something satisfactorily about that kind of knowledge um, that would be independent of antecedent knowledge of essence? So we need, um, therefore, um, my reaction has been um, to identify a need for an epistemology of possibilities that is not reliant on antecedent essentialist information. And the core idea of the inductive epistemology that I, um, that I favor is to say that we know about unrealized the rare possibilities because we've seen their kind realized somewhere else. So I know that this table can break because I have seen the type broken table, the possibility of uh, a broken table realized somewhere else. And on the basis of that realization, I extrapolate and I come to, um, to um, have evidence for the break for the possible breaking of this table. 
Um, I know that I could survive um, a six hour cardiac arrest because I know that that has happened to another woman and I am relevantly similar to that, um, to that um, woman on the basis of, for instance, both being women. And again, I know that my desk can break because the one I had prior to it ended up breaking and they are relevantly similar to two entities. Now, there is a common pattern um, in this inductive explanation of um, knowledge of unrealized rare possibilities. And it's that there is a principle that has been inductively arrived at on the basis of observations. And the principle is um, always of the following form from some entity having a given property, we can epistemically safely transition to that entity possibly having another property. Instances on the basis of the last two um, slides, from something being a desk, one can transition to its possibility of breaking. From something being a woman, one can transition to its possibility of surviving a six hour cardiac, um, cardiac, so that's a type here, cardiac arrest. I am currently, but I'm not going to be saying much about it, but I am currently working on an extension of this inductive road, um, route to the effect that I don't think it's essential to it, that um, it always be possibilities that we transition to. I think that with adequate observations, we can transition to necessities as well. The only problem is that as a matter of fact, it just so happens that for the typical essentialist principles that um, have been generating a lot of literature, we do happen to lack the relevant observations that would, um, would allow us to inductively know them. So there is an actual um, limitation, actual current limitation on the basis of our current evidence. And that is the, the fact that this inductive route doesn't allow us to decide whether the typical essentialist principles like essentiality of origins or essentiality of kind are true or false. Now, to put it graphically and in relation to the previous graphic um, that um, you saw in relation to the essence first accounts, I think that while essence first epistemologies are powerful yet fragile for the reasons that I was giving, the inductive strategy delivers a slow but sure progress. And for me, this is um, a virtue of the account, but it's limited, all right? So what I think that happens is that we start um, in the dark as to how stringent or permissive the set of essential properties are. And therefore we are also in the dark about how large the cone of possibilities um, is. And by the way, this can be taken um, as the possibilities for the world, but also it, it would be structurally analogous if we were to focus on the essences and cone of possibilities for one particular individual. So um, the, the structure, the, the thought would be structurally analogous. So what happens is that the inductive epistemology, we start in the dark and what it gives us, it's a mean means to reveal certain possibilities as being there. For instance, that my desk can break, that, um, that John Kennedy could have died of a heart attack. This is the kind of possibilities that we do can secure with this inductive epistemology. And, um, and, and we can um, use it to reveal uh, quite a bunch of them. I also think that this possibility knowledge that we can reveal will turn into for lack of a better word, I'm going to be referring as negative essentialist principle, uh, essentialist knowledge. But what I mean by that is that if, for instance, this possibility is the possibility that my desk can break, well, I know that um, I know that definitely whichever um, among these um, hypotheses about the essential facts that I might consider, I know that definitely they, none of them, will include the um, principle that tables are essentially unbreakable. Um, the more possibilities that I reveal with this inductive route, the more negative essentialist knowledge I can, I can transition to, but it would not be knowledge of some principles belonging to the set of essential facts, rather some principles not belonging, okay? 
Now, if I were to be able to reveal possibilities belonging to this, uh, this part of the, um, of the possibility realm, then that would in turn um, mean that I can rule out the set of essential facts to be so stringent as to um, not allowing for them because I know that they would be possibilities. So for instance, if I've just recently um, revealed that it is a possibility for me and, and for women in general to survive six hour cardiac arrests. And on the assumption that, for instance, it perhaps was part of this hypothesis that women are essentially such that they don't survive six, um, um, six hour cardiac arrest. My having revealed that possibility amounts to me being able to rule out that the set of, pos of um, essential facts is so um, stringent. Good. However, um, um, good. Also, that would um, also allow me to rule out that the cone is so small. Now, the limitations now graphically um, they would translate. Um, if if I take this graphic, they would translate into the uh, the claim that um, the essentiality of origins and the essentiality of kind as high, as essentialist hypothesis they would be located in this area where we on the basis of this inductive epistemology are neither um, in a position to assert nor in a position to rule out, all right? So if I consider the question whether Gandhi um, can be a cat, um, the idea is that, well, the, if, if the possibility is so, it would be here, but there is nothing in this inductive epistemology that allows me to reveal it to be there. And the same with Malala's possibility of having Obama's origin. If it is a possibility, I'm still, um, I'm still in the dark with respect to it. So what you've got now with this, um, with this um, um, epistemology is that it delivers this kind, this, this kind of knowledge and with these limitations. What I want to do, and that's going to um, bring us already to section two, what I want to do is to axiomatize a little bit the information that you've got on the screen um, in a way that might generate essentialist knowledge. So let me turn to um, section two now. I'm gonna start with a little bit on the metaphysics of material objects, but it's not so much about the metaphysics, but rather intuitive facts that I think would be desiderata for any theory of material objects to somehow um, 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 accommodate. So the first one um, is that, let us assume that this is the actual world and there is a table that we can, um, um, that I'm, I'm labeling A, all right? Now, um, it is, it is um, widely uh, um, accepted that uh, these entities, it, spatially um, extended. Um, it is also um, widely accepted that um, ordinary objects like tables are, um, are um, temporally extended as well. For many, um, that will be uh, for dimensional worm. Now, what I want you to um, 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 invite you to consider is the modal dimension and to treat it exactly like the spatial and the temporal one. So um, the previous slide had revealed quite a lot of possibilities. Um, for the table, for instance, it would have revealed with inductive epistemology, it would have revealed that the table um, can last um, for different um, um, it can last longer, can last um, 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 less, it can be painted, it can be moved around, etc. So there would be already quite a lot of uh, possibilities for the table that would have been revealed. I'm just picturing them um, like this, so it can be um, painted in different ways, it can last longer, it can last um, 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 can last more, can last, last less, etc. None of those possibilities will reveal the table as originating from different matter, but neither would it reveal it not being possible for it. So I'm just picturing the possibilities that we know about it, but I'm not picturing because I'm not in a position to uh, the possibilities that we can rule out because we're not ruling out um, um, the table um, having possibly different origins. 
Now, by um, way of merely a terminological um, um, joke, this doesn't look any more like a, a worm at all. So I prefer to um, call it like a manta ray. So it's the object now is going to be um, it's going to have uh, an extension that is no longer looks like a worm. But I'm taking that that's just a uh, consequence of taking the modal dimension into account as well. It might be that um, if, if indeed the table could originate from different origins, um, I, I have done something quite infelicitous in, in painting this in yellow to signal different origins. Perhaps red would have been more visible to you, but this little leg now is um, um, intended as um, having different, uh, being made of different stuff from the leg as it occurs in W1 to W3. So it might be that the table can have different origins, but I'm not in a position to um, I'm not in a position to assert it or deny it on the basis of the um, inductive um, epistemology. Now, one background assumption when we point into a given spatial dimension, when we point into a sp in, in, a, in a spatial direction where there is a table like I'm doing now, so I'm I'm saying this table, all right. Um, it's quite a, a heavy table. So when I point in the direction of a spatial um, in the direction of a spatial region where there is a table, we are going to be interpreted as referring to the largest spatially unified entity in the region that is being pointed at. So if there is a table and I say this table weights 23 kilo by default, I'm going to be taken as referring to the whole of the specially unified entity rather than a proper part with shorter legs. And similarly, when we speak of entities spatial temporally, all right, so if this is the 4D worm um, and this is the current time, and I say this table is 23 years old, all right, I'm going to be speaking perhaps of, uh, depending on what your metaphysics about the future, I just leave that open, but I'm going to be speaking of the whole initial segment that um, that is unified with uh, on the basis of spatial temporal continuity. I'm not going to be, by default, I'm not going to be taken as a speaking of a shorter segment of it, all right? Now, similarly, I want to project now that assumption to the spatial temporal model um, entities. So when we speak of tables in that spatial temporal modally uh, sense, by default, by the same default um, mechanisms, um, we're going to be taken as speaking of the largest spatial temporal modally unified entity. Um, so if, if this table could have different origins than it actually has, um, then there is a spatial temporal modally unified entity that would look um, large as, or at, at least as large as um, you've got pictured in the table. If tables are not, um, um, cannot have alternative origins, well, that entity is going to be um, smaller than it's pictured here. Now, the handicap that um, emerges from the limitations that are identified in the previous section is that um, we don't know how large, um, at least we don't know on the basis of inductive methodology that I um, endorse for concrete entities, we don't know how large that entity is. But we do know that it's a minimum size because something that has been revealed on the, basic, on the basis of the inductive methodology is some possibilities for it, all of which agree um, or don't dispute the origins, but we do have um, epistemic vision of a substantial enough part of this spatial temporal model, modally uh, unified entity. So we do know that it's a minimum size. Now, if I speak of that entity and I say of it that it has its origins essentially, I, I might be speaking truly, but I don't know it on the basis of the, the inductive epistemology. I don't know it because that epistemology neither allows me to um, rule out or assert 
the um, essentiality of origins. So it might be true if, if we are actually seeing all that there is, but we're not justified in saying it. So we do not have the essentialist knowledge, even if it might be true. We don't know if that is, we don't know if the portion that we are seeing is all that there is to be seen about that um, entity. And this is the, the, the place where the um, suggestion about conceptual engineering kicks in. By the way, it's not a suggestion that I'm ready to, uh, to um, endorse, but I do think that it's worth exploring it because it might, ben it, it might be a way of bringing together um, rivals, um, the conceptual base guys and, and people like me that are um, um, unsympathetic or unsatisfied with um, that strategy. So I think it's worth exploring. So the suggestion is um, you can see that um, with the inductive epistemology, we have secured possibility knowledge. And it's very important for me that that secured possibility knowledge is possibility knowledge that is not reliant on antecedent essentialist knowledge, which I think was the, one of the main problems with the essence first um, epistemologies. So we do know that it's a minimum size, this spatial temporal, temporal modally um, 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 uh, entity, it might be that there is more to it that we are not seeing with inductive epistemology, but because we are not seeing um, it, and 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 I haven't found an um, epistemology of essences today that uh, satisfies me, because we are not seeing if there is anything else. Um, the suggestion now is to take the concept table. And the same would be for other types of concepts to take the concept table and load it modally in the way that I wasn't happy with. All right. So the suggested normative decision at this point on the basis of um, what we do see and what we do not see is that as a matter of convention now, our concept table should be so fashioned as to refer to the largest Again, it's going to be a largest modally entity or modally extended entity for whose existence we have direct evidence, regardless of whether this entity is metaphysically a proper part of a larger one or not. We do know these possibilities are being revealed by the entities, then just focus on this. And what you're doing then is you're axiomatizing. If the origins are the same, then you bring into the concept of table that tables have their origins essentially, and, um, and that's the suggestion on the table. Now, pros and cons. What do we gain by, uh, by making this um, conceptual engineering move? With concepts so engineered, we can confidently claim to know that my table's um, actual origins are essential to it because I'm, I'm individuating the table in, that, uh, in a way that secures that origins are essential. Basically what we're doing, as I want you to do, is we're axiomatizing the possibility knowledge that we've got, and we're using the fact that those axioms are actually essential truths of certain modal portions. Whether these portions are proper or improper of the largest, metaphysically speaking, entities that are spatial temporal modally unified. So whether, and, and, and I don't need to know whether they are proper or improper portions, but I've secured their existence in an epistemically robust manner by the help of the inductive epistemology and prior use of modally neutral concepts. So what do we gain? We're gaining essentialist knowledge. And in fact, we're also gaining the expressibility of them because now what I'm doing is that I'm um, the tables I'm talking about are tables that are being individuated in a way that I can truly even say of them that I know that they've got their origins essentially. So in a way, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm regaining the power that um, that we didn't have um, at the beginning with the um, with the inductive epistemology. I'm gaining the power that um, I attributed to the um, essence first accounts 
that the um, inductive epistemology didn't have, at least at the beginning, prior to making this conceptual engineering move, which by, um, to, to stress, it's not that I'm ready to endorse it, but I think that it needs to be um, scrutinized and that's what I want to do. What do we lose? Well, I, it's not clear, and I, I want to hear from, from you. Um, I want to hear whether um, I need to stay away from this uh, suggestion. It might be crazy, but uh, you'll tell me. One thing that we might be losing is perhaps the conceptual resources um, to talk about things that we can know, th that we cannot um, know much essentialist facts about, right? So if our concept remains neutral, um, well, I'm not, uh, but, but if our concept was um, new, modally neutral and then I make it modally loaded, I might perhaps lose the possibility of talking about these larger entities or at least easily talking about them, or at least talking with the new table concept. Um, but they are entities anyway, about which we cannot know much um, about what the essential facts for them are. So um, should we be worried about this um, potential loss? Um, if it's about a loss to talk, uh, if it's a loss, that we might no longer be able to talk about entities about which we can have much essentialist knowledge anyway. Good, so back to the concept-based um, accounts in um, just two um, slides. So some of you might be thinking, okay, so, so all this digression to end up where you thought we shouldn't be, right? So all this digression to end up with modally loaded concepts well, yeah, it's true that despite my complaints um, against the concept-based epistemologies, the suggestion now is that the concept table uh, be so that it guarantees the essentiality of origins for tables. So what about the reasons that I had about, um, against um, them? Am I inheriting those problems or am I not? And I think briefly um, that um, I'm not, but um, again, I want to hear um, what your um, reactions are. What I think is that we would be now with those essentialist um, loaded concepts in a much better position than we were at the beginning of the journey with those concepts. In starting the journey with modally neutral concepts, we're able to knowledgeably apply them to ordinary objects, secure with this application possibility knowledge in a very robust manner, and spe specifically in a, in a manner that is independent of antecedent essentialist knowledge. And this secure and epistemically grounded possibility knowledge is what ensures a known minimum size of the modally extended objects, on which basis we can decide to speak of the objects that are that big without, and I think that for me, this is important, without the risk of reference failure, because we, we are seeing a minimum size of those objects. So without the risk of reference failure, and regardless of what, of what if anything, lies in the, outs, in the unseen portion of the cone. There is no presumption that there isn't anything else, all right? So there's no presumption that there aren't larger modally extended entities, but at the same time, there's no presumption that there are. No presumption also that we can know whether there are or not unseen portions of the largest, metaphysically speaking, modally extended entities. And in fact, the engineering suggestion is a way of minimizing the harm of living with precisely that ignorance. So um, that's, um, yeah, this is basically why I think that it's um, um, important to scrutinize um, a way of, um, with what we've got in a robustly secure, in, a, in an epistemically um, robust manner, with what we've got, can we, can we um, decide to talk of entities in a way such that um, we can speak um, and we can claim essentialist knowledge for the portions that we see. And that was the, uh, the main idea. 
So um, borrowing um, a phrase from Thomas, but for what is indeed a very different um, uh, 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 a different uh, picture, this would be empirically informed concept based um, uh, an empirically informed concept based um, account. And that's um, all I wanted to say. Thank you. Material objects, such as human organisms, persist. They exist at different moments. How do they persist? One mode of persistence is perdurance. As it is widely understood, and as I understand it, perdurance is driven by a space-time analogy. A perduring object is extended in time in a way that is analogous to how it is extended in space. I call this the perdurance intuition. How can this rough intuition be sharpened? How can we make it a little more precise? The usual way of doing this is to start with a very well-known definition of the notion of a temporal part. For any x, y, and t, x is an instantaneous temporal part of y at t. By definition, if and only if first x exists at, but only at t, x is a part of y at t, and three x overlaps at t everything that is a part of y at t. This is, of course, Ted Sider's definition. Everyone, probably everyone will be familiar with it, so I won't have to say much about it. So using this notion of a temporal part, the standard formulation of perdurance is this. I need to go back. For any continued x, x perdures if and only if x exists at different moments by having different instantaneous temporal parts at the different moments. So notice this is not a definition. This is supposed to be a formulation or an account of the perdurance intuition. Okay, so why does that capture the space-time analogy at the heart of perdurance? Here's why. Take the spatial case first. A material object, such as a human organism, exactly occupies an extended spatial region. This is spatially extended. It does not oc exactly occupy any of the subregions, but intuitively it fills this whole region it exactly occupies and kind of covers all the subregions. So how does it get to cover all the subregions of its exact location? Answer, by being partly there. It has spatial parts there. Analogously, a perduring continuum, a perduring object, is strictly present, as I uh, would like to put it is strictly present at an temporally extended interval. It is not strictly present at any of the moments, but intuitively it persists through this whole interval. So, in the ordinary sense of existing at a time, it exists at each of the moments in the interval. How does it? How does it do it? Answer: By being partly there, by having temporal parts there, by having different temporal parts at the different moments. So, this is the space-time analogy, and we're sharpening it, we're making it clear by means of this notion of an instantaneous temporal part. The extension to extended temporal parts is straightforward. I won't talk about uh, extended temporal parts. My aim in this talk is to criticize the standard formulation of perdurance in terms of the standard definition of temporal parts. And I will criticize in light of the distinction between mereologically structured and unstructured object, the neo-Aristotelian distinction between structured and unstructured objects. My first step will, of course, be to introduce this distinction between structured and unstructured objects, and I will do it by completely ignoring the temporal dimension of objects. So we'll just do it in a spatial domain. Okay, the way I understand this distinction, it concerns the relationship between an object's parts and its nature or essence. This is how I understand it. How are an ob a composite object's parts related to its nature or essence. So both the view that composite objects are neurologically structured and the view that they're unstructured concern this relationship between objects' parts to its essence. So let's begin with the view of composite objects as unstructured. And let's take a human organism as an example, right? So a human organism falls under the kind being a human organism, and it has parts that fall under certain kinds too, as a, as a heart and a brain and other organs. And these parts are arranged in a certain way, very schematically, I'll say they are arranged human organism-wise, but none of that qualitative stuff, that the whole is a human organism, that 
one part is a heart, another part is a brain, that they're arranged in organism wise. None of that is essential to the object if the object is unstructured. All that matters when it comes to the nature of the object is that it has particular objects as parts. So here's a little graph. Um, o is an organism, A is one part, B is another part. Very simplified. A is, say, the uh, heart, and B is a brain of O. The arrow indicates not just, I emphasize that, not just being a proper part of, but rather making a contribution to the nature of. That's what the arrow is for, right? So it's essential to O that it have A as a part, and it's essential that B have a part. It's not essential to O that A is a heart, and it's not essential that B uh, is a brain, nor is it essential that they're arranged human organism-wise. None of that is essential. All that matters is which object O has as parts. So that makes O unstructured, that none of these qualitative attributes play any role for its nature. That's why it's unstructured. This is a spatial case. A is at spatial region R1, B is at spatial region R2. We already know, well, the organism is spatially extended. It is exactly occupied at a region that includes R1 and R2, but O is not exactly located at either R1 or R2. How does it how does it get to be spatially extended? So how does O, intuitively speaking, cover R1 and R2? Well, by having a part, namely A, that is exactly located R1, and another one, B, that is exactly located R2. So in short, O gets its spatial extension from the spatial locations of its parts on the view of O as unstructured. Okay, so this is the first stop. The view in very rough terms of composites as unstructured objects and their spatial extension. Okay, let's move on to the view of objects as mirrorologically structured. And let's again focus on the human organism. This object falls under the kind human organism. But this time, it is essential to the object that it be a human organism. It is essentially a human organism. And it is also essential that it have certain kinds of parts. It is essential to stick with the example that it have a heart as a part, and it's essential that it have a brain as a part. And of course, various other kinds are essential, kinds of part are essential to do. And it's essential to the organism that its parts be arranged human organism wise, whatever that means. Now that all of these kinds concerning the parts and the arrangement of the parts are essential to O, it's what makes O a structured, a mirrorologically structured object. So the kinds of part and the arrangement of the parts all make a contribution to the nature of O. And this is what makes O mirrorologically structured. Now, some structure lovers, including myself, like to put this in a way that they hope is vivid and easily accessible, namely in the slot idiom. And I will stick to that, um, sacrificing some precision in some cases, but hopefully gaining in, in accessibility. Okay, so here's my slot picture of O, simplified. So here's O again, and the gray area is the slot structure of O. And the white circles are O's slots. They are components in the slot structure. And the link between the slots, the, the link between the white circles, stands for the arrangement that is encoded in O's slot structure. That it stands for the human organism-wise arrangement. Now, the thought that it is essential to O that it have parts of certain kinds can be put in the slot idiom by saying that it has slots that are kind sensitive. So in this case, O has a heart slot, which is filled by another material object, A. And O has a brain slot, which is filled by another material object, B. And these slots are arranged human organism-wise. Now, these slots impose constraints on their fillers. So A needs to be a heart, B needs to be a brain, and for them to fill these slots, they need to be arranged or contribute to a human organism-wise arrangement. So O, our organism is, of course, spatially extended, as in the unstructured case. It exactly occupies a spatial region that includes R1 and R2. O is not exactly located at R1 nor at R2. So how does O get to be spatially extended? Intuitively, how does O get to be located? How does it get to cover R1 and to cover R2. Now here, and this is important for what will follow, the situation is quite different from the unstructured case. 
I will just put this out there now and I will motivate it further later on. O, o is structured, uh, sorry, O is uh, spatially extended, but not in virtue of the locations or the spatial profile of its parts. So O doesn't get its spatial extension from the spatial profile of A and from B, at least not primarily. Where does O get its spatial extension from? Answer from its slot structure. This slot structure is, as I put it, spatially non-local. I'm introducing this term. It's a spatially non-local structure, slot structure. And that means that it encodes non-zero spatial distances, which is just a fancy term for cross-spatial relations. They're encoded in the very essence of O, cross-spatial relations, which of course show up in what I've earlier intuitively called a human organism-wise arrangement. That requires spatial distances among the things that you know, constitute human organism. So it's a non-local spatial, spatially non-local structure. And this is what makes O spatially extended. The fillers just fall. So the fillers of the structure, A and B, just follow this spatial structure, this spa these non-zero non, uh, spatial distances encoded. They don't bring it to O. They just follow the this, this spatial arrangement that's already encoded in O. So this is how um, a structured object gets to be spatially extended. All right, and I'm already done with my introduction to structure and unstructured. So a million other things could be said, but I'm not going for the details and I'm not trying to sell you mirological structure. What I'm getting at now is how this distinction plays when it is embedded in the temporal domain. So when we look at persistence and ask, so what happens specifically to our conception of perdurance and the space-time analogy behind perdurance when we look at continuance? And this is what we will do now. I will look at three cases, very simple cases again, relatively simple cases, each case featuring a human organism for simplicity. And in each case, we have a persisting human organism, a continuant. And we will ask, does it perdure or not? And I will argue that the first two cases are in a way showcases for the standard formulation of perdurance. So this formulation classifies these cases correctly. But the third case, the one I'm most interested in, is misclassified by the standard formulation of perdurance, which shows that there's something wrong with the standard formulation, and I will close with a diagnosis of what, what is wrong with it. That's the plan. So the first case is really straightforward. It is a case of an unstructured continuant, an organism, that is mirologically unstructured. And as I just said, it has all of its parts, essentially. So each part, each particular part, by, its, by being this particular object, um, a component in the essence, it, it, con it contributes to the essence of O, to the nature of O. But it doesn't just have spatial parts, it has temporal parts as well. So here's O, and it has a number of temporal parts, among them O1, which is O's temporal part, it, I will just say temporal part, I mean instantaneous temporal part by Sidus definition, right? So O1 is O's instantaneous temporal part at T1, and O2 is O's instantaneous temporal part at T2. Moreover, O1 and O2 have smaller parts. A1 is a stage in the instantaneous temporal part of a heart, and B1 is a stage of a brain in the usual way. So A1 and A2 are both stages of the same heart, say, and B1 and B2 of the same brain. So in ordinary parlance, we can say, well, O has a heart and a brain at both of those times in virtue of having a temporal part that, like O1 and O2, that have temporal parts of a heart and a brain as part. So this is, the, this is the usual story. Now look at the vertical axis, the spatial one, and the, and the horizontal one, the temporal one. Intuitively, it's clear, it's, it's nicely analogous, right? The object is cut into spatial parts, and it, it's, it's unstructured, so none of the arrangement of the spatial parts matters for the nature. And likewise, it's cut into temporal parts. And again, none of the arrangement of the temporal parts across time, like the arrangement of, of the spatial parts uh, across space, 
makes any contribution to the nature. We expect this to be a perduring object. It is extended in time in a way that is analogous to how it is extended in space. The standard formulation of perdurance um, judges this object to be a perduring object, so everything's fine. Okay, this is just the warm up case. Everyone knows this. So let's look at structured objects. It's case two and case three will both be cases of objects of an organism in each case with mirrorological structure, but with different mirrorological structure. So the second case, the one I'm going to look at now, is a case of an object that also falls under the kind human organism. Now, before we even talk about nature and parts, let's ask what makes an object a human organism, but very roughly. So I'm not interested in conceptual analysis. There's a certain aspect that I'm interested in. Let's assume, and this is the aspect I'm interested in, that this kind applies to an object at a moment. In other words, the kind human organism, on the, I'm, I'm just assuming that, has temporally local application conditions. So for an object to be a human organism, and I take this to be a very widely accepted view, the object, intuitively speaking, has to have the power to sustain human life at each moment at which it exists. Right, so this is certainly a maximal kind. So the object has to be like that at all moments at which it exists. But importantly, what it takes this object to be a human organism, the properties and relations that make human organism apply to the object at a moment. This is what I mean by temporal locality, right? And I take this, this power talk or disposition talk to allow us to say, well, at that moment, it has the power to sustain human life. And if it has that at all moments at which exists, well, then it's, it's a human organism. So I'm, I'm assuming this. Not a metaphysical thesis yet. This could be read as a thesis about the concept of a human organism. But now let's assume, and this is the metaphysical claim now, O is essentially a human organism, with the kind or concept human organism understood in this temporary local way. Since the object is essentially a human organism, and since it's a temporally local kind, the slot structure is temporally local too. And that's it, try to illustrate that here. So this is a continuant that is mirrorologically structured and it has a temporally local slot structure, right? So this slot structure only concerns properties and relations that an object has at a moment. And since the object is essentially of a certain temporally local kind, its slot structure is temporally local. And it has the same slot structure at every moment at which it exists. Well, it's essential to it. It's encoded in the essence. So it better be there at all moments at which the object exists. So here we have an object with an organ structure, again, very schematically. Right. For example, O, oh, the, the lowest slot is a, is a heart slot, and then that is filled by A, then it also has a kidney slot and another kidney slot, which, is, which are filled by B and C, respectively. And there's an arrangement, and that arrangement gives rise to these objects together, um, well, say, <laughs> constituting the, the power to sustain human life at that moment. Now, I emphasize that on this picture, the slot structure is essential and, and temporally local, which means that the object has the same slot structure at each moment. And this is the reason why what we have here is not yet a human organism as we know it. It's very close, but it's not a human organism because a human organism cannot just change with respect to which object is its heart which is its, uh, its brain and so on. It can also change with respect to the number and kinds of slots it has, given that it is neurologically structured. So for example, an object can have two kidneys and hence two kidney slots because the fillers are the kidneys. The fillers of the slots are the object's kidneys. And they can lose one and continue to live with one kidney and hence one kidney slot. But this object here, we see it's, it's, I called it O star, not O as before, and this is the reason why it's not an organism 
yet, this object has an invariant temporally local slot structure. It has the same slot structure, the same number, sl slots with the same kind sensitivity at each moment at which it exists. And that's just too rigid for O star to be a human organism. So if we want a human organism, we need to put in another layer. And I suggest we do it in the following, again, very rough way. O's, and here we need a distinction between immediate slots in an immediate slot structure and immediate ones. And the immediate one is the slot structure encoded directly, if you like, in the object. And the immediate slots and slot structure are inherited from the object by its slot filler. So these are the slot structures and slots of the fillers of the object's immediate slots. So we get a hierarchy, which we of course expect in a neo-Aristotelian neurology. So here's what, what I suggest very roughly. O has one immediate slot. And this slot is filled by what I will call a proto-organism. So this object is very close to an organism. It has an organ structure. It is, it's, it is you know, able to sustain human life at each moment, has the power to do so, but it is too, uh, too, too rigid in its structure. So um, it's a proto-organism. The organism is um, less rigid. Its immediate slot, its single immediate neurological slot imposes the only sole constraint on its filler, namely that the filler be um, a proto-organism. So O star in this picture, the filler of O's single immediate slot at T1 is one proto-organism with two kidney slots. And O star, O double star, is a numerically non-identical proto-organism with not two, but one kidney slot. So what we have here is an organism with an immediate and immediate slot structure that is able to change from having two kidneys to, to having one and continue to exist. Right, so this is um, a picture that has actually been discussed quite a bit in the literature. It is very close to Kit Fine's distinction between rigid and variable embodiments. So my organism is roughly a variable embodiment and the proto-organism is a rigid embodiment. I won't, I'm not very interested in, in the details of the similarity. I'm just pointing out that this, I didn't just make this up. So no, another thing I want to point out with respect to the literature is that some defenders of this sort of view like to put the relationship between the organism and the proto-organism in terms of constitution. Catherine Kuslicki is an example. So Catherine likes to say that O star constitutes O at T1 and O double star constitutes a O. Um, so it's a different constitutor. Uh, o at T2, right? So this would be a mirological structure-based con conception of constitution. So I'm, I just, these are just footnotes. How does O persist? This is what I'm interested in. Does it perdure or not? This is, this is what I'm interested in. Well, O is not temporally extended at all because O is strictly present at both T1 and T2. Does O have temporal parts in the standard sense? No, because O star is as big as O is at T1 without being O. So that's fine. That looks like, you know, it has part of what it takes to be a temporal part in the standard conception, but it is not confined to T1 because it exists at other times too. The proto-organisms existed several times. They're not tied to a particular moment. So O is not temporally extended and O doesn't have temporal parts. So surely this is not a perduring object. In a debate, we would call it an enduring object, but I'm sidestepping that, that term and I will just rest content by saying, while it is not expected to be a perduring object, it is not in time in a way that is analogous to how it is in space. So we expect it to be a non-perdurer and the standard formulation gives us that. So everything's fine so far. These are the showcases of a perduring object and a non-perduring object. Now let's go to my third case. Again, let's ask what, what does it take for an object to be a human organism? And in the second case, I assume that the application conditions are temporally local. Now I want to look at an alternative. Let's assume that the application conditions of being a, humanism, a human organism are temporally non-local. So they do not apply, or the kind does not apply to an object at a moment. Because it's not enough on this conception for an object to be a human organism to have the power at a moment to sustain human life. 
what it means on this alternative conception is to actually sustain human life for a while, to be alive, and being alive takes time. So for this human organism, an organism, human organism on this conception, it, its heart needs to do some beating and its brain needs to do some thinking for it to be a human organism. Now let's assume that um, O, in our third case, is essentially human organism in this temporally non-local sense. Since its essential kind is temporally non-local, its slot structure is temporally non-local. And I'm interested in the, in the top part of, of the image now up. What this means is that O does not have the same immediate slot structure at each moment at which it exists. Rather, it has a temporally non-local slot structure, which encodes cross-temporal relations, causal relations, or whatever, certain qualitative continuity relations. They're cross-temporal. They encode it in the slot structure. So it does not have the same slot or slots at each moment. No, it has different slots, numerically non-identical slots, at different moments that are connected cross-temporally. So the slot structure is temporally non-local. Intuitively, what I want to say is that each of those slots at different times is filled and needs to be filled by a proto-organism, exactly in the second case. I'm trying to stay very close to the second case and just change what needs to be changed to get the point across. So it's, a, these are O star and O star, double star, proto-organisms, right? In this, this, this is a proto-organism in this way. But O's immediate essential slot structure is temporally non-local, right? So O star fills the slot at T1 and O double star fills the slot at T2. How does O persist? O does not have temporal parts on the standard conception. These proto-organisms do not exist only at a particular moment. They persist through times themselves. So by the standard formulation of perdurance, this is a non-perduring continuant. But I claim that this is a misclassification. This, this case should be classified as a case of perdurance. So let me say, if you, this is what I'm getting at today. This is my point. This case, this sort of case has been overlooked completely by the standard formulation of perdurance. This should be characterized as a perduring object. If we let ourselves be guided by the perdurance intuition, by the space-time analogy that I started with. So this is one I uh, uh, un unpack a little now for, the, for, for a few more minutes and I'm done. Okay. Um, the space-time analogy is that a perduring object is extended in time in a way that is analogous to how it's extended in space. This is given here for the following reason. So again, the vertical axis is the spatial dimension. because It's just one here because there's several, three at least. And the horizontal one is the temporal one. Look again at the vertical axis. How is O spatially extended, but spatially extended by having a spatially non-local slot structure. It has different slots at different regions, R1, R2, and R3, respectively, which are linked by cross-spatial relations, which are encoded in the structure, in the essence of the object. The fillers of these slots count as the object's spatial parts. Analogously, our object in this case has a temporally non-local slot structure. It has different slots at different moments. They're assigned to different moments. They're linked by cross-temporal relations, which are encoded in the essence, in the slot structure of the object. It is temporally extended analogously to how to spatially extend it. And so O star and O double star, the fillers of the temporal slots should be conceived of as temporal parts of the object, just as A, B, and C are conceived of spatial parts. Now, none of that is captured by the standard formulation of perdurance. Now, objection. You might say, wait, there's an important difference between the spatial dimension and the temporal dimension in this case, which I haven't addressed yet. And this is important for, for the space-time analogy. I'm, getting at. 
It's not perfect, you might say. The space-time analogy is not perfect for the following reason. A, B, and C are confined to their spatial regions. They're uniquely spatially located at T1. A is just at R1, B is just at R2, C is just at RT, uh, R3. But O star and double O star are not confined to their moments. O star persists, you know, moves around, persists at, uh, exists at diff different moments, and likewise for O double star. So um, the spatial parts are uniquely spatially located, but the temporal parts are not uniquely temporally located. Surely that, that's an important difference. I reply, no, it's not at all important. It's completely irrelevant. And uh, I want to show this, of, well, I want to show it. I want to <laughs> support this claim with an example, an exotic example um, to warn you. So what I want to show is that it doesn't matter for spatial extension, the spatial extension of mirologically structured object, whether the parts are uniquely spatially located, as it's in fact the case here. So let's look at a diamond. And let's assume that this diamond is mirologically structured. Here it is. It has a beautiful, spatially non-local mirological structure. But it has slots for carbon atoms, and these slots are arranged in a tetrahedral fashion, which is what makes diamond structures so fascinating, of course. So it has a spatially non-local structure because it encodes all these non-zero spatial distances, which the fillers are required to have. So far, so familiar. But now let's look at an exotic possible world in which at each moment, carbon, carbon atoms are spatially multi-located. So they have multiple exact spatial locations at each moment. The same carbon atom is exactly located at multiple spatial regions. And let's place our diamond in this world and assume that all of its carbon atom slots, all of them, are filled by the same, numerically the same carbon atom. So this again, um, the type of case is familiar to some of you from the persistence literature. For example, Cody Gilmore has made quite, had made quite a lot of, um, of cases like that where you got a complex object where the same part occurs several times over. And he tells some time travel stories to, to motivate, but I won't do that. So let's look at this case. The, the diamond is spatially extended far beyond the spatial extension of any carbon atom, yet it only has a single spatial part. A single spatial part. Our diamond is not multi-located like C, this carbon atom. It has an exact spatial location, a big one, compared to the spatial location of C. But it only has one spatial part. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because O has a spatially non-local slot structure. These distances are encoded in the slot structure, and it simply doesn't matter whether the, the many slots are filled by many uniquely spatially located objects or by the same multi-located object. It still has the familiar extension of a diamond, spatial extension of a diamond. So, conclusion of this little side discussion, it doesn't matter where the fillers are. What matters for spatial extension from mirologically structured objects is the non-locality, the spatial non-locality encoded in, in the structure. And that tightens up the space-time analogy in the third case. So just as in the spatial dimension, a composite, a structured composite object is spatially extended in terms of, in virtue of having a spatially non-local structure. It has different spatial slots at different regions. So the object, is temporally extended in virtue of having a temporally non-local slot structure. It has different temporal slots at different moments. So we have every reason, if we're guided by the space-time analogy, to view objects like this as a perduring object. But according to the form standard formulation, they're not. O is not. This organism is not a perduring object. Conclusion. The standard formulation is not misguided. 
It is just limited. That's a big difference. What's the difference? Well, what it tries to do, it does perfectly because it's made for unstructured objects. The standard formulation for drones is made for unstructured objects. Well, in the 80s and 90s, everyone was only interested in what I'm here calling unstructured objects. So there's no surprise. But this is what happens. If we look at unstructured objects, the spatial extension is derived from the spatial profile of the parts. And analogously, if the object is unstructured, its temporal extension, if it's a perduring object in the standard sense, its temporal extension is derived from the temporal, lo temporal locations of its parts. So everything's fine there. But if mirrorological structures brought in, the standard formulation doesn't work anymore. So I recommend that if we take mirrorological structure, neoacetylene mirrorology, hylomorphism, my slot structure is of course a version of form. If we take all of that seriously, then we must adjust our expectations our conception of what it takes a material object to perdure. That's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, thanks very much to the organizers for what has been a, a very exciting uh, event so far. Uh, so possibility precedes actuality is my topic, a, a mysterious phrase which uh, no doubt many of you are familiar with from the, the work of uh, my late supervisor, E.J. Lowe. So uh, my task today is to make some sense of that, that phrase. Uh, I will give a qualified defense of the idea that possibility precedes actuality, although I will not try to be uh, absolutely faithful to everything that uh, E.J. Lowe may have had in mind with that phrase. However, I do think that there's a, a core idea here, which is also shared by the likes of Kit Fine, uh, which is uh, worth examining in detail and indeed, uh, defending. Uh, now, obviously, this has to do both with uh, modal epistemology and modal metaphysics. I will focus on the latter, although uh, I do regard the two topics, that is modal metaphysics and modal epistemology, to be very closely intertwined. So let's get started. Here's the, here's the phrase uh, from Lowe's uh, the book, 1988, 1998 book, The Possibility of Metaphysics. So he says, the that metaphysical possibility is an indis inescapable determinant of actuality. Now, really, we can't take the slogan uh, in isolation because it's very closely related to another slogan that we, we see, for instance, in his 2008 paper, which is that essence precedes existence. Now, he qualifies this phrase by saying that by this, I mean that the former precedes the latter, both ontologically and epistemically. So as I said, this is both an ontological and an epistemic um, idea, although I will focus on the uh, ontology today. Now, just by way of uh, background, this uh, is, of course, uh, all related to uh, the well-known Feynian framework of essence of modality, which, uh, which we've been talking about a lot already in this, uh, in this event, and Fabrice helpfully outlined this uh, framework, so I'm not going to go into the details. I'm sure it's all familiar to you. The idea is that essence is ontologically prior to modality in the sense that essential truths are more fundamental or grounded in, uh, uh, or that modal truths are grounded in essential truths. Now, Lowe qualifies this a bit further. He says, it's a precondition of something's existence that its essence, along with the essences of other existing things, does not preclude its existence. Now, uh, one way to understand what's going on here is just that uh, something, some entity could have an essence that actually precludes it from existing. Now, what that could be, difficult to say, but perhaps uh, contradictory properties or something like that, if, if, you, if you think that such entities do have uh, an essence in the first place. Uh, but it could be other things as well, as I'm, as I'm going to go on to, to explain. So this is uh, an important qualification for what comes uh, later on. Okay, so I'll, I'll start by briefly outlining the epistemic reading of essence precedes existence before going into the ontology. Um, the epistemic reading for Lowe suggests that we can know the essence of some entity before we know whether or not that entity exists. And this means that we know at least sometimes uh, 
the essences of many things that that do not exist and and perhaps never never will uh, or indeed even couldn't now low qualifies this as well a little bit by saying that we might come to know the essence of an entity simultaneously with this, uh, this with its discovery so the the thought is not supposed to be absolute he doesn't really mention any examples but i think one possible case might be something like uh we're doing some high energy physics experiments and uh, uh we uh we that experiment results in uh, in uh, uh unpredicted uh, results such as decay products of uh uh, of uh, colliding particles or something like this. And then we come to, to uh, analyze the data and, and uh, figure out that there's, there's some uh, unpredicted uh, entities that came into existence from, from this experiment. Now, obviously, in that case, we didn't really know anything about that uh, unpredicted uh, DK product before that experiment. But this doesn't uh, falsify Lowe's framework altogether because he never makes this claim as an absolute. I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, um, now that's the uh, starting point of the framework, but obviously we should say something about what essences are supposed to be in this framework to make any sense of, of the claim that essence precedes existence and indeed that uh, possibility precedes actuality. Uh, now, in, in this event, uh, I trust that I don't have to go into an awful lot of detail about what essences are supposed to be, but we've already seen a couple of different ways to try to cash out the term. So, so let me put forward my own preferred way, which I think is, is quite sympathetic to, to Lowe's, even if not exactly the same. Now, Lowe himself isn't actually always very helpful about this. He says the essence of an X is just the very identity of X. And he refers to Locke here, of course. Now, obviously, the background here is, is partially the Aristotelian notion of real definition, which Lowe sometimes does use to, to qualify essence. We've heard a little bit about this already. Um, but one important thing for Lowe in particular, and uh, I agree with this, is that essences are not supposed to be regarded as entities in themselves. Um, he would also strongly rule out the type of view that uh, Mark uh, Jaco was putting forward before, which is uh, a bundle theory of essence. So essences are not just bundles of properties. They're also not just uh, sets of propositions, if you like, uh, something that Kit Fine sometimes seems to allude to, that uh, the essence is, is just a, a collection of propositions stating, uh, for instance, what the essential properties of an, of an entity are. Now, what I think Lowe has in mind, and what I like to, to uh, uh, use as a way to cash out what essence amounts to, is, is, uh, is just uh, in the middle of the slide here, which is that essence is concerned uh, the identity and existence conditions of entities. And well, you could add persistence conditions here as well, obviously, if you like. And the basis of these conditions is the, is the categorical structure of reality and the formal ontological relations that, that, that govern that structure, uh, relations such as instantiation and characterization. Now, Lowe's own picture is, of course, a uh, famous four-category ontology. We don't have to commit to that picture here by any means. Um, the thought is that whatever the categorical structure of reality is, that is what gives rise to um, the formal ontological relations that give us uh, ultimately the identity and existence conditions of entities. And uh, it's, it's uh, these identity and existence and persistence conditions that uh, you, can, you can regard as uh, uh, preceding existence, as it were, because, uh, because the essence precedes existence on this picture. And this actually came out in, in Dirk's talk as well, where he, where he mentioned the persistence conditions um, uh, are prior to the existence of an entity. So, so this is very much in line with that, that same thought as well. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the formal logical relations here. We can talk about it if you like, but they're thought to be internal relations, which is to say that uh, um, if the uh, entities that hold in these relations exist, then the relation itself exists. All right, so my view is, uh, is what I think is faithful to Lowe's as well, is that the essence of an entity is not a thing or a collection of things. It's the identity of a thing in the sense that the conditions captured by the essence are what make one thing distinct from another. And just before we move on, here's a final important qualification. I will focus on uh, what we regard as general or kind essences rather than individual essences. Here's a passage from Lowe where he qualifies this distinction. So X is general essence is what it is to be a K say an object of kind K, while X's individual essence is what it is to be the individual of kind K that exists. 
as opposed to any other individual of that kind. Now, I should perhaps mention that here I actually do deviate from Lowe, who uh, regards both of these types of essences as important, general and individual essences. Now, personally, I've always been rather skeptical of individual essences, and uh, I'm not convinced that there are any such things. And I suppose that in this regard, I'm actually closer to the original Aristotelian essentialism that Lowe himself perhaps is, because I take it that this is uh, compatible with Aristotle's idea. Anyway, I'll leave the exegesis to those who uh, can actually read the Greek. Now, uh, three important assumptions, um, which I will not really go into any more detail, but which sort of capture what I've, what I've just said. First, essences are not entities. Secondly, every entity has a general essence, um, even if not an individual essence. And having an essence does not entail that an entity exists or even could exist. So the thought is that essence precedes existence. You can have uh, essences, that is, sets of identity and existence conditions um, for entities that never even come into existence. And at least sometimes we can grasp these uh, identity and existence conditions. Good. So that gives us uh, the general framework, more or less. And uh, here's a passage from uh, Kit Fine, which uh, Lowe uh, cites, well, he does not cite this exact passage, but I'm sure that this is the passage that he has in mind. This is from Fine's Modality and Tense. Uh, I think Lowe just refers to the whole book, but this is uh, surely what he has in mind. So let me just read that out. So, so Fine says, although may be something about how the matter of Socrates turns out that is relevant to its constituting a man, there is nothing about how Socrates himself turns out that is relevant to his being a man. If I am right, then this means that philosophers have been mistaken in thinking that Socrates cannot be a man unless he exists, that existence must precede essence. Socrates must already be a man, if I may put it that way, before the question of how things turn out for him can even arise. Now, now this is uh, an elo eloquent, but perhaps uh, a bit more complicated way of putting what I've just been trying to describe to you, which is to say that you can have an essence that precedes the existence of an entity, and uh, uh, we must as it were, ask this question before uh, the question of uh, the actual existence of, uh, of an entity becomes relevant. Now, as it happens, I don't think that the question of Socrates is necessarily the most helpful way or most helpful example in this regard. So I'll try to give some better ones. But uh, uh, so far, I've been just sort of speaking in, in the abstract about this. But anyway, it looks like, like uh, Kit is on, on the same page about this issue. Now, um, Given then that the essences of entities, as I understand them, express the identity and existence conditions of those entities, it's possible, at least sometimes it seems, to state the essences of entities that do not or even could not exist. I've already said this really. But the thought here is that since essence is no entity itself, there's nothing really mysterious about these essences of non-existent entities. But you might, of course, ask further what well, what are these identity and existence conditions? How do we actually come and, and state these identity and existence conditions, that is the essences of entities? And here we do have to resort to some examples, but I think it's important to note that the way I'm treating these examples of essences uh, is, is always a little bit tentative. We should be fallibilists about this. I think that it's actually very difficult to come up uh, with uh, a complete description of the essence of some entity especially when it's uh, some, uh, some uh, entity uh, treated in a scientific theory, for instance. Um, but in a way, we shouldn't worry about this too much. Uh, it's partly just an epistemic problem because any coherent set of identity and existence conditions is, is, is at least a candidate for an entity that could exist. Uh, why only a candidate? Well, because the essences of other existing things could possibly preclude the existence of, of some entity that could otherwise exist. So this is a point that I think Lowe noticed, but should have maybe highlighted more. Uh, we can't really consider essences in isolation. Uh, the, the fact that we, this, this is all based on, on uh, the categorical structure of reality means that uh, we must take into account any kind of constraints that the existence of one entity uh, imposes on the existence of other entities, or indeed, that the existence of one entity requires the existence of some other entity or necessitates it. So logical coherence is not really enough here. We need to consider how the entity is or would be related to other entities. 
And uh, that gives us a pretty complex network of dependencies that, that should be considered if we want to put forward um, that something actually exists or what the requirements for its actual existence would be. All right, now, now these are of course modal implications. So this is how we get to from essence to modality. The existence of entity A may make it impossible for entity B to exist, or the existence of A may necessitate the existence of B. So to give a very simplified example, there's a sense in which my existence necessitates the existence of my parents because I could not exist if they had not exist. But of course, now that I do exist, it has nothing to, to do at this very moment with the existence of my, my parents. So my existence at this very moment no longer necessitates it, their existence at this very moment. So if you like, this is a type of past existential dependence, one of the many uh, forms of uh, ontological dependence that we may formulate. And uh, Fabrice has actually uh, done a little bit of this um, in his uh, 2008 survey on ontological dependence. Now, I will not have the space or time uh, or patience to be quite honest, to go through all the different ontological dependence relations here, but you may refer to the Stanford entry on this topic, of course, if you like further details. But I will give you another example. Um, consider a methane molecule, CH4. Well, they could not exist unless carbon and hydrogen existed. So the existence of methane necessitates the existence of carbon. And I guess there's some plausibility in the claim that methane essentially depends for its existence on carbon. Although of course this depends how exactly we understand the essences of things like chemical substances. So if you, if you assume something like microstructural essentialism, then this type of claim would seem to um, uh, be fairly plausible, but you might, you might deny this, uh, in which case um, the requirements for the existence of methane might be slightly different. Uh, Putting that aside, you get the general idea, I trust. So uh, if, you, if you were to assume something like microstructural essentialism, um, then you could, you could formulate the previous example with the help of uh, generic essential dependence, which you might define as follows, as, as gen on the slide. So X depends generically for its existence upon the Fs. Um, it's part of the essence of X then that X exists only if some F exists. So in the, in the case at hand, uh, it would be part of the essence of the methane molecule that uh, methane exists only if uh, carbon or hydrogen atoms or indeed both of those exist. Now, as I say, there's, a, there's a, an established literature on ontological and essential dependence, which I'm sort of uh, uh, assuming as the background here. Uh, and this is, uh, the framework that we would use to actually cash out, cash out the uh, dependence uh, conditions or existence and, uh, and uh, uh, persistence conditions of the entities. Okay, so now that we have that framework in place, uh, we can we can look at a, a case uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, and uh, I like to use this case of transgenetic elements as, as my case study, partly because Lowe mentions it uh, a few times, but mostly just in passing. He never goes into any details about it. But I do think that it's a very good example. And of course, my main motivation here is really to focus on these type of scientific examples rather than everyday examples, which Lowe also talks about. Um, so let's take the case of transgenetic elements and, and I'll try to say a little bit more about it. I've got even more actually in the written version of the paper. So I'm happy to talk about it in more detail. So transgenic elements uh, are elements with an atomic number higher than 92, so that of uranium. And in many cases, uh, the existence of transgenic elements and especially super heavy elements, uh, those with uh, atomic number greater than 103 were uh, predicted and quite accurately modeled uh, before their actual uh, synthesization. Now, what's interesting in these cases, of course, is that some of these uh, elements, especially super heavy elements, do not occur in nature at all. So prior to us synthesizing them, they did not exist. And uh, indeed, presumably would never have existed or come to existence in, in nature if we hadn't, uh, uh, you know, created the particle accelerators uh, to, to create them. Now, with the help of uh, the general principles that underlie the periodic table or already since Mendeleev, scientists have been 
able to give very accurate estimates of the chemical properties of many of these elements before they were actually successfully uh, synthesized. So that's a nice case of uh, figuring out what kind of properties, what kind of things these would, would be, these elements, uh, even, even before we've ever seen them uh, in our labs. And here's one place where Willow mentions this example. He says, prior to the actual synthesis of various transuric elements, prior indeed to the actual existence anyway in the universe of certain of these elements, chemists knew what they would be. That is to say, they grasped the real definitions of certain as yet non-existent transuric elements. And here he's, of course, thinking of the acids. Now, unfortunately, that's almost all that he says about this particular case, at least in that, that paper. But I do think that we can say something more. Uh, we have a lot of detail about how uh, the case of transuric elements works. And uh, I've, uh, I've been reading on, on the very fascinating history of these, of these elements uh, for the purposes of, of this talk and, and some papers that I've been writing about this. Um, so this, this uh, island of stability is, is the interesting case where we get some of these super heavy elements. Um, they are very short lived, but uh, we've been able to predict, well, the scientists who work on this have been able to predict where we might find these islands of stability. So uh, elements that we, we might be able to synthesize in the lab. So a lot of the work uh, is based on these structural features that we already know about, uh, partly extrapolating from existing structures. Uh, and uh, we can make predictions about where these elements would fall in the periodic table based on, on, on these structural features. Okay. Um, now, currently, the heaviest element that has actually been synthesized is, is uh, uh, the element that's na been named organesson, uh, number 118. Uh, and that's a really fascinating case, actually, for many reasons. One of these reasons is that uh, Bohr, already in 1922, correctly predicted the electron structure of, of organesson. And he also um, postulated that it would be a noble gas, uh, uh, roughly similar to radon in some of its, its properties. Now, we don't actually know accurately yet all of the chemical properties of organesson, partly because it's a very difficult thing to synthesize it. And uh, I think its half-life is, is uh, something in the, in the range of uh, milliseconds. Um, but not only that, the, the history of the discovery of organesson is actually very, very troubled. Um, so there was a team that claimed its discovery, uh, 15 researchers already in 1999, but uh, no other team was able to replicate uh, these results. So um, the data that was coming out of the lab of a highly respected research team uh, wasn't verified. And, and in fact, it turned out that one of the scientists had fabricated some of the data uh, and got subsequently fired from, from the institute that claimed the discovery. So it wasn't actually until 2016, so just a few years ago, before that discovery was finally approved after, after several attempts, failed attempts as well. But interestingly, uh, we already knew, well, Bohr already knew 100 years ago uh, what the features of, of, this, uh, of this element would be if we were, were to be uh, able to, to uh, uh, synthesize it. So I think this is a nice example of possibility preceding actuality. Uh, even when we thought that we finally synthesized the element, we actually hadn't, or at least we couldn't verify it. And when we did finally manage to do it, it was in existence for some milliseconds, if that. So uh, despite all of this, we can of course say a lot of things about what this element is like uh, and what is required for its existence. But uh, I think that the case actually that is at hand here generalizes. So um, consider, things like dark matter or strings or electron substructure, which is sometimes postulated, the nature of the wave function, the size of the universe, the list goes on. Now, these are all things that um, we have postulated, speculated about, uh, and some of these things we have never observed, dark matter and strings being some of them, or electron substructure for that matter. Um, and uh, you might think that these are all very, very speculative cases from physics, of course, but I think that actually uh, the case generalizes beyond these type of theoretical entities. So what about things like biological species, social groups, consciousness? Well, we observe all of these things all, all the time, of course, but uh, there's no set 
agreement about what their essence is uh, um, would be like, as it were, if uh, if if they do exist. So, uh, I mean, I, I I trust I don't have to go into details about these uh, these examples, but uh, the essences of biological species are, of course, a very controversial area indeed. So some people think that biological species are not natural kinds at all, and hence they wouldn't have an essence, a kind essence of this. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make here is that insofar as we don't agree about the essences, about the identity and existence conditions of these things, we're not really in a position to agree about their existence. Now, that's not to deny that there are individual biological organisms, of course, uh, but uh, whether we should regard these biological organisms as as just individuals or as members of certain species, and indeed which species, uh, is of course a very controversial question and not always uh, at all straightforward to answer. So we, we can have various theories about this, uh, but uh, we might not be able to uh, conclusively settle the existence of a given species if we don't really know what the essential features of that species are supposed to be. Okay, well, my main example Example is, of course, uh, these these more theoretical cases because they really illustrate a point quite nicely. Uh, so let me let me mention the case of dark matter again. I found this very uh, illuminating illustration of it uh, online somewhere. Um, so so we can we can agree that something uh, must exist, even uh, something like dark matter, perhaps, because we need an explanation for why the expansion of the universe has not been slowing due to gravity but it has been instead been accelerating instead. We've observed this. And dark matter has been postulated as, as one possible answer to this question. But of course, uh, it, it's, it's almost just a functional uh, kind at this point, uh, just something that serves the function of explaining uh, this, this fact about the acceleration of, um, of uh, the expansion uh, of the universe. Um, but we don't really know what the properties of dark matter is. That hence, hence the name dark matter. We we haven't we haven't really seen it. Uh, uh, so we would really need to know quite a bit more than what we now know about this postulated uh, kind of dark matter before we can confidently say that dark matter exists in actuality. Uh, it could be something else that explains uh, this uh, this observed uh, data, of course. So the point is is really quite simple, I'd, I'd say. To establish the existence of something of a specific kind, we need to specify its identity and existence conditions, its essence. Otherwise, we might very well be looking at it without recognizing it as the kind of thing it is. So we are looking at the universe expanding. We know that something's responsible for it, but we are not really in a position to say what that thing is before we know something more about its, uh, its essence. Now, Lowe himself mentions uh, everyday examples uh, like uh, like observing a cat and uh, and uh, considers things like, well, do children really understand that a cat is an organism? So do they have the no notion, the concept of a cat? We could expand this uh, to these sort of everyday examples as well, but uh, I prefer to to stick to the scientific case um, for the time being. But we can talk about this more if, if you're interested. Okay. So, so that's the framework, but of course, ultimately, we do want to know what, what is actual. So, so in what sense does possibility precede actuality in this framework? Well, three things, I think. The first thing might seem quite trivial. It's, it's just that actuality must consist of entities that could exist. So that means that they, it, it must actu uh, actually consist of entities that uh, have an essence that doesn't preclude them from existing. And the second point is that there are many entities whose essences do not preclude them from existing. Also fairly trivial, but it just means that uh, uh, this is a difficult epistemic issue. Um, we, we don't really know uh, how much we, we should consider. The third point is that only entities that could exist together can actually exist, can inhabit actuality. Now, these are all related points. So, so let me just say a little bit more about how they, how they go together. As I said, the first point may seem pretty trivial, but it is important. Uh, given that some entities could exist, uh, could not exist, that is, uh, they are impossible, they can't be actual. The trouble is, it's difficult to determine what could exist in the first place, unless we already have some idea about the fundamental structure of reality. 
And this is something that we do not necessarily agree about. So we don't necessarily agree about what could exist in the first place. And before we agree about it, we can't really establish what could exist. Now, we probably wish to rule our entities to possess contradictory properties, as I think I mentioned in passing. Um, and we, pro we can probably agree about this. But uh, what about those that violate the laws of nature? Well, here we have to enter the debate about whether the actual laws of nature are metaphysically impossible or whether there are metaphysically possible entities that violate some laws of nature. Uh, as you know, the big debate about this, about this topic, which, uh, which we would have to really settle before we can settle the question of what, what could exist. So that's the, that's the first point. And the second point really boils down to this. Even if we do have some basic principle in place to delimit the space of metaphysical possibility and come to an agreement about this, there's still going to be a vast number of possible entities, which are all candidates for for actually existing entities. So, um, so we really have to have to consider uh, all of these cases uh, before we can we can uh, uh, we can get to actuality, and uh, we can't really appreciate this this issue if, unless we connect it to the third point, which concerns the restrictions regarding the combinations of possible entities. As I as I tried to emphasize earlier, we have to take into account the fact that some entities entail the existence or necessitate the existence of other entities and some entities preclude the existence of other entities. So we have to ask which combinations of entities could actually exist. Now, the third point then is, is just this, essences should not be considered in isolation. Um, as a side, side point, this is why I often find the classic uh, uh, Louis Stalacher uh, counterfactual uh, semantics um, uh, problematic and because uh, it's, it's, it's boi often boi uh, boils down to the, the idea of, of uh, imagining a, a counterfactual scenario where we, where we just vary one, uh, one variable, as it were, uh, and we determine that uh, that world where just one variable is, uh, is uh, changed, but everything else is held fixed, is uh, is a close possible world. So this closeness function, function for possible worlds, is is something that doesn't really work in this type of picture because it doesn't take into account the fact that changing one variable, let's say, changing one fundamental constant of nature, just tweak its value a little bit, um, and uh, keep everything else fixed. Now that doesn't really work out unless we've uh, figured out what that variable uh, is related to. So what other things might have to change um, if, we, if we were to change that variable? Uh, well, we could, we could actually consider some examples of this, but, uh, but uh, let's keep it simple enough. So the point is, is just that the identity and existence conditions of some possible entity may refer to other entities because they either preclude the existence of these entities at the same time or they require it. And we can just take a really simple case uh, controversial, of course, even 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 this case, but uh, one that we are all familiar with. So water's essence cannot be fully stated without stating something about the essences of hydrogen and oxygen as well, at least assuming some kind of microstructural essentialism. Now, that's not to say that water's essence can be completely stated just by saying something about the essences of hydrogen and oxygen. Of course, we would have to say something about the laws that govern the bonding behavior of these uh, of these atoms as well, but uh, this is just the idea of uh, of not considering essences in isolation. Now, the dependencies among the essences of these entities, as I've already implicated, uh, can be described in terms of ontological dependence. But it's only once all of these conditions are in place and all the dependencies among the possible entities are included that we can properly say that we've we've reached a delimited space of metaphysical possibility. So the space of act, uh, uh, candidates for actuality. Now, each of these complete um, candidates for actuality is what you, what you might call a possible world, if you want to resort to that terminology. But I should highlight that I have used the word possible world, at least not in the paper that this talk is based on, even once. Because uh, properly speaking, these 
candidates for actuality, these combinations of essences, they're not possible worlds in any, any usual sense of the world. Uh, well, for one thing, because they're based on sets of identity and existence conditions that are not entities in, them, in, in themselves. So we're just interested in, in the one um, combination of, of, these, uh, of these essences that actually does exist, because we're interested in actuality. But the problem is, we don't really know which one of these uh, uh, essences are the actual ones, which are, which one are possessed by, by actual existing entities. So really, this is just highlighting the epistemic point. It's difficult to trace all the dependencies or agree about what is metaphysically possible in the first place. So it's not easy to come up with these complete candidates for actuality. And that's what I really regard to be the core idea behind Law's phrase, possibility precedes actuality. So we're forced to operate in this realm of possibility uh, when we're trying to determine the combination of the essences that could, as it were, belong to actually existing entities, uh, which could describe actually existing entities. So, so that is, is really what I regard to be uh, the key thought. And once uh, this is acknowledged, if this is acknowledged, there's, there's of course another important task that we're faced with, and that's to determine our confidence regarding the actuality of the various uh, possible entities. So I, I, I do not want to, to sidestep this, this important issue, even if I haven't focused on this. Um, so we, we, should, uh, we should acknowledge, of course, that even if uh, in principle, it's very difficult to establish conclusively that something exists, we could still have very high confidence uh, in, in uh, the existence of, of uh, an entity of a given type or you know, its essence. Um, and, and that is an epistemic issue, but um, we have tools for determining this. So, so the questions really are related to more general questions of epistemology, such, such as uh, belief revision. Um, we can do this in, with many tools, web of belief, real patterns, uh, actual belief revision theory, robustness analysis, and, and so on. Um, so this is another question that we, we have to consider typically in parallel with this ontological question. And finally, I, I, should, I should say that uh, nothing here contradicts this, this well-known principle of, of modern logic that actuality entails possibility. Now, of course it does. So even if uh, um, possibility precedes actuality in, in this ontological uh, and epistemic sense, it doesn't mean that uh, actuality wouldn't entail possibility in, in, uh, in a metaphysical sense, because actuality is just one of the many possible combinations of essences in this, in this type of framework. The problem is that we don't know which, uh, which of these combinations is the actual combination. So uh, this point about the ontology uh, doesn't really help with the epistemic project. And I think I will leave you with that. I believe I did okay with the time. Sorry if I went a bit fast. Uh, I'm happy to, to discuss all of this further. Thanks very much.